Section 16 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1. Edited by Charles F. Horn. Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd. Prince Jimu founds Japan's capital, B.C. 660. Sir Edward Reed, the Nihongi. Prince Jimu is the founder of the Empire of Japan, according to Japanese tradition. The whole of his history is overlaid with myth and legend, but it points to the immigration of Western Asiatics by way of Korea into the Japanese islands of Izumo and Kyushu. The historical records of the Japanese relate that Jimu, accompanied by an elder brother, Prince Itsuze, started from their grandfather's palace on Mount Takaklicho. They marched with a large number of followers, a horde of men, women, and children, as well as a band of armed men. On landing in Japan, after many years wandering by sea and land, they had serious conflicts with the native tribes. They eventually succeeded in overcoming all opposition and in conquering the country, so that Prince Jimu was enabled to build a palace and set up a capital, Kashihabara in Yamoto. This prince is regarded by Japanese historians as the founder of the Japanese empire. He is said to have reigned 75 years after his accession, and to have died at the age of 127 years, and his burial place is pointed out in the northern side of Mount Unebi, in the province of Yamoto. Prince Jimmu, or whoever was the foreign ruler who conquered and founded an empire in Japan, must have been a bold, enterprising, and sagacious man. The islands he subdued were barbarous, and he civilized them. The inhabitants were warlike and cruel, and he kept them in peace. He founded a dynasty which extended its dominion over Nagato, Izumo, and Owari, and still has representatives in rulers whose people are by far the most progressive dwellers in the East. That part of the following historical matter, which is translated from the old Japanese chronicle, the Nihongi, is marked by local color and by oriental characteristics, whereby it curiously contrasts with the plain recitals of modern and western history. Sir Edward Reed There are endless varying legends about this god period of Japan. All that we need now say in way of reciting the legends of the gods has relation to the descent of the Mikados of Japan from the deities. It was the misconduct of Suzano that drove the sun goddess into the cave, and for this misconduct she was banished. Some say that instead of proceeding to his place of banishment, he descended and with his son Idakizo no Mikoto upon Shiraga in Korea, and not liking the place, went back by vessel to the bank of the Inokawa River in Izumo, Japan. At the time of their descent, Idakiso had many plants or seeds of trees with him, but he planted none in Shiraga, but took them across with him and scattered them from Kuishu all over Japan, so that the whole country became green with trees. It is said that Idakiso is respected as the god of merit and is worshipped in Kinokuni. His two sisters also took care of the plantation. One of the gods who reigned over the country in the prehistoric period was Ohonamuchi, who is said by some to be the son of Suzano, and by others to be one of his later descendants. And which is right, it is more than we can say, remarked one of my scholarly friends. However, during his reign he was anxious about the people, and consulting with Sukuna no Mikoto, applied his whole heart, we are told, to their good government, and they all became loyal to him. One time he said to his friends just named, Do you think we are governing the people well? And his friend answered, In some respects well, and in some not. So that they were frank and honest with each other in those days. When Sukuna Nikono went away, Ohonamuchi said, It is I who should govern this country. Is there any who will assist me? Then there appeared over the sea a divine light and there came a god floating and floating, and said, You cannot govern the country without me. And this proved to be the god, Ohomiwa no Kami, who built the palace in Mimuro, in Yamoto, and dwelt therein. He affords a direct link to the Mikado family, for his daughter became the empress of the first historic Jimu. Her name was Umetatara Isuzuhimi, 
All the descendants of her father are named like him, Ohomiwa no Kami, and it is said that the present Empress of Japan is probably a descendant of this god. As regards the descent of the Emperor Jimmu himself, we already know that Nihingi no Mikoto, the sovereign grandchild of the sun goddess, was sent down with the sacred symbols of empire given to him in the sun by the sun goddess herself before he started for the earth. Now Nihingi married reader forgive me for quoting the lady's name and for her father's konohane no sakuyahime oho yamazumi no kami and their pair had three sons of whom the last named howoro no mikoto succeeded to the throne he is sometimes called by the following simple and possibly endearing name amatsu hitakahi kohodemi no mikoto he married toyatami hime the daughter of the sea god and they had a son ogayafuki aidesu no mikoto born it is said under an unfinished roof of cormorant's wings who succeeded the father and who married tamayori hime also a daughter of the sea god this illustrious couple had four sons of whom the last succeeded to the throne in the year b c six sixty he was named tamuyama toi warehiko no mikoto but posterity has fortunately simplified his designation to the now familiar jimu tenno the first historic emperor of japan and the ancestor of the present emperor the histories of japan prepared under the sanction of the present japanese government date to the commencement of the historic period from the first year of the reign of the first emperor jimmu tenno who is said to have ruled for seventy-six years viz from b c six sixty to five eighty five some persons consider that his reign and a few reigns that succeeded it probably or possibly belong to the legendary period because while on the one hand the emperor jimmu is described as the founder of the present empire and the ancestor of the present emperor on the other he is described as the fourth son of ukai fukiazu no mikoto who was fifth in direct descent from the beautiful sun goddess tensho daijin but as no such thing as writing existed in japan in those days or for many centuries afterward it would not be surprising if a real monarch should have a mythical origin assigned to him and as i have quite lately heard from the guns firing at nagasaki an imperial salute in honor of his coronation and have seen the flags waving over the capital city tokyo in honor of the birthday the emperor jimu is quite historical enough for my present purpose the commencement of his reign shall fix for us as it does for others the japanese year one which was six hundred sixty years prior to our year one so that any date of the christian era can be converted into one of the japanese era by the addition of six hundred sixty years and vice versa some of the emperors will be found to have lived very long lives no doubt but as i have said elsewhere none of them lived nearly so long as our adam methuselah and others in whose longevity so many of us profess to believe and besides it is impossible for me to attempt to correct a chronology which japanese scholars and englishmen versed in the japanese language have thus far left without specific correction deferring for after consideration the incidents of the successive imperial reigns except in so far as they bear directly upon the descent of the crown let us then first glance at the succession of emperors and empresses who have ruled in the morning land after the death of emperor jimu there appears to have been an interregnum for three years although it is seldom taken account of the second emperor suise who was the fifth son of the first emperor having ascended to the throne b c five eighty one and reigned until five forty nine the cause of the interregnum appears to have been the extreme grief which suise felt at the death of his father in consequence of which he committed the administration of the empire for a time to one of his relatives an unworthy fellow as he proved named tagishi mimi no mikoto who tried to assassinate his master and seize the throne for himself and who was put to death by suise for his pains the fifth son of the emperor jimu was nominated by him as the successor and it is probable that older sons were living and passed over and that the throne was inherited in part by nomination even in this its first transfer some writers on japanese history profess to see nothing in the pantheon of japan pictured in the kojiki and the honki nothing more than a collection of distinguished personages who lived and labored and contended in the country before the historic period thus bringing deified men and women down to earth again 
such persons accept the records of jimmu tenno's origin as essentially accurate in so far as they state what is human and reasonable rejecting them only when they set forth what is supernatural and to them unbelievable others on the contrary consider or profess to consider the supernatural portions of those narratives as perfectly trustworthy and discredit only those statements concerning the first of the sacred emperors which would seem in any way to detract from his divinity i should be sorry to have to argue the case with either of these parties but i must take the liberty of accepting as sufficiently accurate as much of the recorded lives of jimo and his successors as the modern prosaic histories in japan are content to put forth and no more proceeding upon this basis there is not much to be said of the reigns of the mikados who ruled before the christian era beyond what has been already stated as regards the first emperor his ancestor ninigi no mikoto whether a god or not or whether he came down from the sun by means of the bridge of heaven or not appears to have been appears to have established his residence at the ancient himuka now hyuga there it was that jimu tenno first resided and thence it was that he started on his historic and memorable career the central parts of japan were militarily occupied by rebels whose names are preserved and it was to subdue them that he proceeded eastward he stopped for three years at takashima constructing the necessary vessels for crossing the waters and then in the course of years making his way victoriously as far as nanieva the modern osaka encountered his foes at kawachi and defeated them the chief general being left dead on the battlefield jimmu was now sole master of japan as then known and in the following year he mounted the throne the eastern and northern parts of the country were however still and long afterwards peopled by the aino race who were at a later period treated as troublesome savages and conquered by the famous prince yamato dake by help of the sacred sword the spot selected by the emperor jimmu for his capital was kashiwabara in the province of yamato not far from the present western capital of kyoto he there did honor to the gods married built himself a palace and deposited in the throne room the sacred mirror sword and ball the insignia of the imperial power handed down from the sun goddess he organized two imperial guards one as a bodyguard to protect the interior of the palace and the other to act as sentinels around the palace end of section sixteen Section 17 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Prince Jimu founds Japan's capital b c six sixty by the nehongi the emperor kamiyamoto iharebiko's personal name ikohoho demi he was the fourth child of ikunagisi takeugaya fukiahezu no mikoto his mother's name was tamayori hime daughter of the sea god from his birth this emperor was of clear intelligence and resolute will at the age of fifteen he was made heir to the throne when he grew up he married ahira tsuhimi of the district of ata in the province of iuga and made her his consort by her he had tagishi mimi no mikoto and kisu mimi no mikoto when he reached the age of forty-five he addressed his elder brothers and his children saying of old our heavenly deities takami musubi no mikoto and ohohirume no mikoto pointing to this land of fair rice ears of the fertile reed plain Give it to our heavenly ancestor Ikohono Ninigi no Mikoto. Thereupon Ikohono Ninigi no Mikoto, throwing open the barrier of heaven and clearing a cloud path, urged on his superhuman course until he came to rest. At this time the world was given over to widespread desolation. It was an age of darkness and disorder. In this gloom, therefore, he fostered justice and so governed this western border. Our imperial ancestors and imperial parent like gods like sages accumulated happiness and amassed glory many years elapsed from the date when our heavenly ancestor descended 
until now it is over one million seven hundred ninety two thousand four hundred seventy years but the remote regions do not yet enjoy the blessings of imperial rule every town has always been allowed to have its lord and every village its chief who each one for himself makes division of territory and practices mutual aggression and conflict now i have heard from the ancient of the sea and in the east there is a fair land encircled on all sides by blue mountains moreover there is there one who flew down riding in a heavenly rock boat i think that this land will undoubtedly be suitable for an extension of the heavenly task so that its glory should fill the universe it is doubtless the centre of the world the person who flew down was i believe nigihayahi why should we not proceed thither and make it the capital all the imperial princes answered and said the truth of this is manifest this thought is constantly present to our minds also let us go thither quickly this was the year kinoye tora fifty-first of the great year kinoye tora in that year in winter on the kanoto tori day the fifth of the tenth month the new moon of which was on the day Inotomi, the emperor in person led the imperial princes and the naval force on an expedition against the east when he arrived at hayasui gate there was there a fisherman who came riding in a boat the emperor summoned him and then inquired of him saying who art thou he answered and said thy servant is a country god and his name is utsuhiko i angle for fish in the bays of the ocean hearing that the son of the heavenly deity was coming therefore i forthwith came to receive him again he inquired of him saying canst thou act as my guide he answered and said i will do so the emperor ordered the end of a pole of shihi wood to be given to the fisher and caused him to be taken and pulled into the imperial vessel of which he was made pilot a name was especially granted him and he was called Shihinetsu Hiko this was the first ancestor of the yamoto no atahe proceeding on their voyage they arrived at usa in the land of tsukushi at this time there appeared the ancestors of kunitsuko of usa named usa tsuhiko and usa tsuhimi they built a palace raised on one pillar on the banks of the river usa and offered them a banquet then by imperial command usa tsuhimi was given in marriage to the emperor's attendant minister amanotane no mikoto now amanotane no mikoto was the remote ancestor of nakatomi uji eleventh month ninth day the emperor arrived at the harbor of oka in the land of tsukushi twelfth month twenty-seventh day he arrived at the province of aki where he dwelt in the palace of ye the year kinoto u spring third month sixth day going onward he entered the land of kibi and built a temporary palace in which he dwelt it was called the palace of takashima three years passed during which time he set in order the helms of his ships and prepared a store of provisions it was his desire by single effort to subdue the empire the year tsuchi no ye muma spring second month eleventh day the imperial forces at length proceeded eastward the prow of one ship touching the stern of another just when they reached cape naniho they encountered a current of great swiftness whereupon that place was called namahaya wave swift or namihana wave flower it is now called naniha which is a corruption of this third month tenth day proceeding upwards against the stream they went straight on and arrived at the port of awokumo nishiradate in the township of kusaka in the province of kafuchi summer fourth month ninth day the imperial forces in martial array marched on to tatsuta the road was narrow and precipitous and the men were unable to march abreast so they returned and again endeavored to go eastward crossing over mount ikoma in this way they entered the inner country now when nagasuni hiko heard this he said the object of the children of the heavenly deity in coming hither is assuredly to rob me of my country so he straightway levied all the forces under his dominion and intercepted them at the hill of kusaka a battle was engaged and itsu no mikoto was hit by a random arrow on the elbow the imperial forces were unable to advance against the enemy the emperor was vexed and resolved in his inmost heart a divine plan saying i am the descendant of the sun goddess 
and if i proceed against the sun to attack the enemy i shall act contrary to the way of heaven better to retreat and make a show of weakness then sacrificing to the gods of heaven and earth and bringing on our backs the might of the sun goddess let us follow her rays and trample them down if we do so the enemy will assuredly be routed of themselves and we shall not stain our swords with blood they all said it is good thereupon he gave orders to the army saying wait a while and advance no further so he withdrew his forces and the enemy also did not dare to attack him he then retired to the port of kusaka where he set up shields and made a warlike show therefore the name of this port was changed to tatetsu which is now corrupted to tadetsu before this at the battle of kusaka there was a man who hid in a great tree and by so doing escaped danger so pointing to this tree he said i am grateful to it as to my mother therefore the people of the day called the place omonoki no mura fifth month eighth day the army arrived at the port of yamaki in chinu also called port yamanoi now itsuse no mikoto's arrow wound was extremely painful he grasped his sword and striking a martial attitude said how exasperated it is that a man should die of a wound received at the hands of slaves and should not avenge it the people of that day therefore called the place ono minoto proceeding onward they reached mount kama in the land of Kii, where itsuse no mikoto died in the army and was therefore buried at mount kama six month twenty-third day the army arrived at the village of nagusa where they put to death the tohe of nagusa finally they crossed the moor of sano and arrived at the village of kami in kumano here he embarked in the rock boat of heaven and leading his army proceeded onward by slow degrees in the midst of the sea they suddenly met with a violent wind and the imperial vessel was tossed about then ina ihi no mikoto exclaimed and said alas my ancestors were heavenly deities and my mother was a goddess of the sea why do they harass me by land and why moreover do they harass me by sea when he had said this he drew his sword and plunged into the sea where he became changed into the god sabi mochi miki no no mikoto also indignant at this said my mother and my aunt are both sea goddesses why do they raise great billows to overwhelm us so treading upon the waves he went to the eternal land the emperor was now alone with the imperial prince tagishimimi no mikoto leading his army forward he arrived at port arasaka in kumano also called nishiki bay where he put to death the tohe of nishiki at this time the gods belched up a poisonous vapour from which every one suffered for this reason the imperial army was again unable to exert itself then there was there a man by name kumano no takakuraji who unexpectedly had a dream in which amaterasu no ohokami spoke to takemika tsuchi no kami saying i still hear a sound of disturbance from the central land of reed plains do thou again go and chastise it takemika tsuchi no kami answered and said even if i go not i can send down my sword with which i subdued the land upon which the country will of its own accord become peaceful to this amaterasu no kami assented thereupon takemiki tsuchi no kami addressed takakuraji saying my sword which is called Futsu no mitama i will now place in the storehouse do thou take it and present it to the heavenly grandchild takakuraji said yes and thereupon awoke the next morning as instructed in his dream he opened the storehouse and on looking in there was indeed there a sword which had fallen down from heaven and was standing upside down on the plank floor of the storehouse so he took it and offered it to the emperor at this time the emperor happened to be asleep he awoke suddenly and said oh what a long time i have slept on inquiry he found that the troops who had been affected by the poison had all recovered their senses and were afoot the emperor then endeavoured to advance into the interior but among the mountains it was so precipitous that there was no road by which they could travel and they wandered about not knowing whither to direct their march 
then amaterasu no ohokami instructed the emperor in a dream of the night saying i will now send the yatakarasu make it thy guide through the land then there did indeed appear the yatakarasu flying down from the void the emperor said the coming of this crow is in due accordance with my auspicious dream how grand how splendid my imperial ancestor amaterasu no ohokami deserves therewith to assist me in creating the hereditary institution at this time hino omi no mikoto ancestor of the ohotomo house taking with him ohokume as commander of the main body guided by the direction taken by the crow looked up to it and followed after until at length they arrived at the district of lower uda therefore they named the place which they reached the village of ukichi no uda at this time by an imperial order he commended hino omi no mikoto saying thou art faithful and brave and art moreover a successful guide therefore will i give thee a new name and will call thee michi no omi autumn eighth month second day the emperor said to summon ukeshi the elder and ukeshi the younger these two were chiefs of the district of uda now ukeshi the elder did not come but ukeshi the younger came and making obeisance at the gate of the camp declared as follows thy servant's elder brother ukeshi the elder shows signs of resistance hearing that the descendant of heaven was about to arrive he forthwith raised an army with which to make an attack but having seen from afar the might of the imperial army he was afraid and did not dare to oppose it therefore he has secretly placed his troops in ambush and has built for the occasion a new palace in the hall of which he has prepared engines it is his intention to invite the emperor to a banquet there and then to do him a mischief i pray that this treachery be noted and that good care be taken to make preparations against it the emperor straightway sent michi no omi no mikoto to observe the signs of his opposition michi no omi no mikoto clearly ascertained his hostile intentions and being greatly enraged shouted at him in a blustering manner wretch thou shalt thyself dwell in the house which thou hast made so grasping his sword and drawing his bow he urged him and drove him within it ukeshi the elder being guilty before heaven and the matter not admitting of excuse of his own accord trod upon the engine and was crushed to death his body was then brought out and decapitated and the blood which flowed from it reached above the ankle therefore that place was called udan no chihara after this ukeshi the younger prepared a great feast of beef and sake with which he entertained the imperial army the emperor distributed this flesh and sake to the common soldiers upon which they sang the following verses in the high castle tree of uda i set a snare for woodcock and waited but no woodcock came to it a valiant whale came to it this is called a kume song in the present time when the department of music performs this song there is still the measurement of great and small by the hand as well as a distinction of coarse and fine in the notes of the voice this is by a rule handed down from antiquity after this the emperor wished to respect the land of ho yoshino so taking personal command of the light troops he made a progress round by the way of ukechimura in uda when he came to yoshino there was a man who came out of a well he shone and had a tail the emperor inquired of him saying what man art thou he answered and said thy servant is a local deity and his name is wihikari he it is who was the first ancestor of yoshino no obito proceeding a little further there was another man with a tail who burst open a rock and came forth from it the emperor inquired of him saying what man art thou he answered and said thy servant is the child of iha oshiwake it was he who was the first ancestor of kuzu of yoshino then skirting the river he proceeded westward when there appeared another man who had made a fish trap and was catching fish on the emperor making inquiry of him he answered and said thy servant is the son of nihei motsu he it is who was the first ancestor of ukahi ata ninth month fifth day 
the emperor ascended to the peak of mount takakura in uda whence he had a prospect over all the land on kunimi hill there were descried eighty bandits moreover at the acclivity of the meisaka there was posted an army of women and at the acclivity of osaka there was stationed a force of men at the acclivity of sumisaka there was placed burning charcoal this was the origin of the names meisaka wosaka and sumisaka again there was the army of yeshiki which covered all the village of ihare all the places occupied by the enemy were strong positions and therefore the roads were cut off and obstructed so that there was no room for passage the emperor indignant at this made prayer on that night in person and then fell asleep the heavenly deity appeared to him in a dream and instructed him saying take earth from within the shrine of the heavenly mount kagu and of it make eighty heavenly platters also make sacred jars and therewith sacrifice to the gods of heaven and earth moreover pronounce a solemn imprecation if thou doest so the enemy will render submission of their own accord the emperor received with reverence the directions given in his dream and proceeded to carry them into execution now ukeshi the younger again addressed the emperor saying there are in the province of yamoto in the village of shiki eighty shiki bandits moreover in the village of takawahari some say katsuraki there are eighty agane bandits all these tribes intend to give battle to the emperor and thy servant is anxious in his own mind on his account it were now good to take clay from the heavenly mount kagu and therewith to make heavenly platters with which to sacrifice to the gods of the heavenly shrines and of the earthly shrines if after doing so thou dost attack the enemy they may be easily driven off the emperor who had already taken the words of his dream for a good omen when he now heard the words of ukeshi the younger was still more pleased in his heart he caused shihi netsuhiko to put on ragged garments and a grass hat and to disguise himself as an old man he also caused ukeshi the younger to cover himself with a winnowing tray so as to assume the appearance of an old woman and then addressed them saying do ye too proceed to the heavenly mount kagu and secretly take earth from its summit having done so return hither by means of you i shall then divine whether my undertaking will be successful or not do your utmost to be watchful now the enemy's army filled the road and made all passage impossible then shihi netsuhiko prayed and said if it be possible for our emperor to conquer this land let the road by which we must travel become open but if not let the brigands surely oppose our passage having thus spoken they set forth and went straight onward now the hostile band seeing the two men laughed loudly and said what an uncouth old man and old woman so with one accord they left the road and allowed the two men to pass and proceed to the mountain where they took the clay and returned with it hereupon the emperor was greatly pleased and with this clay he made eighty platters eighty heavenly small jars and sacred jars with which he went to the upper waters of the river nifu and sacrificed to the gods of heaven and earth immediately on the asahara plain by the river of uda it became as it were like foam on the water the result of the curse cleaving to them moreover the emperor went on to utter a vow saying i will now make ame in the eighty platters without using water if the ame is formed then shall i assuredly without effort and without recourse to the might of arms reduce the empire to peace so he made ame which forthwith became formed of itself again he made a vow saying i will now take the sacred jars and sink them in the river nifu if the fishes whether great or small become every one drunken and are carried down the stream like as it were to floating maki leaves then shall i assuredly succeed in establishing this land but if this be not so there will never be any results thereupon he sank the jars in the river with their mouths downward after a while the fish all came to the surface gaping gasping as they floated down the stream then shihi netsuhiko seeing this represented it to the emperor who was greatly rejoiced and plucking up a five hundred branch masakaki tree of the upper waters of the river nifu 
he did worship wherewith to all the gods. It was with this that the custom began of selling sacred jars. At this time he commanded Michi no Omi no Mikoto, saying, We are now in person about to celebrate a public festival to Takami Musubi no Mikoto, and I appoint thee ruler of the festival, and I grant thee the title of Izuhimi. The earthen jars which are set up shall be called Izube, or sacred jars. The fire shall be called Izu no Kagu Tsuchi, or sacred fire elder. The water shall be called Izu no Mizuha, no me, or sacred water female. The food shall be called Uzuka no me, or sacred food female. The firewood shall be called Izu no Yamatsuchi, or sacred mountain elder. And the grass shall be called Izu no no Tsuchi, or sacred moor elder. Winter, tenth month, first day. The emperor tasted the food of Izube, and arraying his troops set forth upon his march. He first of all attacked the eighty bandits of Mount Kunimi, routed and slew them. It was in this campaign that the emperor, fully resolved on victory, made these verses, saying, Like the Shitadami, which creep round the great rock of sea and isle. Like Shitadami, which creep around the great rock of the sea of Ise where blows the divine wind like the Shitadami. My boys, my boys, we will creep around and smite them utterly and smite them utterly. In this poem, by the great rock is intended the hill of Kunimi. After this, the band which remained was still numerous and their disposition could not be fathomed. So the emperor privately commanded Michi no Omi no Mikoto, saying, Do thou take with thee the Oho Kume, and make a great muro at the village of Osaka. Prepare a copious banquet, invite the enemy to it, and then capture them. Michi no Omi no Mikoto, thereupon, in obedience to the emperor's sacred behest, dug a muro at Osaka, and having selected his bravest soldiers, stayed therein, mingled with the enemy. He secretly arranged with them, saying, When they have got tipsy with sake, I will strike up a song. Do you, when you hear the sound of my song, all at the same time stab the enemy? Having made this arrangement, they took their seats, and the drinking bout proceeded. The enemy, unaware that there was any plot, abandoned themselves to their feelings, and promptly became intoxicated. Then Michi no Omi no Mikoto struck up the following song. At Osaka in the great Muro house, though men in plenty enter and stay, we the glorious sons of warriors, wielding our mallet heads, wielding our stone mallets, will smite them utterly. Now, when our troops heard this song, they all drew at the same time their mallet-headed swords, and simultaneously slew the enemy, so that there were no eaters left. The imperial army was greatly delighted. They looked up to heaven and laughed. Therefore he made a song, saying, Though folk say that one ye mishi is a match for a hundred men, they do not so much as resist. The practice according to which, at present time, the kume sings this and then laugh aloud, had this origin. Again he sang, saying, Ho, now is the time! Ho, now is the time! Ha, ha, psha! Even now, my boys, even now, my boys! All these songs were sung in accordance with the secret behest of the emperor. He had not presumed to compose them with his own motion. Then the emperor said, It is the part of a good general, when victorious, to avoid arrogance. The chief brigands have now been destroyed, but there are ten bands of villains of a similar stamp who are disputatious. Their disposition cannot be ascertained. Why should we remain for a long time in one place? By so doing, we could not have control over emergencies. So he removed his camp to another place. Eleventh month, seventh day. The imperial army proceeded in great force to attack the Hiko of Shiki. First of all, the emperor sent a messenger to summon Shiki the elder, but he refused to obey. Again, the Yatagarasu was sent to bring him. When the crow reached his camp, it cried to him, saying, The child of the heavenly day descends for thee. Haste, haste. Shiki the elder was enraged at this and said, just when I heard that the conquering deity of heaven was coming, I was indignant at this. Why shouldst thou, a bird of the crow tribe, utter such an abominable cry? 
So he drew his bow and aimed at it. The crow forthwith fled away, and next proceeded to the house of Shiki the younger, where it cried, saying, The child of the heavenly deity summons thee. Haste, haste. Then Shiki the younger was afraid, and changing countenance said, Thy servant, hearing of the approach of the conquering deity of heaven, is full of dread, morning and evening. Well hast thou cried to me, O crow. He straightway made eight leaf platters on which he disposed food, and entertained the crow. Accordingly, in obedience to the crow, he proceeded to the emperor and informed him, saying, My elder brother, Shiki the elder, hearing of the approach of the child of the heavenly deity, forthwith assembled eighty bandits and provided arms with which he is about to do battle with thee. It will be well to take measures against him without delay the emperor accordingly assembled his generals and inquired of them saying it appears that shiki the elder has now rebellious intentions i summoned him but again he will not come what is to be done the general said shiki the elder is a crafty knave it will be well first of all to send shiki the younger to make matters clear to him and at the same time to make explanations to kuraji the elder and kuraji the younger if after that they still refuse submission it will not be too late to take warlike measures against them shiki the younger was accordingly sent to explain to them their interests but shiki the elder and the others adhered to their foolish design and would not consent to submit then shiki netsuhiko advised as follows let us uh, first send out our feebler troops by the osaka road when the enemy sees them he will assuredly proceed thither with all his best troops we should then straightway urge forward our robust troops and make straight for the sumizaka then with the water of the river uda we should sprinkle the burning charcoal and suddenly take them unawares when they cannot fail to be routed the emperor approved this plan and sent out the feebler troops towards the enemy who thinking that a powerful force was approaching awaited them with all their power now up to this time whenever the imperial army attacked they invariably captured and when they fought they were invariably victorious so that the fighting men were all wearied out therefore the emperor to comfort the hearts of his leaders and men struck off this verse as we fight going forth and watching from between the trees of mount inasa we are famished ye keepers of comrades birds of the island come now to our aid in the end he crossed sumizaka with the stronger troops and going round by the rear attacked them from two sides and put them to the rout killing their chieftains shiki the elder and the others third month seventh day the emperor made an order saying during the six years that our expedition against the east has lasted owing to my reliance on the majesty of imperial heaven the wicked bands have met death it is true that the frontier lands are still unpurified and that a remnant of evil is still refractory but in the region of the central land there is no more wind and dust truly we should make a vast and spacious capital and plan it great and strong at present things are in a crude and obscure condition and the people's minds are unsophisticated they roost in nests or dwell in caves their manners are simply what is customary now if a great man were to establish laws justice could not fail to flourish and even if some gain should accrue to the people in what way would this interfere with the sage's action moreover it will be well to open up and clear the mountains and forests and to construct a palace then i may reverently assume the precious dignity and so give peace to my good subjects above i should then respond to the kindness of the heavenly powers in granting me the kingdom and below i should extend the line of imperial descendants and foster right-mindedness thereafter the capital may be extended so as to embrace all the six cardinal points and the eight cords may be covered so as to form a roof will this not be well when i observe the kashiha bara plain which lies southwest of mount unebi it seems the centre of the land I must set it in order accordingly he in this month commanded officers to set about the construction of an imperial residence 
Yer Kanoye Saru, Autumn, Eighth Month, Sixteenth Day. The emperor, intending to appoint a wife, sought afresh children of noble families. Now there was a man who made representation to him, saying, There is a child who was born to Kotoshiro Nushi no Kami by his union with Tamakushi Hime, daughter of Mizofuhi ni no Kami of Mishima. Her name is Hime Tatara Isuzu Hime no Mikoto. She is a woman of remarkable beauty. The emperor was rejoiced, and on the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, he received Himi Tatara Isuzu Himi no Mikoto and made her his wife. Yer Kanoto Tori, spring, first month, first day. The emperor assumed the imperial dignity in the palace of Kashiharabara. This year is reckoned the first year of his reign. He honored his wife by making her empress. The children born to him by her were Kamiyawi Mimi no Mikoto and Kami Nunagaha Mimi no Mikoto. Therefore, there is an ancient saying in praise of this as follows. In Kashiha Bara in Unebi, he mightily established his palace pillars on the foundation of the bottom rock and reared aloft the cross roof timbers of the plain of high heaven. The name of the emperor who thus began to rule the empire was Kami Yamoto Ihare Biko Ohodemi. Fourth year, spring, second month, twenty third day. The emperor issued the following decree. The spirits of our imperial ancestors, reflecting their radiance down from heaven, illuminate and assist us. All our enemies have now been subdued, and there is peace within the seas. We ought to take advantage of this to perform sacrifice to the heavenly deities and therewith develop filial duty. He accordingly established spirit terraces among the Tomi Hills, which were called Kamitsu Wono Kakihara and Shimotsu Wono no Kakihara. There he worshipped his imperial ancestors, the heavenly deities. Seventy-sixth year, spring, third month, eleventh day. The emperor died in the palace of Kashihabara. His age was then one hundred twenty-seven. The following year, autumn, the twelfth day of the ninth month, he was buried in the Misasigi, northeast of Mount Unebi. End of section 17. Section 18 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rood. The Foundation of Buddhism, B.C. 623. Thomas William Rhys Davids. Not so many years ago, at the time when Buddhism first became known in Europe through philosophic writings of about six centuries after Buddha, then newly translated, it caused amazement that a religion which had brought three hundred millions of people under its sway should acknowledge no god. But the religion of Buddha, during a thousand years of practice by the Hindus, is entirely different from the representations given us in these translations. As shown by the base reliefs covering the ancient monuments of India, this religion, changed by modern scientists into a belief in atheism, is, in fact, of all religions, the most polytheistic. In the first Buddhist monuments dating back 18 to 20 centuries, the reformer simply figures as an emblem. The imprint of his feet, the figure of the bow tree, under which he entered the state of supreme wisdom, are worshipped. And though he disdained all gods, and only sought to teach a new code of morals, we shortly see Buddha himself depicted as a god. In the early stages he is generally represented as alone, but gradually appears in the company of the Brahmin gods. He is finally lost in a crowd of gods, and becomes nothing more than an incarnation of one of the Brahmin deities. From that time Buddhism has been practically extinct in India. This transformation took a thousand years to bring about. 
During part of this great interval, Buddha was being worshipped as an all-powerful god. Legends are told of his appearance to his disciples and of favors he granted them. It has been said that Buddha tried to set aside the laws of caste. This is an error. Neither did he attempt to break the Brahmanic pantheon. Buddhism, which today is the religion of 300 million people, about one-fifth of the world's inhabitants, toward the 7th or 8th century of our era, almost entirely disappeared from its birthplace, India, whence it had spread over the rest of Asia, China, Russian Tartary, Burma, etc. Only the two extreme frontiers of India, Nepal in the north and Ceylon in the south, now practice the Buddhist cult. Gautama Buddha left behind him no written works. The Buddhists believe that he composed works which his immediate disciples learned by heart and which were committed to writing long afterward. This is not impossible, as the Vedas were handed down in this manner for many hundreds of years. There was certainly an historical basis for the Buddhist legend. In fact, the legends group themselves round a number of very distinct occurrences. At the end of the 6th century BC, those Aryan tribes sprung from the same stem as our own ancestors, who have preserved for us in their Vedic songs so precious a relic of ancient thought and life, had pushed on beyond the five rivers of the Punjab and were settled far down into the valley of the Ganges. They had given up their nomadic habits, dwelling in villages and towns, their wealth being in land, produce, and cattle. From democratic beginnings, the whole nation had gradually become bound by an iron system of caste. The country was split up into little sections, each governed by some petty despot and harassed by internecine feuds. Religion had become a debasing ritualism, with charms and incantations, fear of the influence of the stars, and belief in dreams and omens. The idea of the existence of a soul was supplemented by the doctrine of transmigration. The priests were well-meaning, ignorant, and possessed of a sincere belief in their own divinity. The religious use of the Vedas and the right to sacrifice were strictly confined to the Brahmins. There were traveling logicians, anchorites, ascetics, and solitary hermits. Although the ranks of the priesthood were closed against intruders, still a man of lower caste might become a religious teacher and reformer. Such were the conditions which welcomed Gotama Buddha. One hundred miles northeast of Benares, at Kapila Vastu, on the banks of the river Rohini, the modern Kohana, there lived about 500 years before Christ a tribe called Sakyas. The peaks of the mighty Himalayas could be seen in the distance. The Sakyas frequently quarreled with the Kolyans, a neighboring tribe, over their water supplies from the river. Just now, the two clans were at peace, and two daughters of the Raja of the Kolyans were wives of Sudhodana, the Raja of the Sakyas. Both were childless. This was deemed a very great misfortune among the Aryans, who thought that the star of a man's existence after death depended upon ceremonies to be performed by his heir. There was great rejoicing, therefore, when, in about the forty-fifth year of her age, the elder sister promised her husband a son. In due time, she started with the intention of being confined at her parents' house, but it was on the way, under the shade of some lofty satin trees in a pleasant grove called Lumbini, that her son, the future Buddha, was unexpectedly born. The mother and child were carried back to Sudhodana's house, and there, seven days afterward, the mother died, but the boy found a careful nurse in his mother's sister, his father's other wife. 
Many marvelous stories have been told about the miraculous birth and precocious wisdom and power of Gotama. The name Siddhartha is said to have been given him as a child, Gotama being the family name. Numerous were his later titles, such as Sakyasinha, the lion of the tribe of Sakya, Sakyamuni, the Sakya sage, Sugata, the happy one, Sata, the teacher, Jina, the conqueror, Bhagava, the blessed one, and many others. In his twentieth year, he was married to his cousin Yasodhara, daughter of the Raja of Koli. Devoting himself to home pleasures, he was accused by his relations of neglecting those manly exercises necessary for one who might at any time have to lead his people in war. Gotama heard of this and appointed a day for a general tournament at which he distinguished himself by being easily the first at all the trials of skill and prowess, thus winning the good opinions of all the clansmen. This is the solitary record of his youth. Nothing more is heard of him until, in his twenty-ninth year, Gotama suddenly abandoned his home to devote himself entirely to the study of religion and philosophy. It is said that an angel appeared to him in four visions, a man broken down by age, a sick man, a decaying corpse, and lastly, a dignified hermit. Each time Chana, his charioteer, told him that decay and death were the fate of all living beings. The charioteer also explained to him the character and aims of the ascetics exemplified by the hermit. Thoughts of the calm life of the hermit strongly stirred him. One day, the occasion of the last vision, as he was entering his chariot to return home, news was brought to him that his wife, Yasodhara, had given birth to a son, his only child, who was called Rahula. This was about ten years after his marriage. The idea that this new tie might become too strong for him to break seems to have been the immediate cause of his flight. He returned home thoughtful and sad. But the people of Kapilavastu were greatly delighted at the birth of the young heir, their Raja's only grandson. Gautama's return became an ovation, and he entered the town amid a general celebration of the happy event. Amid the singers was a young girl, his cousin, whose song contained the words, Happy the father, happy the mother, happy the wife of such a son and husband. In the word happy, there was a double meaning. It meant also freed from the chains of sin and of existence, saved. In gratitude to one who at such a time reminded him of his higher duties, Gotama took off his necklace of pearls and sent it to her. She imagined that she had won the love of young Siddhartha, but he took no further notice of her. That night the dancing girls came, but he paid them no attention and gradually fell into an uneasy slumber. At midnight he awoke and sent Chana for his horse. While waiting for the steed, Gotama gently opened the door of the room where Yasodhara was sleeping, surrounded by flowers, with one hand on the head of her child. After one loving, fond glance, he tore himself away. Accompanied only by Chana, he left his home and wealth and power, his wife and only child behind him, to become a penniless wanderer. This was the great renunciation. There follows a story of a vision. Mara, the great tempter, the spirit of evil, appears in the sky, urging Gotama to stop. He promises him a universal kingdom over the four great continents if he will but give up his enterprise. The tempter does not prevail, but from that time he followed Gotama as a shadow hoping to seduce him from that right way. All night Gotama rode, and at the dawn 
when beyond the confines of his father's domain, dismounts. He cuts off his long hair with his sword, and sends back all his ornaments and his horse by the faithful charioteer. Seven days he spends alone beneath the shade of a mango grove, and then fares onward to Rajogriha, the capital of Magadha. This town was the seat of Bimbasara, one of the most powerful princes in the eastern valley of the Ganges. In the hillside caves near at hand were several hermits. To one of these Brahmin teachers, Alara, Gotama attached himself, and later to another named Udraka. From these he learned all that Hindu philosophy could teach. Still unsatisfied, Gotama next retired to the jungle of Uruvela, on the most northerly spur of the Vyadhya range of mountains near the present temple of Buddha Gaya. Here, for six years, he gave himself up to the severest penance, until he was wasted away to a shadow by fasting and self-mortification. Such self-control spread his fame like the sound of a great bell hung in the skies. But the more he fasted and denied himself, the more he felt himself a prey to a mental torture worse than any bodily suffering. At last, one day, when walking slowly up and down, lost in thought, through extreme weakness, he staggered and fell to the ground. His disciples thought he was dead, but he recovered. Despairing of further profit from such rigorous penance, he began to take regular food and gave up his self-mortification. At this, his disciples forsook him and went away to Benares. In their opinion, mental conquest lay only through bodily suppression. There now ensued a second crisis in Gotama's career, which culminated in his withstanding the renewed attacks of the tempter after violent struggles. Soon after, if not on the very day when his disciples had left him, he wandered out toward the banks of the Nearaujara, receiving his morning meal from the hands of Sujuta, the daughter of a neighboring villager, and sat down to eat it under the shade of a large tree, Ficus religiosa, called from that day the sacred bow tree, or tree of wisdom. He remained there all day long, pondering what next to do. All the attractions of the luxurious home he had abandoned rose up before him most alluringly. But as the day ended, his lofty spirit had won the victory. All doubts had lifted as mists before the morning sun. He had become Buddha, that is, enlightened. He had grasped the solution of the great mystery of sorrow. He thought, having solved its causes and its cure, he had gained the haven of peace, and believed that in the power over the human heart of inward culture and of love to others, he had discovered a foundation which could never be shaken. From this time, Gotama claimed no merit for penances. A feeling of great loneliness possessed him as he arrived at his psychological and ethical conclusions. He almost despaired of winning his fellow men to his system of salvation, salvation merely by self-control and love, without any of the rites, ceremonies, charms, or incantations of the Hindu religion. The thought of mankind otherwise, as he imagined, utterly doomed and lost, made Gotama resolve, at whatever hazard, to proclaim his doctrine to the world. It is certain that he had a most intense belief in himself and his mission. He had intended first to proclaim his new doctrine to his old teachers, Alara and Udraka, but finding that they were dead, he proceeded to the deer forest near Benares, where his former disciples were then living. In the cool of the evening, he enters the deer park near the city, but his former disciples resolve not to recognize him as a master. He tells them that they are still in the way of death, whereas he has found the way of salvation 
and can lead them to it, having become a Buddha. And as they reply with objections to his claims, he explains the fundamental truths of his system and principles of his new gospel, which the aged Kondanya was the first to accept from his master's lips. This exposition is preserved in the Dhammakakapavatana Sutta, the Sutra of the Foundations of the Kingdom of Righteousness. Gotama Buddha taught that everything corporeal is material and therefore impermanent. Man, in his bodily existence, is liable to sorrow, decay, and death. The reign of unholy desires in his heart produces unsatisfactory longings, useless weariness, and care. Attempted purification by oppressing the body is only wasted effort. It is the moral evil of the heart which keeps a man chained down in the degraded state of bodily life, which binds him in a union with the material world. Virtue and goodness will only ensure him for a time, and, in another birth, a higher form of material life. From the chains of existence, only the complete eradication of all evil will set him free. But these ideas must not be confused with Christian beliefs, for Buddhism teaches nothing of any immaterial existence. The foundations of its creed have been summed up in the four great truths, which are as follows. 1. That misery always accompanies existence. 2. That all modes of existence of man or animals, in death or heaven, result from passion or desire, tanha. 3. That there is no escape from existence except by destruction of desire. 4. That this may be accomplished by following the fourfold way to nirvana. The four stages are called the paths, the first being an awakening of the heart. The first enemy which the believer has to fight against is sensuality, and the last is unkindliness. Above everything is universal charity. Till he has gained that, the believer is still bound. His mind is still dark. True enlightenment, true freedom, are complete only in love. The last great reward is nirvana, eternal rest or extinction. For 45 years, Gautama taught in the valley of the Ganges. In the 20th year, his cousin Ananda became a mendicant and attended on Gautama. Another cousin, however, stirred up some persecution of the great teacher, and the oppositions of the Brahmins had to be faced. There are clear accounts of the last few days of Gotama's life. On a journey toward Kusinagara, he had rested in a grove at Pawa, presented to the society by a goldsmith of that place named Chunda. After a midday meal of rice and pork prepared by Chunda, the master started for Kusinagara, but stopped to rest at the river Kukusta. Feeling that he was dying, he left a message for Chunda, promising him a great reward in some future existence. He died at the river Kukusta, near Kusinagara, teaching to the last. Gotama's power arose from his practical philanthropy. His philosophy and ethics attracted the masses. He did not seek to found a new religion, but thought that all men would accept his form of the ancient creed. It was his society, the Sangha, or Buddhist order, rather than his doctrine, which gave to his religion its practical vitality. The following lines, filled with the poetic beauty of the Orient, are taken from the last spoken words of the great founder of Buddhism and the Book of the Great Decease. They give a clue to the cult of that religion and breathe the spirit of nirvana in every scintillating sentence. As nearly as may be, the translation is a literal one, done by Rhys Davids, the world's greatest living authority on this subject. Now the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda 
and said, It may be, Ananda, that in some of you the thought may arise, The word of the Master is ended, we have no teacher more. But it is not thus, Ananda, that you should regard it. The truths and the rules of the order which I have set forth and laid down for you all, let them, after I am gone, be the teacher to you. Ananda, when I am gone, address not one another in the way in which the brethren have heretofore addressed each other, with the epithet, that is, of avuso, friend. A younger brother may be addressed by an elder with his name, or his family name, or the title friend. But an elder should be addressed by a younger brother as lord, or as venerable sir. When I am gone, Ananda, let the order, if it should so wish, abolish all the lesser and minor precepts. When I am gone, Ananda, let the higher penalty be imposed on Brother Kanna. But what, Lord, is the higher penalty? Let Kanna say whatever he may like, Ananda. The brethren should neither speak to him, nor exhort him, nor admonish him. Then the Blessed One addressed the brethren and said, It may be, brethren, that there may be doubt or misgiving in the mind of some brother as to the Buddha, or the truth, or the path, or the way. Inquire, brethren, freely. Do not have to reproach yourselves afterward with the thought, our teacher was face to face with us and we could not bring ourselves to inquire of the Blessed One when we were face to face with him. And when he had thus spoken, the brethren were silent. And again, the second and the third time the Blessed One addressed the brethren and said, It may be, brethren, that there may be doubt or misgiving in the mind of some brother as to the Buddha, or the truth, or the path, or the way. Inquire, brethren, freely. Do not have to reproach yourselves afterward with the thought, Our teacher was face to face with us and we could not bring ourselves to inquire of the Blessed One when we were face to face with him. And even the third time the brethren were silent. Then the Blessed One addressed the brethren and said, It may be, brethren, that you put no questions out of reverence for the teacher. Let one friend communicate to another. And when he had thus spoken, the brethren were silent. And the venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, How wonderful a thing is it, Lord, and how marvelous! Verily, I believe that in this whole assembly of the brethren there is not one brother who has any doubt or misgiving as to the Buddha, or the truth, or the path, or the way. It is out of the fullness of faith that thou hast spoken, Ananda. But, Ananda... The Tathagata knows for certain that in this whole assembly of the brethren there is not one brother who has any doubt or misgiving as to the Buddha, or the truth, or the path, or the way. For even the most backward Ananda of all these five hundred brethren has become converted, and is no longer liable to be born in a state of suffering, and is assured of final salvation. Then the Blessed One addressed the brethren and said, Behold now, brethren, I exhort you, saying, Decay is inherent in all component things. Work out your salvation with diligence. This was the last word of the Tathagata. Then the Blessed One entered into the first stage of deep meditation, and rising out of the first stage he passed into the second and rising out of the second, he passed into the third, and rising out of the third stage, he passed into the fourth, and rising out of the fourth stage of deep meditation, he entered into the state of mind to which the infinity of space is alone present, and passing out of the mere consciousness of the infinity of space, he entered into the state of mind to which nothing at all was specially present. And passing out of the consciousness of no special object, 
he fell into a state between consciousness and unconsciousness. And passing out of the state between consciousness and unconsciousness, he fell into a state in which the consciousness both of sensations and of ideas had wholly passed away. Then the venerable Ananda said to the venerable Anuruddha, O oh my Lord, O oh Anuruddha, the Blessed One is dead. Nay, brother Ananda, the Blessed One is not dead. He has entered into that state in which both sensations and ideas have ceased to be. Then the Blessed One, passing out of the state in which both sensations and ideas have ceased to be, entered into the state between consciousness and unconsciousness. And passing out of the state between consciousness and unconsciousness, he entered into the state of mind to which nothing at all is specially present. And passing out of the consciousness of no special object, he entered into the state of mind to which the infinity of thought is alone present. And passing out of the mere consciousness of the infinity of thought, he entered into the state of mind to which the infinity of space is alone present. And passing out of the mere consciousness of the infinity of space, he entered into the fourth stage of deep meditation. And passing out of the fourth stage, he entered into the third. And passing out of the third stage, he entered into the second. And passing out of the second, he entered into the first. And passing out of the first stage of deep meditation, he entered the second. And passing out of the second stage, he entered into the third. And passing out of the third stage, he entered into the fourth stage of deep meditation. And passing out of the last stage of deep meditation, he immediately expired. End of section 18. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 19 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rood. The Foundation of Buddhism. B.C. 623. Thomas William Rhys Davids. When the Blessed One died, there arose at the moment of his passing out of existence a mighty earthquake, terrible and awe-inspiring, and the thunders of heaven burst forth. When the Blessed One died, Brahma Sahampati, at the moment of his passing away from existence, uttered this stanza. They all, all beings that have life, shall lay aside their complex form, that aggregation of mental and material qualities that gives them, or in heaven or on earth, their fleeting individuality. E'en as the teacher, being such a one, unequaled among all the men that are, successor of the prophets of old time, mighty by wisdom and an insight clear, hath died. When the Blessed One died, Saka, the king of the gods, at the moment of his passing away from existence, uttered this stanza. Their transient all, each being's parts and powers, growth is their nature and decay. They are produced they are dissolved again, and then is best when they have sunk to rest. When the Blessed One died, the Venerable Anuruddha, at the moment of his passing away from existence, uttered these stanzas. When he who from all craving want was free, who to Nirvana's tranquil state had reached, when the great sage finished his span of life, no gasping struggle vexed that steadfast heart, all resolute and with unshaken mind. 
he calmly triumphed o'er the pain of death. E'en as a bright flame dies away, so was his last deliverance from the bonds of life. When the Blessed One died, the Venerable Ananda, at the moment of his passing away from existence, uttered this stanza. Then was there terror, then stood the hair on end, when he endowed with every grace the Supreme Buddha died. When the Blessed One died, of those of the brethren who were not free from the passions, some stretched out their arms and wept, and some fell headlong to the ground, rolling to and fro in anguish at the thought. Too soon has the Blessed One died. Too soon has the Happy One passed away from existence. Too soon has the light gone out in the world. But those of the brethren who were free from the passions, the Arahats, bore their grief collected and composed at the thought. Impermanent are all component things. How is it possible that they should not be dissolved? Then the venerable Anuruddha exhorted the brethren and said, Enough, my brethren, weep not, neither lament. Has not the Blessed One formerly declared this to us? that it is in the very nature of all things near and dear unto us, that we must divide ourselves from them, leave them, sever ourselves from them? How then, brethren, can this be possible, that whereas anything whatever born, brought into being, and organized, contains within itself the inherent necessity of dissolution? How then can this be possible, that such a being should not be dissolved. No such condition can exist. Even the spirits, brethren, will reproach us. But of what kind of spirits is the Lord, the venerable Anuruddha, thinking? There are spirits, brother Ananda, in the sky, but of worldly mind, who dishevel their hair and weep, and stretch forth their arms and weep fall prostrate on the ground and roll to and fro in anguish at the thought. Too soon has the Blessed One died. Too soon has the Happy One passed away. Too soon has the light gone out in the world. There are spirits too, Ananda, on the earth and of worldly mind, who tear their hair and weep and stretch forth their arms and weep, fall prostrate on the ground and roll to and fro in anguish at the thought, too soon has the Blessed One died, too soon has the Happy One passed away, too soon has the light gone out in the world. But the spirits who are free from passion hear it, calm and self-possessed, mindful of the saying which begins, impermanent indeed are all component things, how then is it possible? that such a being should not be dissolved. Now the venerable Anuruddha and the venerable Ananda spend the rest of that night in religious discourse. Then the venerable Anuruddha said to the venerable Ananda, Go now, brother Ananda, into Kusinara, and inform the malas of Kusinara, saying, The Blessed One, O Vasetas, is dead. Do then whatever seemeth to you fit. Even so, Lord, said the venerable Ananda, in assent to the venerable Anuruddha, and having robed himself early in the morning, he took his bowl and went into Kusinara with one of the brethren as an attendant. Now, at that time, the malas of Kusinara were assembled in the council hall concerning that very matter, and the venerable Ananda went to the council hall of the Malas of Kusinara, and when he had arrived there, he informed them, saying, The Blessed One, O Vasethas, is dead. Do then whatever seemeth to you fit. And when they had heard this saying of the venerable Ananda, the Malas with their young men and their maidens and their wives were grieved and sad and afflicted at heart and some of them wept, disheveling their hair, and some stretched forth their arms and wept, 
and some fell prostrate on the ground, and some reeled to and fro in anguish at the thought, too soon has the blessed one died, too soon has the happy one passed away, too soon has the light gone out in the world. Then the Malas of Kusinara gave orders to their attendants, saying, Gather together perfumes and garlands and all the music in Kusinara. And the Malas of Kusinara took the perfumes and garlands and all the musical instruments and five hundred suits of apparel and went to the Upavatana, to the Sala Grove of the Malas, where the body of the Blessed One lay. There they passed the day in paying honor, reverence, respect, and homage to the remains of the Blessed One with dancing and hymns and music and with garlands and perfumes and in making canopies of their garments and preparing decoration wreaths to hang thereon. Then the Malas of Kusinara thought, It is much too late to burn the body of the Blessed One today. Let us now perform the cremation tomorrow and in paying honor, reverence, respect, and homage to the remains of the Blessed One with dancing and hymns and music, and with garlands and perfumes, and in making canopies of their garments and preparing decoration wreaths to hang thereon, they passed the second day too, and then the third day, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth day also. Then, on the seventh day, the Malas of Kusinara thought, Let us carry the body of the Blessed One by the south and outside to a spot on the south and outside of the city, paying it honor and reverence and respect and homage with dance and song and music, with garlands and perfumes. And there, to the south of the city, let us perform the cremation ceremony. And thereupon eight chieftains among the Malas bathed their heads and clad themselves in new garments with the intention of bearing the body of the Blessed One. But behold, they could not lift it up. Then the Malas of Kusinara said to the venerable Anuruddha, What, Lord, can be the reason? What can be the cause that eight chieftains of the Malas who have bathed their heads and clad themselves in new garments with the intention of bearing the body of the Blessed One, are unable to lift it up. It is because you, O Vasithas, have one purpose, and the spirits have another purpose. But what, Lord, is the purpose of the spirits? Your purpose, O Vasithas, is this. Let us carry the body of the Blessed One by the south and outside, to a spot on the south and outside of the city, paying it honor and reverence and respect and homage with dance and song and music, with garlands and perfumes. And there, to the south of the city, let us perform the cremation ceremony. But the purpose of the spirits, Vasithas, is this. Let us carry the body of the Blessed One by the north, to the north of the city, and entering the city by the north gate, let us bring it through the midst of the city into the midst thereof, and going out again by the eastern gate, paying honor and reverence and respect and homage to the body of the Blessed One, with heavenly dance and song and music and garlands and perfumes. Let us carry it to the shrine of the Malas, called Makuta Bantana, to the east of the city, and there let us perform the cremation ceremony. Even according to the purpose of the spirits, so, Lord, let it be. Then, immediately, all Kusanara, down even to the dust bins and rubbish heaps, became strewn knee-deep with Mandarava flowers from heaven, and while both the spirits from the skies and the malas of Kusanara upon earth paid honor and reverence and respect and homage to the body of the Blessed One with dance and song and music, 
with garlands and with perfumes, they carried the body by the north, to the north of the city, and entering the city by the north gate, they carried it through the midst of the city into the midst thereof. And going out again by the eastern gate, they carried it to the shrine of the Malas, called Makuta Bandana, and there, to the east of the city, they laid down the body of the Blessed One. Then the Malas of Kusinara said to the venerable Ananda, What should be done, Lord, with the remains of the Tathagata? As men treat the remains of a king of kings, so, Vasithas, should they treat the remains of a Tathagata. And how, Lord, do they treat the remains of a king of kings? They wrap the body of a king of kings, Vasithas, in a new cloth. When that is done, they wrap it in cotton wool. When that is done, they wrap it in a new cloth, and so on, till they have wrapped the body in five hundred successive layers of both kinds. Then they place the body in an oil vessel of iron, and cover that close up with another oil vessel of iron. They then build a funeral pile of all kinds of perfumes, and burn the body of the king of kings. And then, at the four crossroads, they erect a dagaba to the king of kings. This, Vasitas, is the way in which they treat the remains of a king of kings. And as they treat the remains of a king of kings, so, Vasitas, should they treat the remains of the Tathagata. At the four crossroads, a dagaba should be erected to the Tathagata, and whosoever shall there place garlands, or perfumes, or paint, or make salutation there, or become in its presence calm in heart, that shall long be to them for a profit and a joy. Therefore the Malas gave orders to their attendants, saying, Gather together all the carded cotton wool of the Malas. Then the Malas of Kusinara wrapped the body of the Blessed One in a new cloth, and when that was done, they wrapped it in cotton wool, and when that was done, they wrapped it in a new cloth, and so on, till they had wrapped the body of the Blessed One in five hundred layers of both kinds. And then they placed the body in an oil vessel of iron, and covered that close up with another vessel of iron. And then they built a funeral pile of all kinds of perfumes, and upon it they placed the body of the Blessed One, now, at that time, the venerable Maha Kasapa was journeying along the high road from Pava to Kusinara with a great company of the brethren, with about five hundred of the brethren. And the venerable Maha Kasapa left the high road and sat himself down at the foot of a certain tree. Just at that time, a certain naked ascetic who had picked up a mandarava flower in Kusinara was coming along the high road to Pava, and the venerable Maha Kasapa saw the naked ascetic coming in the distance, and when he had seen him, he said to the naked ascetic, O friend, surely thou knowest our master. Yea, friend, I know him. This day the Samana Gotama has been dead a week. That is how I obtained this mandarava flower. And immediately of those of the brethren who were not yet free from the passions, some stretched out their arms and wept, and some fell headlong on the ground, and some reeled to and fro in anguish at the thought, Too soon has the Blessed One died. Too soon has the Happy One passed away from existence. Too soon has the light gone out in the world. But those of the brethren who were free from the passions, the Arahats, bore their grief collected and composed at the thought, Impermanent are all component things. How is it possible that they should not be dissolved? Now, at that time, a brother named Subhada 
who had been received into the order in his old age, was seated there in their company. And Subhada, the old, addressed the brethren, and said, Enough, brethren, weep not, neither lament. We are well rid of the great Samana. We used to be annoyed by being told, This beseems you, this beseems you not. But now we shall be able to do whatever we like, and what we do not like, that we shall not have to do. But the venerable Maha Kasapa addressed the brethren and said, Enough, my brethren, weep not, neither lament. Has not the Blessed One formerly declared this to us, that it is in the very nature of all things near and dear unto us that we must divide ourselves from them, leave them, sever ourselves from them? How then, brethren, can this be possible, that whereas anything, whatever born, brought into being and organized, contains within itself the inherent necessity of dissolution, how then can this be possible, that such a being should not be dissolved? No such condition can exist. Now, just at that time, four chieftains of the Malas had bathed their heads and clad themselves in new garments with the intention of setting on fire the funeral pile of the Blessed One. But behold, they were unable to set it alight. Then, the Malas of Kusinara said to the venerable Anuruddha, What, Lord, can be the reason, and what the cause, that four chieftains of the Malas, who have bathed their heads and clad themselves in new garments, with the intention of setting on fire the funeral pile of the Blessed One, are unable to set it on fire? It is because you, O Vasitas, have one purpose, and the spirits have another purpose. But what, Lord, is the purpose of the spirits? The purpose of the spirits, O Vasithas, is this. That venerable brother, Maha Kasapa, is now journeying along the high road from Pava to Kusinara with a great company of the brethren, with five hundred of the brethren. The funeral pile of the Blessed One shall not catch fire, until the venerable Maha Kasapa shall have been able reverently to salute the sacred feet of the Blessed One. Even according to the purpose of the spirits, so, Lord, let it be. Then the venerable Maha Kasapa went on to Makuta Bandana of Kusinara, to the shrine of the Malas, to the place where the funeral pile of the Blessed One was. And when he had come up to it, he arranged his robe on one shoulder, and bowing down with clasped hands, he thrice walked reverently round the pile, and then, uncovering the feet, he bowed down in reverence at the feet of the Blessed One. And those five hundred brethren arranged their robes on one shoulder, and bowing down with clasped hands, they thrice walked reverently round the pile and then bowed down in reverence at the feet of the Blessed One. And when the homage of the venerable Maha Kasapa and of those five hundred brethren was ended, the funeral pile of the Blessed One caught fire of itself. Now, as the body of the Blessed One burned itself away, from the skin and the integument and the flesh and the nerves and the fluid of the joints, neither soot nor ash was seen, and only the bones remained behind. Just as one sees no soot nor ash when glue or oil is burned, so, as the body of the Blessed One burned itself away, from the skin and the integument and the flesh and the nerves and the fluid of the joints, neither soot nor ash was seen, and only the bones remained behind and of those five hundred pieces of raiment, the very innermost and outermost were both consumed. And when the body of the Blessed One had been burned up, there came down streams of water from the sky and extinguished the funeral pile of the Blessed One, and there burst forth streams of water from the storehouse of the waters beneath the earth, 
and extinguished the funeral pile of the Blessed One. The Malas of Kusinara also brought water, scented with all kinds of perfumes, and extinguished the funeral pile of the Blessed One. Then the Malas of Kusinara surrounded the bones of the Blessed One in their council hall, with a latticework of spears, and with a rampart of bows, and there, for seven days, they paid honor and reverence and respect and homage to them, with dance and song and music, and with garlands and perfumes. Now the king of Magadha, Agata Satu, the son of the queen of the Videha clan, heard the news that the Blessed One had died at Kusinara. Then the king of Magadha, Agata Satu, the son of the queen of the Videa clan, sent a messenger to the Malas, saying, The Blessed One belonged to the soldier caste, and I too am of the soldier caste. I am worthy to receive a portion of the relics of the Blessed One. Over the remains of the Blessed One will I put up a sacred cairn, and in honor thereof will I celebrate a feast. And the Likavis of Vesali heard the news that the Blessed One had died at Kusinara. And the Likavis of Vesali sent a messenger to the Malas, saying, The Blessed One belonged to the soldier caste, and we too are of the soldier caste. We are worthy to receive a portion of the relics of the Blessed One. Over the remains of the Blessed One will we put up a sacred cairn, and in honor thereof will we celebrate a feast. And the Sakiyas of Kapila Vatu heard the news that the Blessed One had died at Kusinara. And the Sakiyas of Kapila Vatu sent a messenger to the Malas, saying, The Blessed One was the pride of our race. We are worthy to receive a portion of the relics of the Blessed One. Over the remains of the Blessed One will we put up a sacred cairn, and in honor thereof will we celebrate a feast. And the Bulis of Alakapa heard the news that the Blessed One had died at Kusinara. And the Bulis of Alakapa sent a messenger to the Malas, saying, The Blessed One belonged to the soldier caste, and we too are of the soldier caste. We are worthy to receive a portion of the relics of the Blessed One. Over the remains of the Blessed One will we put up a sacred cairn, and in honor thereof will we celebrate a feast. And the Brahmin of Vethadipa heard the news that the Blessed One had died at Kusinara. And the Brahmin of Vethadipa sent a messenger to the Malas, saying, The Blessed One belonged to the soldier caste, and I am a Brahmin. I am worthy to receive a portion of the relics of the Blessed One. Over the remains of the Blessed One will I put up a sacred cairn, and in honor thereof will I celebrate a feast. And the Malas of Pava heard the news that the Blessed One had died at Kusinara. Then the Malas of Pava sent a messenger to the Malas, saying, the Blessed One belonged to the soldier caste, and we too are of the soldier caste. We are worthy to receive a portion of the relics of the Blessed One. Over the remains of the Blessed One will we put up a sacred cairn, and in honor thereof will we celebrate a feast. When they heard these things, the Malas of Kusinara spoke to the assembled brethren, saying, the Blessed One died in our village domain. We will not give away any part of the remains of the Blessed One. When they had thus spoken, Dona the Brahmin addressed the assembled brethren and said, Hear, reverend sir, one single word from me. Forbearance was our Buddha wont to teach. Unseemly is it that over the division of the remains of him who was the best of beings, strife should arise and wounds and war. Let us all, sirs, with one accord unite in friendly harmony to make eight portions. Widespread, let thupas rise in every land that in the enlightened one mankind may trust. 
do thou then o brahman thyself divide the remains of the blessed one equally into eight parts with fair division be it so sir said dona in assent to the assembled brethren and he divided the remains of the blessed one equally into eight parts with fair division and he said to them give me sirs this vessel and i will set up over it a sacred cairn and in its honor will i establish a feast and they gave the vessel to dona the brahmin and the moriyas of pifalivana heard the news that the blessed one had died at kusinara then the moriyas of pifalivana sent a messenger to the malas saying the blessed one belonged to the soldier caste and we too are of the soldier caste we are worthy to receive a portion of the relics of the blessed one over the remains of the blessed one will we put up a sacred cairn and in honor thereof will we celebrate a feast and when they heard the answer saying there is no portion of the remains of the blessed one left over the remains of the blessed one are all distributed then they took away the embers then the king of magadha agatasatu the son of the queen of the videa clan made a mound in ragagaha over the remains of the blessed one and held a feast and the likavis of vesali made a mound in vesali over the remains of the blessed one and held a feast and the bullies of alakapa made a mound in alakapa over the remains of the blessed one and held a feast and the koliyas of ramagama made a mound in ramagama over the remains of the blessed one and held a feast and vetha dipaka the brahmin made a mound in Vethadipa over the remains of the Blessed One, and held a feast. And the Malas of Pava made a mound in Pava over the remains of the Blessed One, and held a feast. And the Malas of Kusinara made a mound in Kusinara over the remains of the Blessed One, and held a feast. And Dona, the Brahmin, made a mound over the vessel in which the body had been burned, and held a feast and the moriyas of pifalivana made a mound over the embers and held a feast thus were there eight mounds tupas for the remains and one for the vessel and one for the embers this was how it used to be eight measures of relics there were of him of the far-seeing eye of the best of the best of men in india seven are worshipped and one measure in ramagama by the kings of the serpent race one tooth too is honored in heaven and one in gandhara's city one in the kalinga realm and one more by the naga race through their glory the bountiful earth is made bright with offerings painless for with such are the great teachers relics best honored by those who are honored by gods and by nagas and kings yea thus by the noblest of monarchs bow down with clasped hands hard hard is a buddha to meet with through hundreds of ages end of section 19 recording by linda johnson Section 20 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Pythian Games at Delphi, B.C. 585, by George Grote. Part 1. Among the leading features of Greek life, especially those belonging to its religious customs and observances, none are more characteristic and none possess a more attractive interest for the modern reader and student than the peculiar festivals which it was their practice to hold. The four great national festivals or games were the Olympic, held every four years in honor of Zeus, on the banks of the Alpheus and Elis, 
The Pythian, celebrated once in four years, in honor of Apollo, at Delphi, the Isthmian, held every two years, at the Isthmian Sanctuary in the Isthmus of Corinth, in honor of Poseidon, Neptune, and the Nemean, celebrated at Nemea, in the second and fourth year of each Olympiad, in honor of the Nemean Juno. With regard to the influence of these games or festivals upon the political and social life of Greece, much has been written by historians and special students of the Grecian states. While the celebrations do not appear to have accomplished much for the political union of Greece, they are to be credited with marked beneficial effects in the promotion of a pan-Hellenic spirit, which, if it failed to produce such a union of the Greek race, nevertheless quickened and strengthened the common feeling of family relationship. Thus a sense of their identical origin and racial traits was kept alive, and the tendencies of Greek development and culture preserved their essential character and distinction. By means of these periodical gatherings, representing all parts of the Greek world, not only was friendly competition in every field of talent and performance secured, but even trade and commerce found, through them, new channels of activity. So in various ways, the national games proved a source of fresh energy and broader enterprise among the various branches of the Grecian people. The particular character and significance of the Pythian games at Delphi, and their relation to the other national festivals, form an interesting subject for study in connection with the general history of Greece. What are called the Olympic, Pythian, Nemean, and Isthmian games, the four most conspicuous, amid many others analogous, were in reality great religious festivals. For the gods then gave their special sanction, name, and presence to recreative meetings. The closest association then prevailed between the feelings of common worship and the sympathy in common amusement. Though this association is now no longer recognized, it is nevertheless essential that we should keep it fully before us if we desire to understand the life and proceedings of the Greek. To Herodotus and his contemporaries, these great festivals, then frequented by crowds from every part of Greece, were of overwhelming importance and interest. Yet they had once been purely local, attracting no visitors except from a very narrow neighborhood. In the Homeric poems, much is said about the common gods, and about special places consecrated to and occupied by several of them. The chiefs celebrate funeral games in honor of a deceased father, which are visited by competitors from different parts of Greece, but nothing appears to manifest public or town festivals open to Grecian visitors generally. And though the rocky Pytho with its temple stands out in the Iliad as a place both venerated and rich, the Pythian games, under the superintendence of the Amphictyons, with continuous enrollment of victors and a pan-Hellenic reputation, do not begin until after the Sacred War in the 48th Olympiad, or B.C. 586. The Olympic games, more conspicuous than the Pythian as well as considerably older, are also remarkable on another ground, inasmuch as they supplied historical computers with the oldest backward record of continuous time. It was in the year B.C. 776 that the Eleans inscribed the name of their countryman Corobus as victor in the competition of runners, and that they began the practice of inscribing in like manner in each Olympic or fifth recurring year the name of the runner who won the prize. Even for a long time after this, however, the Olympic Games seem to have remained a local festival, the prize being uniformly carried off at the first twelve Olympiads, by some competitor either of Elis or its immediate neighborhood. The Nemean and Isthmian games did not become notorious or frequented until later even than the Pythian. Solon in his legislation proclaimed the large reward of 500 drams for every Athenian who gained an Olympic prize, and the lower sum of 100 drams for an Isthmiac prize. He counts the former as Pan-Hellenic rank and renown, an ornament even to the city of which the victor was a member, the latter as partial and confined to the neighborhood. Of the beginnings of these great solemnities, we cannot presume to speak except in mythical language. We know them only in their comparative maturity. But the habit of common sacrifice on a small scale and between near neighbors is a part of the earliest habits of Greece. The sentiment of fraternity between two tribes or villages first manifested itself by sending a sacred legation or theoria to offer sacrifices to each other's festivals, and to partake in the recreations which followed, thus establishing a truce with solemn guarantee, and bringing themselves into direct connection, 
each with the god of the other under his appropriate local surname. The Pacific communion so fostered, and the increased assurance of intercourse, as Greece gradually emerged from the turbulence and pugnacity of the heroic age, operated especially in extending the range of this ancient habit. The village festivals became town festivals, largely frequented by the citizens of other towns, and sometimes with special invitations sent round to attract theors from every Hellenic community, and thus these once humble assemblages gradually swelled into the pomp and immense confluence of the Olympic and Pythian games. The city administering such holy ceremonies enjoyed inviolability of territory during the month of their occurrence, being itself under obligation at that time to refrain from all aggression, as well as to notify by heralds the commencement of the truce to all other cities not in avowed hostility with it. Elis imposed heavy fines upon other towns, even on the powerful Lacedaemon, for violation of the Olympic truce, on pain of exclusion from the festival in case of non-payment. Sometimes this tendency to religious fraternity took a form called an amphictyony, different from the common festival. A certain number of towns entered into an exclusive religious partnership for the celebration of sacrifices periodically to the god of a particular temple, which was supposed to be the common property and under the common protection of all, though one of the number was often named as permanent administrator, while all other Greeks were excluded. That there were many religious partnerships of this sort, which have never acquired a place in history among the early Grecian villages, we may perhaps gather from the etymology of the word amphictyons, designating residents around, or neighbors, considered in the point of view of fellow religionists, as well as from the indications preserved to us in reference to various parts of the country. Thus there was an amphictyony of seven cities at the holy island of Caloria, close to the harbor of Trozen, Hermione, Epidaurus, Aegina, Athens, Prassiae, Noplia, and Orchomenus, jointly maintained the temple and sanctuary of Poseidon in that island, with which it would seem that the city of Trozen, though close at hand, had no connection, meeting there at stated periods to offer formal sacrifices. These seven cities, indeed, were not immediate neighbors, but the specialty and exclusiveness of their interest in the temple is seen from the fact that when the Argeans took Noplia, they adopted and fulfilled these religious obligations on behalf of the prior inhabitants. So also did the Lacedaemonians when they had captured Prassiae. Again in Triphylia, situated between the Pisitid and Messenia in the western part of Peloponnesus, there was a similar religious meeting and partnership of the Triphylians on Cape Samicon at the temple of the Semean Poseidon. Here the inhabitants of Machiston were entrusted with the details of superintendence, as well as with a duty of notifying beforehand the exact time of meeting a precaution essential amidst the diversities and irregularities of the Greek calendar, and also of proclaiming what was called the Semean Truce, a temporary abstinence from hostilities which bound all Trifilians during the holy period. This latter custom discloses the salutary influence of such institutions in presenting to men's minds a common object of reverence, common duties, and common enjoyments, thus generating sympathies and feelings of mutual obligation amid petty communities not less fierce than suspicious. So, too, the twelve chief Ionic cities in and near Asia Minor had their pan-Ionic amphictyony peculiar to themselves. The six Doric cities in and near the southern corner of that peninsula combined for the like purpose at the temple of the Triopian Apollo, and the feeling of special partnership is here particularly illustrated by the fact that Halicarnassus, one of the six, was formally extruded by the remaining five in consequence of a violation of the rules. There was also an amphictyonic union at Onchestus in Boeotia, in the venerated grove and temple at Poseidon, of whom it consisted we are not informed. There are some specimens of the sort of special religious conventions and assemblies which seem to have been frequent throughout Greece, nor ought we omit those religious meetings and sacrifices which were common to all members of one Hellenic subdivision, such as the Panboesia to all Boeotians, celebrated at the temple of the Ionian Athena near Coronea, the common observances rendered to the temple of Apollo Pythias at Argos by all those neighboring towns which had once been attached by this religious thread to the Argean, the similar periodical ceremonies frequented by all who bore the Achaean or Aetolian name, 
and the splendid and exhilarating festivals so favorable to the diffusion of the early Grecian poetry, which brought all Ionians at stated intervals to the sacred island of Delos. This latter class of festivals agreed with the Amphictyony in being of a special and exclusive character, not open to all Greeks. But there was one among these many Amphictyonies, which, though starting from the smallest beginnings, gradually expanded into so comprehensive a character, had acquired so marked a predominance over the rest, as to be called the Amphictyonic Assembly, and even to have been mistaken by some authors for a sort of federal Hellenic diet. Twelve sub-races out of the number which made up entire Hellas belonged to this ancient Amphictyony, the meetings of which were held twice in every year, in spring at the temple of Apollo at Delphi, in autumn at Thermopylae, in the sacred precinct of Demeter Amphictyonis. Sacred deputies, including a chief called the Hieromnemon and subordinates called the Pelagoro, attended these meetings from each of the twelve races. A crowd of volunteers seemed to have accompanied them for purposes of sacrifice, trade, or enjoyment. Their special and most important function consisted in watching over the Delphian temple, in which all the twelve sub-races had a joint interest, and it was the immense wealth and national ascendancy of this temple which enhanced to so great a pitch the dignity of its acknowledged administrators. The twelve constituent members were as follows. Thessalians, Boeotians, Dorians, Ionians, Perhabians, Magnetes, Locrians, Oteians, Achaeans, Phocians, Dolopes, and Malians. All are counted as races. If we treat the Hellenes as a race, we must call them sub-races. No mention being made of cities. All count equally in respect to voting, two votes being given by the deputies from each of the twelve. Moreover, we are told that in determining the deputies to be sent, or the manner in which the votes of each race should be given, the powerful Athens, Sparta, and Thebes had no more influence than the humblest Ionian, Dorian, or Boeotian city. This latter fact is distinctly stated by Aeschines, himself a Pylagor sent to Delphi by Athens. And so, doubtless, the theory of the case stood. The votes of the Ionic races counted for neither more nor less than two whether given by deputies from Athens, or from the small towns of Erythrae and Prien, and in like manner the Dorian votes were as good in the division when given by deputies from Boeon and Sintinion in the little territory of Doris, as if the men delivering them had been Spartans. But there can be as little question that in practice the little Ionic cities and the little Doric cities pretended to no share in the Amphictyonic deliberations. As the Ionic vote came to be substantially the vote of Athens, so, if Sparta was ever obstructed in the management of the Doric vote, it must have been by powerful Doric cities like Argos or Corinth, not by the insignificant towns of Doris. But the theory of Amphictyonic suffrage, as laid down by Aeschines, however little realized in practice during his day, is important inasmuch as it shows in full evidence the primitive and original constitution. The first establishment of the Amphictyonic Convocation dates from a time when all the twelve members were on a footing of equal independence, and when there were no overwhelming cities such as Sparta and Athens to cast in the shade the humbler members. When Sparta was only one Doric city and Athens only one Ionic city, among various others of consideration not much inferior. There are also other proofs which show the high antiquity of this Amphictyonic Convocation. Aeschines gives us an extract from the oath which had been taken by the sacred deputies who attended on behalf of their respective races ever since its first establishment, and which still apparently continued to be taken in his day. The antique simplicity of this oath, and of the conditions to which the members bind themselves, betrays the early age in which it originated, as well as the humble resources of those towns to which it was applied. We will not destroy any Amphictyonic town, we will not cut off any Amphictyonic town from running water. Such are the two prominent obligations which Aeschines specifies out of the old oath. The second of the two carries us back to the simplest state of society, and to towns of the smallest size, when the maidens went out with their basins to fetch water from the spring, like the daughters of Celios at Eleusis, or those of Athens from the fountain at Calero. We may even conceive that the special mention of this detail in the covenant between the twelve races 
is borrowed literally from agreements still earlier among the villages or little towns in which the members of each race were distributed. At any rate, it proves satisfactorily the very ancient date to which the commencement of the Amphictyonic convocations must be referred. The belief of Eschines, perhaps also the belief general in his time, was that it commenced simultaneously with the first foundation of the Delphian temple an event of which we have no historical knowledge, but there seems reason to suppose that its original establishment is connected with Thermopylae and Demeter Amphictyonia rather than with Delphi and Apollo. The special surname by which Demeter and her temple at Thermopylae was known, the temple of the hero Amphictyon which stood at its side, the word Pyloa which obtained footing in the language to designate the half-yearly meeting of the deputies both at Thermopylae and at Delphi, these indications point to Thermopylae, the real central point for all the twelve, as the primary place of meeting, and to the Delphian half-year as something secondary and superadded. On such a matter, however, we cannot go beyond a conjecture. The hero Amphictyon, whose temple stood at Thermopylae, passed in mythical genealogy for the brother of Helen. And it may be affirmed with truth that the habit of forming Amphictyonic unions and of frequenting each other's religious festivals was the great means of creating and fostering the primitive feeling of brotherhood among the children of Helen in those early times when rudeness, insecurity, and pugnacity did so much to isolate them. A certain number of salutary habits and sentiments, such as that which the Amphictyonic oath embodies in regard to abstinence from injury as well as to mutual protection, gradually found their way into men's minds. The obligations thus brought into play acquired a substantive efficacy of their own, and the religious feeling, which always remained connected with them, came afterward to be only one out of many complex agencies by which the later historical Greek was moved. Athens and Sparta, in the days of their might, and the inferior cities in relation to them, played each their own political game, in which religious considerations will be found to bear only a subordinate part. The special function of the Amphictyonic Council, so far as we know it, consisted in watching over the safety, the interests, and the treasures of the Delphian temple. If any one shall plunder the property of the god, or shall be cognizant thereof, or shall take treacherous counsel against the things in the temple, we will punish him with foot and hand and voice, and by every means in our power. So ran the old Amphictyonic oath, with an energetic imprecation attached to it. And there are some examples in which the council constitutes its functions, so largely as to receive and adjudicate upon complaints against entire cities, for offenses against the religious and patriotic sentiment of the Greeks generally. But for the most part its interference relates directly to the Delphian temple. The earliest case in which it is brought to our view is the sacred war against Syrah in the 46th Olympiad, or B.C. 595, conducted by Eurylychus the Thessalian and Clisthenes of Sicyon, and proposed by Solon of Athens. We find the Amphictyons also about half a century afterward undertaking the duty of collecting subscriptions throughout the Hellenic world and making the contract with the Alcmaeonids for rebuilding the temple after a conflagration. But the influence of this council is essentially of a fluctuating and intermittent character. Sometimes it appears forward to decide, and its decisions command respect, but such occasions are rare, taking the general course of known Grecian history. While there are other occasions, and those too especially affecting the Delphian temple, on which we are surprised to find nothing said about it. In the long and perturbed period which Thucydides describes, he never once mentions the Amphictyons, though the temple and the safety of its treasures form the repeated subject as well of dispute as of express stipulation between Athens and Sparta. Moreover, among the twelve constituent members of the council we find three, the Perhabians, the Magnetes, and the Achaeans of Phthia, who were not even independent, but subject to the Thessalians, so that its meetings, when they were not matters of mere form, probably expressed only the feelings of the three or four leading members. When one or more of these great powers had a party purpose to accomplish against others, when Philip of Macedon wished to extrude one of the members in order to procure admission for himself, it became convenient to turn this ancient form into a serious reality, and we shall see the Athenian Eschines providing a pretext for Philip to meddle in favor of the minor Boeotian cities against Thebes, 
by alleging that these cities were under the protection of the old Amphictyonic oath. It is thus that we have to consider the council as an element in Grecian affairs, an ancient institution, one among many instances of the primitive habit of religious fraternization, but wider and more comprehensive than the rest. At first purely religious, then religious and political at once, lastly more the latter than the former, highly valuable in the infancy, but unsuited to the maturity of Greece, and called into real working only on rare occasions when its efficiency happened to fall in with the views of Athens, Thebes, or the king of Macedon. In such special moments it shines with a transient light, which affords a partial pretense for the imposing title bestowed on it by Cicero, Commune Graciae Concilium, but we should completely misinterpret Grecian history if we regarded it as a federal council habitually directed or habitually obeyed. Had there existed any such commune concilium of tolerable wisdom and patriotism, and had the tendencies of the Hellenic mind been capable of adapting themselves to it, the whole course of later Grecian history would probably have been altered. The Macedonian kings would have remained only as respectable neighbors, borrowing civilization from Greece and expending their military energies upon Thracians and Illyrians, while united Hellas might even have maintained her own territory against the conquering legions of Rome. The twelve constituent Amphictyonic races remained unchanged until the sacred war against the Phocians, B.C. 355, after which, though the number twelve was continued, the Phocians were disfranchised and their votes transferred to Philip of Macedon. It has been already mentioned that these twelve did not exhaust the whole of Hellas. Arcadians, Eleans, Pisans, Minye, Dryopes, Aetolians, all genuine Hellenes, are not comprehended in it. But all of them had a right to make use of the Temple of Delphi and to contend in the Pythian and Olympic Games. The Pythian Games, celebrated near Delphi, were under the superintendence of the Amphictyons or of some acting magistrate chosen by and presumed to represent them. Like the Olympic Games, they came round every four years, the interval between one celebration and another being four complete years, which the Greeks called a pentoteris. The Isthmian and the Mean Games recurred every two years. In its first humble form, a competition among bards to sing a hymn in praise of Apollo, this festival was doubtless of immemorial antiquity, but the first extension of it into Panhellenic notoriety, as I have already remarked, the first multiplication of the subjects of competition, and the first introduction of a continuous record of the conquerors, date only from the time when it came under the presidency of the Amphictyon, at the close of the sacred war against Syra. What is called the First Pythian Contest coincides with the third year of the 48th Olympiad, or B.C. 585. From that period forward, the games become crowded and celebrated, but the date just named, nearly two centuries after the First Olympiad, is a proof that the habit of periodical frequentation of festivals, by numbers and from distant parts, grew up but slowly in the Grecian world. The foundation of the Temple of Delphi itself reaches far beyond all historical knowledge, forming one of the aboriginal institutions of Hellas. It is a sanctified and wealthy place even in the Iliad. The legislation of Lycurgus at Sparta is introduced under its auspices, and the earliest Grecian colonies, those of Sicily and Italy in the 8th century BC, are established in consonance with its mandate. Delphi and Dodona appear, in the most ancient circumstances of Greece, as universally venerated oracles and sanctuaries, and Delphi not only receives honors and donations, but also answers questions from Lydians, Phrygians, Etruscans, Romans, etc. It is not exclusively Hellenic. One of the valuable services which a Greek looked for from this and other great religious establishments was that it should resolve his doubts in cases of perplexity that it should advise him whether to begin a new or to persist in an old project, that it should foretell what would be his fate under given circumstances, and inform him, if suffering under distress, on what conditions the gods would grant him relief. The three priestesses of Dodona with their venerable oak, and the priestess of Delphi sitting on her tripod under the influence of a certain gas or vapor exhaling from the rock, were alike competent to determine these difficult points and we shall have constant occasion to notice in this history with what complete faith both the question was put and the answer treasured up, 
what serious influence it often exercised upon both public and private proceeding. The hexameter verses in which the Pythian priestess delivered herself were indeed often so equivocal or unintelligible that the most serious believer, with all anxiety to interpret and obey them, often found himself ruined by the result. Yet the general faith in the oracle was in no way shaken by such painful experience. For as the unfortunate issue always admitted of being explained by two hypotheses, either that the god had spoken falsely, or that his meaning had not been correctly understood, no man of genuine piety ever hesitated to adopt the latter. There were many other oracles throughout Greece besides Delphi and Dodona. Apollo was open to the inquiries of the faithful at Toan in Boeotia, at Abe in Phocis, at Branchidae near Miletus, at Ptara in Lycia, and other places. In like manner, Zeus gave answers at Olympia, Poseidon at Teneris, Amphiaris at Thebes, Amphilochus at Malus, etc., and this habit of consulting the oracle formed part of the still more general tendency of the Greek mind to undertake no enterprise without having first ascertained how the gods viewed it, and what measures they were likely to take. Sacrifices were offered, and the interior of the victim carefully examined, with the same intent, omens, prodigies, unlooked-for coincidences, casual expressions, etc., were all construed as significant of the divine will. To sacrifice with a view to this or that undertaking, or to consult the oracle with the same view, are familiar expressions embodied in the language. Nor could any man set about a scheme with comfort until he had satisfied himself in some manner or other that the gods were favorable to it. End of section 20. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 21 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Pythian Games at Delphi, B.C. 585, by George Grote. Part 2. The disposition here adverted to is one of these mental analogies pervading the whole Hellenic nation, which Herodotus indicates, and the common habit among all Greeks of respectfully listening to the Oracle of Delphi will be found on many occasions useful in maintaining unanimity among men not accustomed to obey the same political superior. In the numerous colonies especially, founded by mixed multitudes from distant parts of Greece, the minds of the emigrants were greatly determined toward cordial cooperation by their knowledge that the expedition had been directed, the oasis indicated, and the spot either chosen or approved by Apollo of Delphi. Such in most cases was the fact that God, according to the conception of the Greeks, takes delight always in the foundation of new cities and himself in person lays the first stone. These are the elements of union with which the historical Hellenes take their start community of blood, language, religious point of view, legends, sacrifices, festivals, and also, with certain allowances, of manners and character. The analogy of manners and character between the rude inhabitants of the Arcadian Sinatha and the polite Athens was, indeed, accompanied with wide differences. Yet if we compare the two with foreign contemporaries, we shall find certain negative characteristics of much importance common to both. In no city of historical Greece did there prevail either human sacrifices or deliberate mutilation, such as cutting off the nose, ears, hands, feet, etc., or castration, or selling of children into slavery, or polygamy, or the feeling of unlimited obedience toward one man, all customs which might be pointed out as existing among the contemporary Carthaginians, Egyptians, Persians, Thracians, etc., the habit of running, wrestling, boxing, etc., in gymnastic contests, with the body perfectly naked, was common to all Greeks, having been first adopted as a Lacedaemonian fashion in the 14th Olympiad. Thucydides and Herodotus remark that it was not only not practiced, but even regarded as unseemly among non-Hellenes. Of such customs, indeed, at once common to all the Greeks, and peculiar to them as distinguished from others, we cannot specify a great number 
but we may see enough to convince ourselves that there did really exist, in spite of local differences, a general Hellenic sentiment and character which counted among the cementing causes of a union apparently so little assured. During the two centuries succeeding B.C. 776, the festival of the Olympic Zeus in the Pisatid gradually passed from a local to a national character, and acquired an attractive force capable of bringing together into temporary union the dispersed fragments of Hellas from Marseille to Trebizond. In this important function, it did not long stand alone. During the 6th century BC, three other festivals, at first local, became successively nationalized. The Pythia near Delphi, the Isthmia near Corinth, the Nemea near Cleone, between Sicyon and Argos. In regard to the Pythian festival, we find a short notice of the particular incidents and individuals by whom its reconstitution and enlargement were brought about. A notice the more interesting inasmuch as these very incidents are themselves a manifestation of something like Panhellenic patriotism, standing almost alone in an age which presents little else in operation except distinct city interests. At the time when the Homeric hymn to the Delphinian Apollo was composed, probably in the 7th century BC, the Pythian festival had as yet acquired little eminence. The rich and holy temple of Apollo was then purely oracular, established for the purpose of communicating to pious inquirers the counsels of the immortals. Multitudes of visitors came to consult it, as well as to sacrifice victims and to deposit costly offerings. But while the god delighted in the sound of the harp as an accompaniment to the singing of pains, he was by no means anxious to encourage horse races and chariot races in the neighborhood. Nay, this psalmist considers that the noise of horses would be a nuisance, the drinking of mules a desecration to the sacred fountains, and the ostentation of fine-built chariots objectionable, as tending to divert the attention of spectators away from the great temple and its wealth. From such inconveniences, the god was protected by placing his sanctuary in the rocky Pytho, a rugged and uneven recess of no great dimensions embosomed in the southern declivity of Parnassus, and about 2,000 feet above the level of the sea, while the topmost Parnassian summits reached a height of near 8,000 feet. The situation was extremely imposing, but unsuited by nature for the congregation of any considerable number of spectators altogether impracticable for chariot races, and only rendered practicable by later art and outlay for the theatre as well as for the stadium. Such a site furnished little means of subsistence, but the sacrifices and presence of visitors enabled the ministers of the temple to live in abundance, and gathered together by degrees a village around it. Near the sanctuary of Pytho, and about the same altitude, was situated the ancient Phocian town of Crissa, on a projecting spur of Parnassus, overhung above by the line of rocky precipice called the Phidriades, and itself overhanging below the deep ravine through which flows the river Pistis. On the other side of this river rises the steep mountain Cirphus, which projects southward into the Corinthian Gulf, the river reaching that gulf through the broad Crisoian plain, which stretches westward nearly to the Locrian town of Amphissa, a plain for the most part fertile and productive, though least so in its eastern part immediately under the Cirphus, where the seaport Syra was placed. The temple, the oracle, and the wealth of Pytho belong to the very earliest periods of Grecian antiquity, but the octennial solemnity in honor of the god included at first no other competition except that of bards, who sang each a pain with the harp. The Amphictyonic assembly held one of its half-yearly meetings near the temple of Pytho, the other at Thermopylae, in those early times when the Homeric hymn to Apollo was composed, the town of Crissa appears to have been great and powerful, possessing all the broad plain between Parnassus, Cirphus, and the Gulf, to which latter it gave its name, and possessing also, what was a property not less valuable, the adjoining sanctuary of Pytho itself, which the hymn identifies with Crissa, not indicating Delphi as a separate place. The Crissaeans doubtless derived great profits from the number of visitors who came to visit Delphi, both by land and by sea, and Syra was originally only the name for their seaport. Gradually, however, the port appears to have grown in importance at the expense of the town, just as Apollonia and Ptolemaeus came to equal Cyrene and Barca, and as Plymouth Dock has swelled into Devonport, 
while at the same time the sanctuary of Pytho, with its administrators, expanded into the town of Delphi, and came to claim an independent existence of its own. The original relations between Crissa, Syra, and Delphi were in this manner at length subverted, the first declining and the two latter rising. The Crissaeans found themselves dispossessed of the management of the temple, which passed to the Delphians, as well as of the profits arising from the visitors, whose disbursements went to enrich the inhabitants of Syra. Crissa was a primitive city of the Phocian name, and could boast of a place as such in the Homeric catalogue, so that her loss of importance was not likely to be quietly endured. Moreover, in addition to the above facts, already sufficient in themselves as seeds of a quarrel, we are told that the Syraeans abused their position as masters of the avenue to the temple by sea, and levied exorbitant tolls on the visitors who landed there, a number constantly increasing from the multiplication of the transmarine colonies, and from the prosperity of those in Italy and Sicily. Besides such offense against the general Grecian public, they had also incurred the enmity of their Phocian neighbors by outrages upon women, Phocian as well as Argian, who were returning from the temple. Thus stood the case, apparently, about B.C. 595, when the Amphictyonic meeting interfered, either prompted by the Phocians, or perhaps on their own spontaneous impulse, out of regard to the temple, to punish the Syraeans. After a war of ten years, the first sacred war in Greece, this object was completely accomplished by a joint force of the Salians under Eurylychus, Sicyonians under Clisthenes, and Athenians under Alcmaeon the Athenian Solon being the person who originated and enforced in the Amphictyonic Council the proposition of interference. Syra appears to have made a strenuous resistance until its supplies from the sea were intercepted by the naval force of the Sicyonian Clisthenes. Even after the town was taken, its inhabitants defended themselves for some time on the heights of Cirphus. At length, however, they were thoroughly subdued. Their town was destroyed or left to subsist merely as a landing place, while the whole adjoining plain was consecrated to the Delphian god, whose domains thus touched the sea. Under this sentence, pronounced by the religious feeling of Greece and sanctified by a solemn oath publicly sworn and inscribed at Delphi, the land was condemned to remain untilled and unplanted, without any species of human care, and serving only for the pasturage of cattle. The latter circumstance was convenient to the temple, inasmuch as it furnished abundance of victims for the pilgrims who landed and came to sacrifice. For without preliminary sacrifice, no man could consult the oracle, while the entire prohibition of tillage was the only means of obviating the growth of another troublesome neighbor on the seaboard. The ruin of Syra in this war is certain, though the necessity of a harbor for visitors arriving by sea led to the gradual revival of the town upon a humbler scale of pretension. But the fate of Crissa is not so clear, nor do we know whether it was destroyed or left subsisting in a position of inferiority with regard to Delphi. From this time forward, however, the Delphian community appear as substantive and autonomous, exercising in their own right the management of the temple, though we shall find on more than one occasion that the Phocians contest this right and lay claim to the management of it for themselves a remnant of that early period when the oracle stood in the domain of the Phocian Crissa. There seems, moreover, to have been a standing antipathy between the Delphians and the Phocians. The sacred war emanating from a solemn Amphictyonic decree, carried on jointly by troops of different states whom we do not know to have ever before cooperated, and directed exclusively toward an object of common interest, is in itself a fact of high importance as manifesting a decided growth of Panhellenic feeling. Sparta is not named as interfering, a circumstance which seems remarkable when we consider both her power, even as it then stood, and her intimate connection with the Delphian oracle, while the Athenians appear as the chief movers, through the greatest and best of their citizens. The credit of a large-minded patriotism rests prominently upon them. But if this sacred war itself is a proof that the Panhellenic spirit was growing stronger, the positive result in which it ended reinforced that spirit still farther. The spoils of Syra were employed by the victorious allies in founding the Pythian Games. The octennial festival hitherto celebrated at Delphi in honor of the god, including no other competition except in the harp and the paean, was expanded into comprehensive games on the model of the Olympic, 
with matches not only of music, but also of gymnastics and chariots, celebrated not at Delphi itself, but on the maritime plain near the ruined Syra, and under the direct superintendence of the Amphictyons themselves. I have already mentioned that Solon provided large rewards for such Athenians as gained victories in the Olympic and Isthmian Games, thereby indicating his sense of the great value of the national games as a means of promoting Hellenic intercommunion. It was the same feeling which instigated the foundation of the new games on the Syrian plain in commemoration of the vindicated honor of Apollo, and in the territory newly made over to him. They were celebrated in the autumn, or first half, of every third Olympic year, the Amphictyons being the ostensible agonothets, or administrators, and appointing persons to discharge the duty in their names. At the first Pythian ceremony in B.C. 586, valuable rewards were given to the different victors. At the second, B.C. 582, nothing was conferred but wreaths of laurel. The rapidly attained celebrity of the games being such as to render any further recompense superfluous. The Sicyonian despot, Clisthenes himself, once the leader in the conquest of Syra, gained the prize at the chariot race of the second Pythia. We find other great personages in Greece frequently mentioned as competitors, and the games long maintained a dignity second only to the Olympic, over which indeed they had some advantage. First, that they were not abused for the purpose of promoting petty jealousies and antipathies of any administering state, as the Olympic Games were perverted by the Eleans on more than one occasion. Next, that they comprised music and poetry as well as bodily display. From the circumstances attending their foundation, the Pythian Games deserved, even more than the Olympic, the title bestowed on them by Demosthenes, the common agon of the Greeks. The Olympic and Pythian Games continued always to be the most venerated solemnities in Greece, yet the Nemea and Isthmia acquired a celebrity not much inferior, the Olympic prize counting for the highest of all. Both the Nemea and Isthmia were distinguished from the other two festivals by occurring not once in four years, but once in two years, the former in the second and fourth years of each Olympiad, the latter in the first and third years. To both is assigned, according to Greek custom, an origin connected with the interesting persons and circumstances of legendary antiquity. But our historical knowledge of both begins with the 6th century BC. The first historical Nemead is presented as belonging to Olympiad BC 52 or 53, 572 to 568, a few years subsequent to the sacred war above mentioned and to the origin of the Pythia. The festival was celebrated in honor of the Nemean Zeus in the valley of Nemea between Phylus and Cleone. The Cleonaeans themselves were originally its presidents, until some period after B.C. 460, the Argians deprived them of that honor and assumed the honors of administration to themselves. The Nemean Games had their Helena Dice to superintend, to keep order, and to distribute the prizes, as well as the Olympics. Respecting the Isthmian festival, our first historical information is a little earlier, for it has already been stated that Solon conferred a premium upon every Athenian citizen who gained a prize at that festival as well as at the Olympian, in or after B.C. 594. It was celebrated by the Corinthians at their Isthmus in honor of Poseidon, and if we may draw any inference from the legends respecting its foundation, which is ascribed sometimes to Theseus, the Athenians appear to have identified it with the antiquities of their own state. We thus perceive that the interval between B.C. 600 and 560 exhibits the first historical manifestation of the Pythia, Isthmia, and Nemea, the first expansion of all the three from local into Panhellenic festivals. To the Olympic Games, for some time the only great center of union among all the widely dispersed Greeks, are now added three other sacred agones of the like public, open, national character, constituting visible marks as well as tutelary bonds of collective Hellenism, and ensuring to every Greek who went to compete in the matches a safe and inviolate transit even through hostile Hellenic states. These four, all in or near Peloponnesus, and one of which occurred in each year, formed the period or cycle of sacred games, and those who had gained prizes at all the four received the enviable designation of periodonices, 
The honors paid to Olympic victors on their return to their native city were prodigious even in the 6th century BC and became even more extravagant afterward. We may remark that in the Olympic Games alone, the oldest as well as the most illustrious of the four, the musical and intellectual element was wanting. All the three more recent agones included crowns for exercises of music and poetry along with gymnastics, chariots, and horses. It was not only in the distinguishing national stamp set upon these four great festivals that the gradual increase of Hellenic family feeling exhibited itself during the course of this earliest period of Grecian history. Pursuant to the same tendencies, religious festivals in all the considerable towns gradually became more and more open and accessible, attracting guests as well as competitors from beyond the border. The comparative dignity of the city, as well as the honor rendered to the presiding god, were measured by the numbers, admiration, and envy of the frequenting visitors. There is no positive evidence indeed of such expansion in the Attic festivals earlier than the reign of Pisistratus who first added the quadrennial or greater Panathenae to the ancient annual or lesser Panathenaea. Nor can we trace the steps of progress in regards to Thebes, Orchomenus, Thespiae, Megara, Sicyon, Pellene, Aegina, Argos, etc., but we find full reason for believing that such was the general reality. Of the Olympic or Isthmian victors whom Pindar and Simonides celebrated, many derived a portion of their renown from previous victories acquired at several of these local contests, victories sometimes so numerous as to prove how widespread the habit of reciprocal frequentation had become, though we find even in the 3rd century BC treaties of alliance between different cities in which it is thought necessary to confer such mutual right by express stipulation. Temptation was offered to the distinguished gymnastic or musical competitors by prizes of great value. Timaeus even asserted, as proof of the overweening pride of Croton and Sybaris, that these cities tried to supplant the preeminence of the Olympic Games by instituting games of their own with the richest prizes to be celebrated at the same time, a statement in itself not worthy of credit yet nevertheless illustrating the animated rivalry known to prevail among the Grecian cities in procuring for themselves splendid and crowded games. At the time when the Homeric hymn to Demeter was composed, the worship of that goddess seems to have been purely local at Eleusis. But before the Persian War, the festival celebrated by the Athenians every year in honor of the Eleusinian Demeter admitted Greeks of all cities to be initiated and was attended by vast crowds of them. It was thus that the simplicity and strict local application of the primitive religious festival among the greater states in Greece gradually expanded, on certain great occasions periodically recurring, into an elaborate and regulated series of exhibitions not merely admitting but soliciting the fraternal presence of all Hellenic spectators. In this respect, Sparta seems to have formed an exception to the remaining states, her festivals were for herself alone, and her general rudeness toward other Greeks was not materially softened even at the Carnea and Hyacinthia, or Gymnopidae. On the other hand, the Attic Dionysia was gradually exalted, from their original rude, spontaneous outburst of village feeling in thankfulness to the god, followed by song, dance, and revelry of various kinds, into costly and diversified performances, first by a trained chorus, next by actors superadded to it, and the dramatic compositions thus produced, as they embodied the perfection of Grecian art, so they were eminently calculated to invite a pan-Hellenic audience and to encourage the sentiment of Hellenic unity. The dramatic literature of Athens, however, belongs properly to a later period. Previous to the year B.C. 560, we see only those commencements of innovation which drew upon Thespis the rebuke of Solon who, however, himself contributed to impart to the Panathenaic festival a more solemn and attractive character by checking the license of the Rhapsodes and ensuring to those present a full orderly recital of the Iliad. The sacred games and festivals took hold of the Greek mind by so great a variety of feelings as to counterbalance in a high degree the political disseverance and to keep alive among their widespread cities in the midst of constant jealousy and frequent quarrel, a feeling of brotherhood and congenial sentiment such as must otherwise have died away. 
the theors or sacred envoys who came to olympia or delphi from so many different points all sacrificed to the same god and at the same altar witnessed the same sports and contributed by their donatives to enrich or adorn one respective scene moreover the festival afforded opportunity for a sort of fair including much traffic amid so large a mass of spectators and besides the exhibitions of the games themselves there were recitations and lectures in a spacious council room for those who chose to listen to them by poets rhapsodes philosophers and historians among which last the history of herodotus is said to have been publicly read by its author of the wealthy and great men in the various cities many contended simply for the chariot victories and horse victories but there were others whose ambition was of a character more strictly personal and who stripped naked as runners wrestlers boxers or pancratiasts having gone through the extreme fatigue of a complete previous training cylon whose unfortunate attempt to usurp the scepter at athens has been recounted had gained the prize in the olympic stadium alexander son of amyntas the prince of macedon had run for it the great family of the diagoridae at rhodes who furnished magistrates and generals to their native city supplied a still greater number of successful boxers and pancratiasts at olympia while other instances also occur of generals named by various cities from the list of successful olympic gymnasts and the odes of pindar always dearly purchased attest how many of the great and wealthy were found in that list the perfect popularity and equality of persons at these great games is a feature not less remarkable than the exact adherence to predetermined rule and the self-imposed submission of the immense crowd to a handful of servants armed with sticks who executed the orders of the elean helena dice the ground upon which the ceremony took place and even the territory of the administering state was protected by a truce of god during the month of the festival the commencement of which was formally announced by heralds sent round to the various states treaties of peace between different cities were often formally commemorated by pillars there erected and the general impression of the scene suggested nothing but ideas of peace and brotherhood among greeks and i may remark that the impression of the games as belonging to all greeks and to none but greeks was stronger and clearer during the interval between b c six hundred to three hundred than it came to be afterward for the macedonian conquests had the effect of diluting and corrupting hellenism by spreading an exterior varnish of hellenic tastes and manners over a wide area of incongruous foreigners who were incapable of the real elevation of the hellenic character so that although in later times the games continued undiminished both in attraction and in number of visitors the spirit of panhellenic communion which had once animated the scene was gone forever end of section twenty one recording by colleen mcmahon section twenty two of the great events volume one this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rositer Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 22. Solon's Early Greek Legislation, B.C. 594, by George Grote, Part 1. Lycurgus, the reputed Spartan lawgiver, is credited with the construction, about B.C. 800, of the earliest Grecian commonwealth, founded upon a specific code of laws. These laws had mainly a military basis, and through obedience to them, the Spartans became a people of great hardiness, accustomed to self-discipline, famous for their prowess and endurance in war, and for sternness of individual and social virtues. In Athens, there were no written laws until the time of Draco, B.C. 621, the government before that period having been long in the hands of an oligarchy. In the year above named, Draco was Archon, and to him was entrusted the work of framing a legal code, conditions under the oligarchic rule having become intolerable to the people at large. The chief features of Draco's legislation had reference to the punishment of crime 
and so extreme were the severities of the system, and so cruel the penalties it prescribed, that in later times it was declared to have been written in blood. The draconian laws remained in force until superseded by the great system of Solon, whose advent as the new lawgiver was brought about mainly through the conspiracy of Cylon, twelve years after the legislation of Draco. Affairs in Athens were in a deplorable state of confusion and violence. The revolt of the poor against the power and privilege of the rich, leading to dangerous dissensions and collisions. Solon, who enjoyed a universal reputation for wisdom and uprightness, was called upon by the oligarchy, which again held rule, to assume what was in fact almost absolute power. The character of his legislation and its influence upon the course of Greek history have been set forth by many authors, and the following account is perhaps the best that has appeared in modern literature. Solon, son of Exesestides, was an opatride of middling fortune, but of the purest heroic blood, belonging to the gens or family of the Codrids and Nelaids, and tracing his origin to the god Poseidon. His father is said to have diminished his substance by prodigality, which compelled Solon in his earlier years to have recourse to trade, and in this pursuit he visited many parts of Greece and Asia. He was thus enabled to enlarge the sphere of his observation and to provide material for thought as well as for composition. His poetical talents displayed themselves at a very early age, first on light, afterward on serious subjects. It will be recollected that there was at that time no Greek prose writing, and that the acquisitions as well as the effusions of an intellectual man, even in their simplest form, adjusted themselves not to the limitations of the period and the semicolon, but to those of the hexameter and pentameter. Nor, in point of fact, do the verses of Solon aspire to any higher effect than we are accustomed to associate with an earnest, touching, and admonitory prose composition. The advice and appeals which he frequently addressed to his countrymen were delivered in this easy metre, doubtless far less difficult than the elaborate prose of subsequent writers or speakers, such as Thucydides, Isocrates, or Demosthenes. His poetry and his reputation became known throughout many parts of Greece, so that he was classed along with tales of Miletus, Bias of Preen, Pitacus of Mytilene, Periander of Corinth, Cleobulus of Lindus, Calon of Lacedaemon, altogether forming the constellation afterwards renowned as the Seven Wise Men. The first particular event in respect to which Solon appears as an active politician is the possession of the island of Salamis, then disputed between Megara and Athens. Megara was at that time able to contest with Athens, and for some time to contest with success. The occupation of this important island, a remarkable fact which perhaps may be explained by supposing that the inhabitants of Athens and its neighborhood carried on the struggle with only partial aid from the rest of Attica. However this may be, it appears that the Megarians had actually established themselves in Salamis at the time when Solon began his political career, and that the Athenians had experienced so much loss in the struggle as to have formally prohibited any citizen from ever submitting a proposition for its reconquest. Stung with this dishonorable abnegation, Solon counterfeited a state of ecstatic excitement, rushed into the agora, and there on the stone, usually occupied by the official herald, pronounced to the surrounding crowd a short elegiac poem which he had previously composed on the subject of Salamis. Enforcing upon them the disgrace of abandoning the island, he wrought so powerfully upon their feelings 
that they rescinded their prohibitory law. Rather, he exclaimed, would I forfeit my native city and become a citizen of Folegandrus, than be still named an Athenian, branded with the shame of surrendered Salamis. The Athenians again entered into the war, and conferred upon him the command of it, partly, as we are told, at the instigation of Pisistratus, though the latter must have been at this time, B.C. 600 to 594, a very young man, or rather boy. The stories in Plutarch, as to the way in which Salamis was recovered, are contradictory as well as apocryphal, ascribing to Solon various stratagems to deceive the Megarian occupiers. Unfortunately, no authority is given for any of them. According to that which seems the most plausible, he was directed by the Delphian god first to propitiate the local heroes of the island, and he accordingly crossed over to it by night, for the purpose of sacrificing to the heroes Periphemus and Sicherus on the Salaminian shore. Five hundred Athenian volunteers were then levied for the attack of the island, under the stipulation that if they were victorious, they should hold it in property and citizenship. They were safely landed on an outlying promontory, while Solon, having been fortunate enough to seize a ship which the Megarians had sent to watch the proceedings, manned it with Athenians and sailed straight toward the city of Salamis, to which the Athenians who had landed also directed their march. The Megarians marched out from the city to repel the latter, and during the heat of the engagement, Solon, with his Megarian ship and Athenian crew, sailed directly to the city. The Megarians, interpreting this as the return of their own crew, permitted the ship to approach without resistance, and the city was thus taken by surprise. Permission having been given to the Megarians to quit the island, Solon took possession of it for the Athenians, erecting a temple to Enyalius, the god of war, on Cape Skiradium, near the city of Salamis. The citizens of Megara, however, made various efforts for the recovery of so valuable a possession, so that a war ensued, long as well as disastrous to both parties. At last, it was agreed between them to refer the dispute to the arbitration of Sparta, and five Spartans were appointed to decide it, Critolidas, Amomphoretus, Hypsechidas, Anaxilas, and Cleomenes. The verdict in favor of Athens was founded on evidence which it is somewhat curious to trace. Both parties attempted to show that the dead bodies buried in the island conformed to their own peculiar mode of interment, and both parties are said to have cited verses from the catalogue of the Iliad, each accusing the other of error or interpolation. But the Athenians had the advantage on two points. First, there were oracles from Delphi, wherein Salamis was mentioned with the epithet Ionian. Next, Phileus and Eriseikis, sons of the Telamonian Ajax, the great hero of the island, had accepted the citizenship of Athens, made over Salamis to the Athenians, and transferred their own residences to Broron and Melit in Attica, where the deem or gens, Philidae, still worshipped Phileus as its eponymous ancestor. Such a title was held sufficient, and Salamis was abjudged by the five Spartans to Attica, with which it ever afterward remained incorporated until the days of Macedonian supremacy. Two centuries and a half later, when the orator Aeschines argued the Athenian right to Amphipolis against Philip of Macedon, the legendary elements of the title were indeed put forward, but more in the way of preface or introduction to the substantial political grounds. But in the year 600 BC, the authority of the legend was more deep-seated and operative, and adequate by itself, 
to determine a favorable verdict. In addition to the conquest of Salamis, Solon increased his reputation by espousing the cause of the Delphian temple against the extortionate proceedings of the inhabitants of Kirra, and the favor of the oracle was probably not without its effect in procuring for him that encouraging prophecy with which his legislative career opened. It is on the occasion of Solon's legislation that we obtain our first glimpse, unfortunately but a glimpse, of the actual state of Attica and its inhabitants. It is a sad and repulsive picture, presenting to us political discord and private suffering combined. Violent dissensions prevailed among the inhabitants of Attica, who were separated into three factions. The Pedies, or men of the plain, comprising Athens, Eloises, and the neighboring territory, among whom the greatest number of rich families were included. The mountaineers in the east and north of Attica called Diacri, who were, on the whole, the poorest party, and the Parali, in the southern portion of Attica, from sea to sea, whose means and social position were intermediate between the two. Upon what particular points these intestine disputes turned, we are not distinctly informed. They were not, however, peculiar to the period immediately preceding the archonship of Solon. They had prevailed before, and they reappear afterward, prior to the despotism of Pisistratus, the latter standing forward as the leader of the diacre, and as champion, real or pretended, of the poorer population. But in the time of Solon, these intestine quarrels were aggravated, by something much more difficult to deal with, a general mutiny of the poorer population against the rich, resulting from misery combined with oppression. The Thetes, whose condition we have already contemplated, in the poems of Homer and Hesiod, are now presented to us as forming the bulk of the population of Attica, the cultivating tenants, metayers, and small proprietors of the country. They are exhibited as weighed down by debts and dependents, and driven in large numbers out of state of freedom into slavery. The whole mass of them, we are told, being in debt to the rich, who were proprietors of the greater part of the soil, they had either borrowed money for their own necessities, or they tilled the lands of the rich as dependent tenants, paying a stipulated portion of the produce and in this capacity they were largely in arrear. All the calamitous effects were her seen of the old harsh law of debtor and creditor, once prevalent in Greece, Italy, Asia, and a large portion of the world, combined with the recognition of slavery as legitimate status, and of the right of one man to sell himself as well as that of another man to buy him. Every debtor, unable to fulfill his contract, was liable to be adjudged as the slave of his creditor, until he could find means, either of paying it or working it out. And not only he himself, but his minor sons and unmarried daughters and sisters also, whom the law gave him the power of selling. The poor man thus borrowed upon the security of his body, to translate literally the Greek phrase, and upon that of the persons in his family. So severely had these oppressive contracts been enforced that many debtors had been reduced from freedom to slavery in Attica itself, many others had been sold for exportation, and some had only hitherto preserved their own freedom by selling their children. Moreover, a great number of the smaller properties in Attica were under mortgage, signified, according to the formality usual in the Attic law, and continued down throughout the historical times, by a stone pillar erected on the land, inscribed with the name of the lender and the amount of the loan. The proprietors of these mortgage lands, in case of an unfavorable turn of events, 
had no other prospect except that of irremediable slavery for themselves and their families, either in their own native country, robbed of all its delights, or in some barbarian region where the Attic accent would never meet their ears. Some had fled the country to escape legal adjudication of their persons, and earned a miserable subsistence in foreign parts by degrading occupations. Upon several two, this deplorable lot had fallen by unjust condemnation and corrupt judges. The conduct of the rich in regard to money sacred and profane, in regard to matters public as well as private, being thoroughly unprincipled and rapacious. The manifold and long-continued suffering of the poor under this system, plunged into a state of debasement not more tolerable than that of Gallic plebs, and the injustices of the rich, in whom all political power was then vested, are facts well attested by the poems of Solon himself, even in the short fragments preserved to us. It appears that immediately preceding the time of his archonship, the evils had ripened to such a point, and the determination of the mass of sufferers to extort for themselves some mode of relief had become so pronounced that the existing laws could no longer be enforced. According to the profound remark of Aristotle, that seditions are generated by great causes, but out of small incidents, we may conceive that some recent events had occurred as immediate stimulants to the outbreak of the debtors, like those which lent so striking an interest to the early Roman annals as the inflaming sparks of violent popular movements for which the train had long before been laid. Condemnations by the archons of insolvent debtors may have been unusually numerous, or the maltreatment of some particular debtor once a respected free man, in his condition of slavery, may have been brought to act vividly upon the public sympathies, like the case of the old plebeian centurion at Rome, first impoverished by the plunder of the enemy, then reduced to borrow, and lastly abjudged to his creditor as an insolvent, who claimed the protection of the people in the forum, rousing their feelings to the highest pitch by the marks of the slave whip visible on his person. Some such incidents had probably happened, though we have no historians to recount them. Moreover, it is not unreasonable to imagine that that public mental affliction which the purifier Epimenides had been invoked to appease, as it sprang in part from pestilence, so it had its cause partly in years of sterility, which must of course have aggravated the distress of the small cultivators. However this may be, such was the condition of things in B.C. 594, through mutiny of the poor freemen and seats, and uneasiness of the middling citizens, that the governing oligarchy, unable either to enforce their private debts or to maintain their political power, were obliged to invoke the well-known wisdom and integrity of Solon. Though his vigorous protest, which doubtless rendered him acceptable to the mass of the people, against the iniquity of the existing system, had already been proclaimed in his poems, they still hoped that he would serve as an auxiliary to help them over their difficulties. They therefore choose him nominally as Archon, along with Philom Brutus, but with power in substance dictatorial. It had happened in several Grecian states that the governing oligarchies, either by quarrels among their own members, or by the general bad condition of the people under their government, were deprived of that hold upon the public mind which was essential to their power. Sometimes, as in the case of Pitacus of Mytilene, anterior to the archonship of Solon, and often in the factions of the Italian republics in the Middle Ages, the collision of opposing forces had rendered society intolerable and driven all parties 
to acquiesce in the choice of some reforming dictator. Usually, however, in the early Greek oligarchies, this ultimate crisis was anticipated by some ambitious individual who availed himself of the public discontent to overthrow the oligarchy and usurp the powers of a despot. And so probably it might have happened in Athens, had not the recent failure of Cylon, with all its miserable consequences, operated as a deterring motive. It is curious to read, in the words of Solon himself, the temper in which his appointment was construed by a large portion of the community, but more especially by his own friends, bearing in mind that at this early day, so far as our knowledge goes, democratical government was a thing unknown in Greece. All Grecian governments were either oligarchical or despotic, the mass of the freemen having not yet tasted of constitutional privilege. His own friends and supporters were the first to urge him, while redressing the prevalent discontents, to multiply partisans for himself personally and seize the supreme power. They even chid him as a madman for declining to haul up the net when the fish were already enmeshed. The mass of the people, in despair with their lot, would gladly have seconded him in such an attempt, while many even among the oligarchy might have acquiesced in his personal government, from the mere apprehension of something worse if they resisted it. That Solon might easily have made himself despot admits of little doubt, and though the position of a Greek despot was always perilous, he would have had greater facility for maintaining himself in it than Pisistratus possessed after him, so that nothing but the combination of prudence and virtue, which marks his lofty character, restricted him within the trust specially confided to him. To the surprise of everyone, to the dissatisfaction of his own friends, under the complaints alike, as he says, of various extreme and dissentient parties, who required him to adopt measures fatal to the peace of society, he set himself honestly to solve the very difficult and critical problem submitted to him. Of all grievances, the most urgent was the condition of the poorer class of debtors. To their relief, Solon's first measure, the memorable Seisekteia, or shaking off of burdens, was directed. The relief which it afforded was complete and immediate. It cancelled at once all those contracts in which the debtor had borrowed on the security either of his person or of his land. It forbade all future loans or contracts in which the person of the debtor was pledged as security. It deprived the creditor in future of all power to imprison or enslave or extort work from his debtor and confine him to an effective judgment at law authorizing the seizure of the property of the latter. It swept off all the numerous mortgage pillars from the landed properties in Attica, leaving the land free from all past claims. It liberated and restored to their full rights all debtors actually in slavery under previous legal adjudication, and it even provided the means we do not know how, of repurchasing in foreign lands and bringing back to the renewed life of liberty in Attica many insolvents who had been sold for exportation. And while Solon forbade every Athenian to pledge or sell his own person into slavery, he took a step farther in the same direction by forbidding him to pledge or sell his son, his daughter, or an unmarried sister under his tutelage, excepting only the case in which either of the latter might be detected in unchastity. Whether this last ordinance was contemporaneous with the Seisekteia, or followed as one of his subsequent reforms, seems doubtful. By this extensive measure, the poor debtors, the thieves, small tenants, and proprietors, together with their families, 
were rescued from suffering and peril. But these were not the only debtors in the state. The creditors and landlords of the exonerated seats were doubtless in their turn debtors to others, and were less able to discharge their obligations in consequence of the loss inflicted upon them by the Sesecteia. It was to assist these wealthier debtors, whose bodies were in no danger, yet without exonerating them entirely, that Solon resorted to the additional expedient of debasing the money standard. He lowered the standard of the drachma in a proportion of something more than 25%, so that hundred drachmas of the new standard contained no more silver than 73 of the old, or hundred of the old were equivalent to 138 of the new. By this change, the creditors of these more substantial debtors were obliged to submit to a loss, while the debtors acquired an exemption to the extent of about 27%. Lastly, Solon decreed that all those who had been condemned by the archons to atomy, civil disfranchisement, should be restored to their full privileges of citizens, excepting, however, from this indulgence those who had been condemned by the Ephetae, or by the Areopagus, or by the Philo Basileis, the four kings of the tribes, after trial in the Pritanium on charges either of murder or treason. So wholesale a measure of amnesty affords strong grounds for believing that the previous judgments of the Archons had been intolerably harsh, and it is to be recollected that the draconian ordinances were then in force. End of section 22 Section 23 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Solon's Early Greek Legislation. B.C. 594, by George Grote, Part 2. Such were the measures of relief with which Solon met the dangerous discontent then prevalent, that the wealthy men and leaders of the people, whose insolence and iniquity he has himself severely denounced in his poems, and whose views in nominating him he had greatly disappointed, should have detested propositions which robbed them without compensation of many legal rights, it is easy to imagine. But the statement of Plutarch that the poor emancipated debtors were also dissatisfied from having expected that Solon would not only remit their debts, but also re-divide the soil of Attica, seems utterly incredible nor is it confirmed by any passage now remaining of the Solonian poems. Plutarch conceives the poor debtors as having in their minds the comparison with Lycurgus and the equality of property at Sparta, which, in my opinion, is clearly a matter of fiction. And even had it been true, as a matter of history long past and antiquated, would not have been likely to work upon the minds of the multitude of Attica in the forcible way that the biographer supposes. The Seishatea must have exasperated the feelings and diminished the fortunes of many persons, but it gave to the large body of Thetes and small proprietors all that they could possibly have hoped. We are told that after a short interval it became eminently acceptable in the general public mind and procured for Solon a great increase of popularity all ranks concurring in a common sacrifice of thanksgiving and harmony. One incident there was which occasioned an outcry of indignation. Three rich friends of Solon, all men of great family in the state, and bearing names which appear in history as borne by their descendants, namely Conon, Cleinias, and Hipponicus, 
having obtained from Solon some previous hint of his designs, profited by it, first to borrow money, and next to make purchases of lands, and this selfish breach of confidence would have disgraced Solon himself, had it not been found that he was personally a great loser, having lent money to the extent of five talents. In regard to the whole measure of the Seisachtea, indeed, though the poems of Solon were open to everyone, ancient authors gave different statements both of its purport and of its extent. Most of them construed it as having cancelled indiscriminately all money contracts, while Androtion and others thought that it did nothing more than lower the rate of interest and depreciate the currency to the extent of 27%, leaving the letter of the contracts unchanged. How Androtion came to maintain such an opinion we cannot easily understand. For the fragments now remaining from Solon seem distinctly to refute it, though, on the other hand, they do not go so far as to substantiate the full extent of the opposite view entertained by many writers, that all money contracts indiscriminately were rescinded, against which there is also a further reason, that if the fact had been so, Solon could have had no motive to debase the money standard. Such debasement supposes that there must have been some debtors, at least, whose contracts remained valid, and whom, nevertheless, he desired partially to assist. His poems distinctly mention three things. First, the removal of the mortgage pillars. Second, the enfranchisement of the land. Third, the protection, liberation, and restoration of the persons of endangered or enslaved debtors. All these expressions point distinctly to the thetes and small proprietors, whose sufferings and peril were the most urgent, and whose case required a remedy, immediate as well as complete. We find that his repudiation of debts was carried far enough to exonerate them, but no further. It seems to have been the respect entertained for the character of Solon, which partly occasioned these various misconceptions of his ordinances for the relief of debtors. Androtion in ancient and some eminent critics in modern times, are anxious to make out that he gave relief without loss or injustice to anyone. But this opinion seems inadmissible. The loss to creditors by the wholesale abrogation of numerous pre-existing contracts, and by the partial depreciation of the coin, is a fact not to be disguised. The Seisachtea of Solon, unjust so far as it rescinded previous agreements, but highly salutary in its consequences, is to be vindicated by showing that in no other way could be bonds of government have been held together, or the misery of the multitude alleviated. We are to consider first that the great personal cruelty of these pre-existing contracts, which condemned the body of the free debtor and his family to slavery. Next, the profound detestation created by such a system in the large mass of the poor, against both the judges and the creditors by whom it had been enforced, which rendered their feelings unmanageable so soon as they came together under the sentiment of a common danger, and with the determination to ensure to each other mutual protection. Moreover, the law which vests a creditor with power, or the person of his debtor, so as to convert him into a slave, is likely to give rise to a class of loans which inspire nothing but abhorrence, money lent with the foreknowledge that the borrower will be unable to repay it, but also in the conviction that the value of his person as a slave will make good the loss, thus reducing him to a condition of extreme misery, for the purpose sometimes of aggrandizing, sometimes of enriching, the lender. Now the foundation on which the respect for contracts rests, under a good law of debtor and creditor, is the very reverse of this. It rests on the firm conviction that such contracts are advantageous to both parties as a class, and that to break up the confidence essential to their existence 
would produce extensive mischief throughout all society. The man whose reverence for the obligation of a contract is now the most profound would have entertained a very different sentiment if he had witnessed the dealings of lender and borrower at Athens under the old Antesolonian law. The oligarchy had tried their best to enforce this law of debtor and creditor with its disastrous series of contracts, and the only reason why they consented to invoke the aid of Solon was because they had lost the power of enforcing it any longer. In consequence, of the newly awakened courage and combination of the people. That which they could not do for themselves, Solon could not have done for them, even had he been willing. Nor had he, in his position, the means, either of exempting or compensating those creditors, who, separately taken, were open to no reproach. Indeed, in following his proceedings we see plainly that he sought compensation due not to the creditors, but to the past sufferings of the enslaved debtor, since he redeemed several of them from foreign captivity, and brought them back to their homes. It is certain that no measure simply and exclusively prospective would have sufficed for the emergency. There was an absolute necessity for overruling all that class of pre-existing rights which had produced so violent a social fever. While, therefore, to this extent, the Seychetea cannot be acquitted of injustice, we may confidently affirm that the injustice inflicted was an indispensable price paid for the maintenance of the peace of society, and for the final abrogation of a disastrous system as regarded insolvents. And the feeling, as well as the legislation universal in the modern European world, by interdicting beforehand all contracts for selling a man's person or that of his children into slavery, goes far to sanction practically the Solonian repudiation. One thing is never to be forgotten in regard to this measure, combined with the concurrent amendments introduced by Solon in the law. It settled finally the question to which it referred. Never again do we hear of the law of debtor and creditor as disturbing Athenian tranquillity. The general sentiment which grew up at Athens under the Solonian money law and under the democratical government was one of high respect for the sanctity of contracts. Not only was there never any demand in the Athenian democracy for new tables or a depreciation of the money standard, but a formal abnegation of any such projects was inserted in the solemn oath taken annually by the numerous diecasts who formed the popular judicial body called Heliaea, or the Heliastic Jurors. The same oath which pledged them to uphold the democratical constitution also bound them to repudiate all proposals either for an abrogation of debts or for a redivision of the lands. There can be little doubt that under the Solonian law, which enabled the creditor to seize the property of his debtor, but gave him no power over the person, the system of money-lending assumed a more beneficial character. The old noxious contracts, mere snares for the liberty of a poor freeman and his children, disappeared, and loans of money took their place, founded on the property and prospective earnings of the debtor, which were in the main useful to both parties, and therefore maintained their place in the moral sentiment of the public. And though Solon had found himself compelled to rescind all the mortgages on land subsisting in this time, we see money freely lent upon this same security throughout the historical times of Athens, and the evidentiary mortgage pillars remaining ever after undisturbed. In the sentiment of an early society, as in the old Roman law, a distinction is commonly made between the principal and the interest of a loan, though the creditors have sought to blend them indissolubly together. If the borrower cannot fulfill his promise to repay the principal, the public will regard him as having committed a wrong which he must make good by his person but there is not the same unanimity 
as to his promise to pay interest. On the contrary, the very exaction of interest will be regarded by many in the same light in which the English law considers usurious interest, as tainting the whole transaction. But in the modern mind, principal and interest with a limited rate have so grown together that we hardly understand how it can ever have been pronounced unworthy of an honorable citizen to lend money on interest. Yet such is the declared opinion of Aristotle and other superior men of antiquity, while at Rome Cato the censor went so far as to denounce the practice as a heinous crime. It was comprehended by them among the worst of the tricks of trade, and they held that all trade, or profit, derived from interchange, was unnatural, as being made by one man at the expense of another. Such pursuits, therefore, could not be commanded, though they might be tolerated, to a certain extent, as a matter of necessity, but they belonged essentially to an inferior order of citizens. What is remarkable in Greece is that the antipathy of a very early state of society against traders and money-lenders lasted longer among the philosophers than among the mass of the people. It harmonized more with the social ideal of the former than with the practical instincts of the latter. In a rude condition, such as that of the ancient Germans described by Tacitus, loans on interest are unknown. Habitually, careless of the future, the Germans were gratified both in giving and receiving presents, but without any idea that they thereby either imposed or contracted an obligation. To a people in this state of feeling, a loan on interest presents the repulsive idea of making profit out of the distress of the borrower. Moreover, it is worthy of remark that the first borrowers must have been for the most part men driven to this necessity by the pressure of want, and contracting debt as a desperate resource without any fair prospect of ability to repay. Debt and famine ran together in the mind of the poet Hesiod. The borrower is, in this unhappy state, rather a distressed man, soliciting aid than a solvent man capable of making and fulfilling a contract. If he cannot find a friend to make him a free gift in the former character, he will not, under the latter character, obtain a loan from a stranger, except by the promise of exorbitant interest, and by the fullest eventual power over his person, which he is in a condition to grant. In process of time, a new class of borrowers arise, who demand money for temporary convenience or profit, but with full prospect of repayment, a relation of lender and borrower quite different from that of the earlier period, when it presented itself in the repulsive form of misery on the one side, set against the prospect of very large profit on the other. If the Germans of the time of Tacitus looked to the condition of the poor debtors in Gaul, reduced to servitude under a rich creditor, and swelling by hundreds the crowd of his attendants, they would not be disposed to regret their own ignorance of the practice of money-lending. How much the interest of money was then regarded as an undue profit extorted from distress is powerfully illustrated by the old Jewish law, the Jew being permitted to take interest from foreigners, whom the lawgiver did not think himself obliged to protect, but not from his own countrymen. The Koran follows out this point of view consistently, and prohibits the taking of interest altogether. In most other nations laws have been made to limit the rate of interest, and at Rome especially, the legal rate was successively lowered though it seems as might have been expected that the restrictive ordinances were constantly eluded. All such restrictions have been intended for the protection of debtors, an effect which large experience proves them never to produce, unless it be called protection to render the obtaining of money on loan impracticable for the most distressed borrowers. But there was another effect which they did tend to produce. 
they softened down the primitive antipathy against the practice generally, and confined the odious name of usury to loans, lent above the fixed legal rate. In this way alone could they operate beneficially, and their tendency to counterwork the previous feeling was at that time not unimportant, coinciding as it did with other tendencies arising out of the industrial progress of society, which gradually exhibited the relation of lender and borrower in a light more reciprocal, beneficial, and less repugnant to the sympathies of the bystander. At Athens, the most favorable point of view prevailed throughout all the historical times. The march of industry and commerce, under the mitigated law which prevailed subsequently to Solon, had been sufficient to bring it about at a very early period and to suppress all public antipathy against lenders at interest. We may remark, too, that this more equitable tone of opinion grew up spontaneously, without any legal restriction on the rate of interest, no such restriction having ever been imposed, and the rate being expressly declared free by a law ascribed to Solon himself. The same may probably be said of the communities of Greece generally, at least, there is no information to make us suppose the contrary. But the feeling against lending money at interest remained in the bosoms of the philosophical men long after it had ceased to form a part of the practical morality of the citizens, and long after it had ceased to be justified by the appearances of the case as at first it really had been. Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, and Plutarch treat the practice as a branch of the commercial and money-getting spirit, which they are anxious to discourage, and one consequence of this was that they were less disposed to contend strenuously for the inviolability of existing money contracts. The conservative feeling on this point was stronger among the mass than among the philosophers. Plato even complains of it as inconveniently preponderant and as arresting the legislature in all comprehensive projects of reform. For the most part, indeed, schemes of cancelling debts and redividing lands were never thought of, except by men of desperate and selfish ambition, who made them stepping-stones to despotic power. Such men were denounced alike by the practical sense of the community and by the speculative thinkers. But when we turn to the case of the Spartan king, Aegis III, who proposed a complete extinction of debts and an equal redivision of the landed property of the state, not with any selfish or personal views, but upon pure ideas of patriotism, well or ill understood, and for the purpose of renovating the lost ascendancy of Sparta, we find Plutarch expressing the most unqualified admiration of this young king and his projects, and treating the opposition made to him as originating in no better feelings than meanness and cupidity. The philosophical thinkers on politics conceived, and to a great degree justly, as I shall show hereafter, that the conditions of security in the ancient world imposed upon the citizens generally the absolute necessity of keeping up a military spirit and willingness to brave at all times personal hardship and discomfort, so that increase of wealth on account of the habits of self-indulgence which it commonly introduces was regarded by them with more or less of disfavor. If, in their estimation, any Grecian community had become corrupt, they were willing to sanction great interference with pre-existing rights for the purpose of bringing it back nearer to their ideal standard. And the real security for the maintenance of these rights lay in the conservative feelings of the citizens generally, much more than in the opinions which superior minds imbibed from the philosophers. Such conservative feelings were, in the subsequent Athenian democracy, peculiarly deep-rooted. The mass of the Athenian people identified inseparably the maintenance of property in all its various shapes 
with that of their laws and constitution. And it is a remarkable fact that though the admiration entertained at Athens for Solon was universal, the principle of his seishatea and of his money depreciation was not only never imitated, but found the strongest tacit reprobation. Whereas at Rome, as well as in most of the kingdoms of modern Europe, we know that one debasement of the coin succeeded another. The temptation of thus partially eluding the pressure of financial embarrassments proved, after one successful trial, too strong to be resisted, and brought down the coin by successive depreciations from the full pound of twelve ounces to the standard of one half ounce. It is of some importance to take notice of this fact when we reflect how much Grecian faith has been degraded by the Roman writers into a byword for duplicity in pecuniary dealings. The democracy of Athens, and indeed the cities of Greece generally, both oligarchies and democracies, stands far above the Senate of Rome and far above the modern kingdoms of France and England until comparatively recent times, in respect of honest dealing with the coinage. Moreover, while there occurred at Rome several political changes which brought about new tables, or at least a partial depreciation of contracts, no phenomenon of the same kind ever happened at Athens during the three centuries between Solon and the end of the free working of the democracy. Doubtless, there were fraudulent debtors at Athens, while the administration of private law, though not in any way conniving at their proceedings, was far too imperfect to repress them as effectually as might have been wished. But the public sentiment on the point was just and decided. It may be asserted with confidence that a loan of money at Athens was quite as secure as it ever was at any time or place of the ancient world, in spite of the great and important superiority of Rome, with respect to the accumulation of a body of authoritative legal precedent, the source of what was ultimately shaped into the Roman jurisprudence. Among the various causes of sedition or mischief in the Grecian communities, we hear little of the pressure of private debt. By the measures of relief above described, Solon had accomplished results, surpassing his own best hopes. He had healed the prevailing discontents, and such was the confidence and gratitude which he had inspired that he was now called upon to draw up a constitution and laws for a better working of the government in future. His constitutional changes were great and valuable. Respecting his laws, what we hear is rather curious than important. End of section 23section 24 of the great events volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the great events by famous historians volume 1 edited by charles f horn rossiter johnson and john rudd section 24 Solon's Early Greek Legislation, B.C. 594, by George Grot, Part 3. It has been already stated that, down to the time of Solon, the classification received in Attica was that of the four Ionic tribes, comprising in one scale the Fratres and Gents, and in another scale the three Thrites and forty-eight Naucraries while the Eupatridae, seemingly a few specially respected gents, and perhaps a few distinguished families in all the gents, had in their hands all the powers of government. Solon introduced a new principle of classification, called in Greek the Timocratic Principle. He distributed all the citizens of the tribes, without any reference to their gents or fratres, into four classes, according to the amount of their property, which he caused to be assessed and entered in a public schedule. 
those whose annual income was equal to five hundred medimni of corn about seven hundred imperial bushels and upward one medimnus being considered equivalent to one brahma in money he placed in the highest class those who received between three hundred and five hundred medimni or drachmas formed the second class and those between two hundred and three hundred the third the fourth and most numerous class comprised all those who did not possess land yielding a produce equal to two hundred medimni the first class called pentacosio medimni were alone eligible to the archonship and to all commands the second were called the knights or horsemen of the state as possessing enough to enable them to keep a horse and perform military service in that capacity the third class called the greek zoigiti formed the heavy armed infantry and were bound to serve each with his full panoply each of these three classes was entered in the public schedule as possessed of a taxable capital calculated with a certain reference to his annual income but in a proportion diminishing according to the scale of that income and a man paid taxes to the state according to the sum for which he stood rated in the schedule so that this direct taxation acted really like a graduated income tax the rateable property of the citizen belonging to the richest class the pentacosio medimnus was calculated and entered on the state schedule at a sum of capital equal to twelve times his annual income that of the hippos horseman or knight at a sum equal to ten times his annual income that of the tsoigit at a sum equal to five times his annual income thus a pentacosio medimus whose income was exactly five hundred drachmas the minimum qualification of this class stood rated in the schedule for a taxable property of six thousand drachmas or one talent being twelve times his income if his annual income were one thousand drachmas he would stand rated for twelve thousand drachmas or two talents being the same proportion of income to rateable capital but when we pass to the second class horsemen or knights the proportion of the two is changed the horseman possessing an income of just three hundred drachmas or three hundred medimni would stand rated for three thousand drachmas or ten times his real income and so in the same proportion for any income above three hundred and below five hundred again in the third class or below three hundred the proportion is a second time altered the zoigit possessing exactly two hundred drachmas of income was rated upon a still lower calculation at one thousand drachmas or a sum equal to five times his income and all incomes of this class between two hundred and three hundred drachmas would in like manner be multiplied by five in order to obtain the amount of rateable capital upon these respective sums of schedule capital all direct taxation was levied if the state required one per cent of direct tax the poorest pentacosio medimnus would pay upon six thousand drachmas sixty drachmas the poorest hippos would pay upon three thousand drachmas thirty the poorest soigit would pay upon one thousand drachmas ten drachmas and thus this mode of assessment would operate like a graduated income tax looking at it in reference to the three different classes but as an equal income tax looking at it in reference to the different individuals comprised in one and the same class all persons in the state whose annual income amounted to less than two hundred medimni or drachmas were placed in the fourth class and they must have constituted the large majority of the community they were not liable to any direct taxation and perhaps were not at first even entered upon the taxable schedule more especially as we do not know that any taxes were actually levied upon this schedule during the Solonian times. It is said that they were all called Thetes, but this appellation is not well sustained and cannot be admitted. The fourth compartment in the descending scale was indeed termed the Tetic census, 
because it contained all the athletes, and because most of its members were of that humble description. But it is not conceivable that the proprietor, whose land yielded to him, a clear annual return of hundred, hundred and twenty, hundred and forty, or hundred and eighty drachmas, could ever have been designated by that name. Such were the divisions in the political scale established by Solon, called by Aristotle a democracy, in which the rights, honors, functions, and liabilities of the citizens were measured out according to the assessed property of each. The highest honors of the state that is, the places of the nine archons annually chosen, as well as those in the senate of Areopagus, into which the past archons always entered, perhaps also the posts of Prytanes of the Naucrae, were reserved for the first class. The poor oipatrids became ineligible, while rich men, not oipatrids, were admitted. Other posts of inferior distinction were filled by the second and third classes, who were, moreover, bound to military service, the one on horseback, the other as heavy-armed soldiers on foot. Moreover, the liturgies of the state, as they were called, unpaid functions, such as the trierarchy, chorogy, gymnasiarchy, etc., which entailed expense and trouble on the holder of them, were distributed in some way or other between the members of the three classes, though we do not know how the distribution was made in these early times. On the other hand, the members of the fourth or lowest class were disqualified from holding any individual office of dignity. They performed no liturgies, served in case of war only as light-armed or with a panoply provided by the state, and paid nothing to the direct property tax, or ace fora. It would be incorrect to say that they paid no taxes, for indirect taxes, such as duties on imports, fell upon them in common with the rest, and we must recollect that these latter were, throughout a long period of Athenian history, in steady operation, while the direct taxes were only levied on rare occasions. But though this fourth class, constituting the great numerical majority of the free people, were shut out from individual office, their collective importance was in another way greatly increased. They were invested with the right of choosing the annual archons out of the class of Pentecostio Medimni, and what was of more importance still, the archons and the magistrates generally, after their year of office, instead of being accountable to the senate of Areopagus, were made formally accountable to the public assembly sitting in judgment upon their past conduct. They might be impeached and called upon to defend themselves, punished in case of misbehavior, and debarred from the usual honor of a seat in the senate of Areopagus. Had the public assembly been called upon to act alone without aid or guidance, this accountability would have proved only nominal, but Solon converted it into a reality by another new institution, which will hereafter be found of great moment in the working out of the Athenian democracy. He created the pro boilotic or pre-considering senate, with intimate and special reference to the public assembly, to prepare matters for its discussion, to convoke and superintend its meetings, and to ensure the execution of its decrees. The Senate, as first constituted by Solon, comprised four hundred members, taken in equal proportions from the four tribes, not chosen by lot, as they will be found to be in the more advanced stage of the democracy, but elected by the people, in the same way as the archons then were, persons of the fourth or poorest class of the census, though contributing to elect, not being themselves eligible. But while Solon thus created the new pre-considering senate, identified with the unsubsidiary to the popular assembly, he manifested no jealousy of the pre-existing Areopagitic senate. On the contrary, he enlarged its powers, gave to it an ample supervision over the execution of the laws generally, and imposed upon it 
the censorial duty of inspecting the lives and occupation of the citizens, as well as of punishing men of idle and dissolute habits. He was himself, as past Archon, a member of this ancient senate, and he is said to have contemplated that, by means of the two senates, the state would be held fast, as it were with a double anchor, against all shocks and storms. Such are the only new political institutions, apart from the laws to be noticed presently, which there are grounds for ascribing to Solon, when we take proper care to discriminate what really belongs to Solon and his age from the Athenian constitution as afterward remodelled. It has been a practice common with many able expositors of Grecian affairs, and followed partly even by Dr. Thurwall, to connect the name of Solon with the whole political and judicial state of Athens, as it stood between the age of Pericles and that of Demosthenes, the regulations of the Senate of 500, the numerous public diecasts or jurors taken by lot from the people, as well as the body annually selected for law revision and called nomothetes, and the open prosecution called the Graphe Paranomon, to be instituted against the proposer of any measure illegal, unconstitutional, or dangerous. There is indeed some countenance for this confusion between Solonian and post-Solonian Athens in the usage of the orators themselves. For Demosthenes and Aeschines employ the name of Solon in a very loose manner, and treat him as the author of institutions belonging evidently to a later age, for example, the striking and characteristic oath of the Heliastic jurors, which Demosthenes ascribes to Solon, proclaims itself in many ways as belonging to the age after Clisthenes, especially by the mention of the Senate of 500, and not of 400. Among the citizens who served as jurors or diecasts, Solon was venerated generally as the author of the Athenian laws. An orator, therefore, might well employ his name for the purpose of emphasis, without provoking any critical inquiry whether the particular institution, which he happened to be then impressing upon his audience, belonged really to Solon himself, or to the subsequent periods. Many of those institutions which Dr. Thirlwall mentions in conjunction with the name of Solon are among the last refinements and elaborations of the democratical mind of Athens, gradually prepared, doubtless, during the interval between Clisthenes and Pericles, but not brought into full operation until the period of the latter, B.C. 460 to 429. For it is hardly possible to conceive these numerous dicasteries and assemblies in regular, frequent, and long-standing operation without an assured payment to the diecasts who composed them. Now such payment first began to be made about the time of Pericles, if not by his actual proposition, and Demosthenes had good reason for contending that if it were suspended, the judicial as well as the administrative system of Athens would at once fall to pieces. It would be a marvel such a nothing short of strong direct evidence would justify us in believing that in an age when even partial democracy was yet untried, Solon should conceive the idea of such institutions. It would be a marvel still greater that the half-emancipated seats and small proprietors for whom he legislated, yet trembling under the rod of the Eupatrid archons, and utterly inexperienced in collective business, should have been found suddenly competent to fulfill these ascendant functions, such as the citizens of conquering Athens in the days of Pericles, full of the sentiment of force, and actively identifying themselves with the dignity of their community, became gradually competent, and not more than competent, to exercise this effect. To suppose that Solon contemplated and provided for the periodical revision of his laws by establishing a nomothetic jury or dicastery, such as that which we find in operation during the time of Demosthenes, 
would be at variance, in my judgment, with any reasonable estimate, either of the man or of the age. Herodotus says that Solon, having exacted from the Athenians solemn oath that they would not rescind any of his laws for ten years, quitted Athens for that period, in order that he might not be compelled to rescind them himself. Plutarch informs us that he gave to his laws force for a century. Solon himself and Draco before him had been lawgivers evoked and empowered by the special emergency of the times. The idea of a frequent revision of laws by a body of lot-selected die-casts belongs to a far more advanced age, and could not well have been present to the minds of either. The wooden rollers of Solon, like the tables of the Roman decemvirs, were doubtless intended as a permanent, fons omnis publici privatica juris. If we examine the facts of the case, we shall see that nothing more than the bare foundation of the democracy of Athens, as it stood in the time of Pericles, can reasonably be ascribed to Solon. I gave to the people, Solon says in one of his short remaining fragments, as much strength as sufficed for their needs, without either enlarging or diminishing their dignity, for those two, who possessed power and were noted for wealth, I took care that no unworthy treatment should be reserved. I stood with the strong shield cast over both parties, so as not to allow an unjust triumph to either. Again, Aristotle tells us that Solon bestowed upon the people as much power as was indispensable, but no more. The power to elect their magistrates and hold them to accountability if the people had had less than this, they could not have been expected to remain tranquil. They would have been in slavery and hostile to the constitution. Not less distinctly does Herodotus speak when he describes the revolution subsequently operated by Clisthenes. The latter, he tells us, found the Athenian people excluded from everything. These passages seem positively to contradict the supposition, in itself sufficiently improbable, that Solon is the author of the peculiar democratical institutions of Athens, such as the constant and numerous dicasts for judicial trials and revision of laws. The genuine and forward democratical movement of Athens begins only with Clisthenes, from the moment when that distinguished alcamonoid either spontaneously or from finding himself worsted in his party strife with Isagoras, purchased by large popular concessions the hearty cooperation of the multitude under very dangerous circumstances. While Solon, in his own statement, as well as in that of Aristotle, gave to the people as much power as was strictly needful, but no more, Clisthenes, to use the significant phrase of Herodotus, being vanquished in the party contest with his rival, took the people into partnership. It was thus to the interests of the weaker section, in a strife of contending nobles, that the Athenian people owed their first admission to political ascendancy, in part at least to this cause, though the proceedings of Clisthenes indicate a hearty and spontaneous popular sentiment. But such constitutional admission of the people would not have been so astonishingly fruitful in positive results if the course of public events for the half-century after Clisthenes had not been such as to stimulate most powerful their energy, their self-reliance, their mutual sympathies, and their ambition. I shall recount in a future chapter these historical causes, which, acting upon the Athenian character, gave such efficiency and expansion to the great democratical impulse communicated by Clisthenes. At present it is enough to remark that that impulse commences properly with Clisthenes and not with Solon. But the Solonian constitution, though only the foundation, was yet the indispensable foundation of the subsequent democracy. And if the discontents of the miserable Athenian population 
instead of experiencing his disinterested and healing management, had fallen at once into the hands of selfish power-seekers like Cylon or Pisistratus, the memorable expansion of the Athenian mind during the ensuing century would never have taken place, and the whole subsequent history of Greece would probably have taken a different course. Solon left the essential powers of the state still in the hands of the oligarchy. The party combats between Pisistratus, Lycurgus, and Megacles, thirty years after his legislation, which ended in the despotism of Pisistratus, will appear to be of the same purely oligarchical character as they had been before Solon was appointed archon. But the oligarchy which he established was very different from the unmitigated oligarchy which he found, so teeming with oppression and so destitute of redress, as his own poems testify. It was he who first gave both to the citizens of middling property and to the general mass of locus standi against the oipatrides. He enabled the people partially to protect themselves and familiarized them with the idea of protecting themselves by the peaceful exercise of a constitutional franchise. The new force through which this protection was carried into effect was the public assembly called Heliae, regularized and armed with enlarged prerogatives and further strengthened by its indispensable ally, the pro boiloitic or pre-considering Senate. Under the Solonian constitution, this force was merely secondary and defensive, but after the renovation of Clisthenes, it became paramount and sovereign. It branched out gradually into those numerous popular dicasteries, which so powerfully modified both public and private Athenian life, drew to itself the undivided reverence and submission of the people, and by degrees rendered the single magistracies essentially subordinate functions. The popular assembly, as constituted by Solon, appearing in modified efficiency and trained to the office of reviewing and judging the general conduct of a past magistrate, forms the intermediate stage between the passive Homeric agora and those omnipotent assemblies and dicasteries which listened to Pericles or Demosthenes. Compared with these last, it has in it but a faint streak of democracy, and so it naturally appeared to Aristotle, who wrote with a practical experience of Athens in the time of the orators. But compared with the first, or with the anti-Solonian constitution of Attica, it must doubtless have appeared a concession eminently democratical. To impose upon the oipatry, Archon, the necessity of being elected, or put upon his trial, of after accountability, by the rabble of free men, such would be the phrase in Oipatrid society, would be a bitter humiliation to those among whom it was first introduced. For we must recollect that this was the most extensive scheme of constitutional reform yet propounded in Greece, and that despots and oligarchies shared between them, at that time, the whole Grecian world. As it appears that Solon, while constituting the popular assembly with its pro boiletic senate, had no jealousy of the senate of Areopagus, and indeed even enlarged its powers. We may infer that his grand object was not to weaken the oligarchy generally, but to improve the administration and to repress the misconduct and irregularities of the individual archons, and that, too, not by diminishing their powers, but by making some degree of popularity the condition both of their entry into office and of their safety or honor after it. It is, in my judgment, a mistake to suppose that Solon transferred the judicial power of the archons to a popular dicastery. These magistrates still continued self-acting judges, deciding and condemning without appeal, not mere presidents of an assembled jury, as they afterwards came to be during the next century. For the general exercise of such power they were accountable after their year of office. 
such accountability was the security against abuse a very insufficient security yet not wholly inoperative it will be seen however presently that these archons though strong to coerce and perhaps to oppress small and poor men had no means of keeping down rebellious nobles of their own rank such as pisistratus lycurgus and megacles each with his armed followers when we compare the drawn swords of these ambitious competitors ending in the despotism of one of them with the vehement parliamentary strife between themistocles and aristides afterward peaceably decided by the vote of the sovereign people and never disturbing the public tranquillity we shall see that the democracy of the ensuing century fulfilled the conditions of order as well as of progress better than the Salonian constitution end of section twenty four section twenty five of the great events volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 25. Solon's Early Greek Legislation, B.C. 594, by George Grote, Part 4. To distinguish this Solonian constitution from the democracy which followed it, is essential to a due comprehension of the progress of the Greek mind, and especially of Athenian affairs. That democracy was achieved by gradual steps. Demosthenes and Aeschines lived under it as a system consummated and in full activity, when the stages of its previous growth were no longer matter of exact memory, and the diecasts then assembled in judgment were pleased to hear their constitution associated with the names either of Solon or of Theseus. Their inquisitive contemporary Aristotle was not thus misled, but even commonplace Athenians of the century preceding would have escaped the same delusion. For during the whole course of the democratical movement, from the Persian invasion down to the Peloponnesian War, and especially during the changes proposed by Pericles and Ephialtes, there was always a strenuous party of resistance, who would not suffer the people to forget that they had already forsaken, and were on the point of forsaking still more, the orbit marked out by Solon. The illustrious Pericles underwent innumerable attacks both from the orators in the assembly and from the comic writers in the theatre, and among these sarcasms on the political tendencies of the day, we are probably to number the complaint, breathed by the poet Cratinus, of the desuetude into which both Solon and Draco had fallen. I swear, said he in a fragment of one of his comedies, by Solon and Draco, whose wooden tablets of laws are now employed by people to roast their barley. The laws of Solon respecting penal offences, respecting inheritance and adoption, respecting the private relations generally, etc., remained for the most part in force. His quadripartite census also continued, at least for financial purposes, until the archonship of Nausinicus in B.C. 377, so that Cicero and others might be warranted in affirming that his laws still prevailed at Athens. But his political and judicial arrangements had undergone a revolution not less complete and memorable than the character and spirit of the Athenian people generally. The choice by way of lot of archons and other magistrates, and the distribution by lot of the general body of diecasts or jurors into panels of for judicial business, may be decidedly considered as not belonging to Solon, but adopted after the revolution of Clisthenes, probably the choice of senators by lot also. The lot was a symptom of pronounced democratical spirit, such as we must not seek in the Solonian institutions. It is not easy to make out distinctly 
what was the political position of the ancient gentes and fratries as solon left them the four tribes consisted altogether of gentes and fratries insomuch that no one could be included in any one of the tribes who was not also a member of some genes or fratry now the new pro boiloitic or pre-considering senate consisted of four hundred members one hundred from each of the tribes persons not included in any gens or fratry could therefore have had no access to it the conditions of eligibility were similar according to ancient custom for the nine archons of course also for the senate of areopagus so that there remained only the public assembly in which an athenian not a member of these tribes could take part yet he was a citizen since he could give his vote for archons and senators and could take part in the annual decision of their accountability besides being entitled to claim redress for wrong from the archons in his own person while the alien could only do so through the intervention of an avouching citizen or prostates it seems therefore that all persons not included in the four tribes whatever their grade of fortune might be were on the same level in respect to political privilege as the fourth and poorest class of the solonian census it has already been remarked that even before the time of solon the number of athenians not included in the gentes or fratries was probably considerable it tended to become greater and greater since these bodies were close and unexpensive while the policy of the new lawgiver tended to invite industrious settlers from other parts of greece and athens such great and increasing inequality of political privilege helps to explain the weakness of the government in repelling the aggressions of pisistratus and exhibits the importance of the revolution afterward wrought by clisthenes when he abolished for all political purposes the four old tribes and created ten new comprehensive tribes in place of them in regard to the regulations of the senate and the assembly of the people as constituted by solon we are altogether without information nor is it safe to transfer to the solonian constitution the information comparatively ample which we possess respecting these bodies under the later democracy the laws of solon were inscribed on wooden rollers and triangular tablets in the species of writing called boistrophedon lines alternating first from left to right and then from right to left like the course of the ploughman and preserved first in the acropolis subsequently in the pritaneum on the tablets called kirbes were chiefly commemorated the laws respecting sacred rites and sacrifices on the pillars or rollers of which there were at least sixteen were placed the regulations respecting matters profane so small are the fragments which have come down to us and so much has been ascribed to solon by the orators which belongs really to the subsequent times that it is hardly possible to form any critical judgment respecting the legislation as a whole or to discover by what general principles or purposes he was guided he left unchanged all the previous laws and practices respecting the crime of homicide connected as they were intimately with the religious feelings of the people the laws of draco on this subject therefore remained but on other subjects according to plutarch they were altogether abrogated there is however room for supposing that the repeal cannot have been so sweeping as this biographer represents the solonian laws seems to have borne more or less upon all the great departments of human interest and duty we find regulations political and religious public and private civil and criminal commercial agricultural sumptuary and disciplinarian solon provides punishment for crimes restricts the profession and status of the citizen prescribes detailed rules for marriage as well as for burial for the common use of springs and wells and for the mutual interest of conterminous farmers in planting or hedging their properties 
as far as we can judge from the imperfect manner in which his laws come before us, there does not seem to have been any attempt at a systematic order or classification. Some of them are mere general and vague directions, while others again run into the extreme of specialty. By far the most important of all was the amendment of the law of debtor and creditor, which has already been adverted to, and the abolition of the power of fathers and brothers to sell their daughters and sisters into slavery. The prohibition of all contracts on the security of the body was itself sufficient to produce a vast improvement in the character and condition of the poorer population, a result which seems to have been so sensibly obtained from the legislation of Solon, that Boeck and some other eminent authors suppose him to have abolished villainage and conferred upon the poor tenants a property in their lands, annulling the seigneurial rights of the landlord. But this opinion rests upon no positive evidence, nor are we warranted in ascribing to him any stronger measure in reference to the land than the annulment of the previous mortgages. The first pillar of his laws contained a regulation respecting exportable produce. He forbade the exportation of all produce of the Attic soil except olive oil alone. And the sanction employed to enforce observance of this law deserves notice as an illustration of the ideas of the time. The archon was bound, on pain of forfeiting one hundred drachmas, to pronounce solemn curses against every offender. We are probably to take this prohibition in conjunction with other objects said to have been contemplated by Solon, especially the encouragement of artisans and manufacturers at Athens. Observing, we are told, that many new immigrants were just then flocking into Attica to seek an establishment, in consequence of its greater security, he was anxious to turn them rather to manufacturing industry than to the cultivation of a soil naturally poor. He forbade the granting of citizenship to any immigrants except to such as had quitted irrevocably their former abodes and come to Athens for the purpose of carrying on some industrial profession, and in order to prevent idleness, he directed the senate of Areopagus to keep watch over the lives of the citizens generally, and punish every one who had no course of regular labor to support him. If a father had not taught his son some art or profession, Solon relieved the son from all obligation to maintain him in his old age, and it was to encourage the multiplication of these artisans that he insured, or sought to insure, to the residents in Attica, the exclusive right of buying and consuming all its landed produce, except olive oil, which was raised in abundance, more than sufficient for their wants. It was his wish that the trade with foreigners should be carried on by exporting the produce of artisan labor instead of the produce of land. This commercial prohibition is founded on principles substantially similar to those which were acted upon in the early history of England, with reference both to corn and to wool, and in other European countries also. In so far as it was at all operative, it tended to lessen the total quantity of produce raised upon the soil of Attica, and thus to keep the price of it from rising. But the law of Solon must have been altogether inoperative, in reference to the great articles of human subsistence, for Attica imported, both largely and constantly, grain and salt provisions, probably also wool and flax for the spinning and weaving of the women, and certainly timber for building. Whether the law was ever enforced with reference to figs and honey may well be doubted. At least these productions of Attica were in after times trafficked in and generally consumed throughout Greece. Probably also, in the time of Solon, the silver mines of Lorium had hardly begun to be worked. These afterward became highly productive, and furnished to Athens a commodity for foreign payments no less convenient than lucrative. It is interesting to notice the anxiety 
both of Solon and of Draco, to enforce among their fellow citizens industrious and self-maintaining habits, and we shall find the same sentiment proclaimed by Pericles at the time when Athenian power was at its maximum. Nor ought we to pass over this early manifestation in Attica of an opinion equitable and tolerant towards sedentary industry, which in most other parts of Greece was regarded as comparatively dishonorable. The general tone of Grecian sentiment recognized no occupations as perfectly worthy of a free citizen except arms, agriculture, and athletic and musical exercises, and the proceedings of the Spartans, who kept aloof even from agriculture and left it to their helots, were admired, though they could not be copied, throughout most of the Hellenic world. Even minds like Plato, Aristotle, and Xenophon concurred to a considerable extent in this feeling, which they justified on the ground that the sedentary life and unceasing housework of the artisan were inconsistent with military aptitude. The town occupations are usually described by a word which carries with it contemptuous ideas, and though recognized as indispensable to the existence of the city, are held suitable only for an inferior and semi-privileged order of citizens. This, the received sentiment among Greeks, as well as foreigners, found a strong and growing opposition at Athens, as I have already said, corroborated also by a similar feeling at Corinth. The trade of Corinth, as well as of Chalcis in Oibia, was extensive, at a time when that of Athens had scarce any existence. But while the despotism of Periander can hardly have failed to operate as a discouragement to industry at Corinth, the contemporaneous legislation of Solon provided for traders and artisans a new home at Athens, giving the first encouragement to that numerous town population, both in the city and in the Piraeus, which we find actually residing there in the succeeding century. The multiplication of such town residents, both citizens and metics, i.e. resident persons, not citizens, but enjoying an assured position and civil rights, was a capital fact in the onward march of Athens, since it determined not merely the extension of her trade, but also the preeminence of her naval forces, and thus, as a further consequence, lent extraordinary vigor to their democratical government. It seems, moreover, to have been a departure from the primitive temper of Atticism, which tended both to cantonal residence and ruler occupation. We have, therefore, the greater interest in noting the first mention of it as a consequence of the Solonian legislation. To Solon is first owing the admission of a power of testamentary bequest at Athens in all cases, in which a man had no legitimate children. According to the pre-existing custom, we may rather presume that if a deceased person left neither children nor blood relations, his property descended, as at Rome, to his genes and fratry. Throughout most rude states of society, the power of willing is unknown, as among the ancient Germans, among the Romans prior to the Twelve Tables, in the old laws of the Hindus, etc. Society limits a man's interest or power of enjoyment to his life, and considers his relatives as having joint reversionary claims to his property, which take effect in certain determinate proportions after his death. Such a law was the more likely to prevail at Athens, since the perpetuity of the family's sacred rights, in which the children and near relatives partook of right, was considered by the Athenians as a matter of public as well as of private concern. Solon gave permission to every man, dying without children, to bequeath his property by will as he should think fit, and the testament was maintained unless it could be shown to have been procured by some compulsion or improper seduction. Speaking generally, this continued to be the law throughout the historical times of Athens. Sons, wherever there were sons, 
succeeded to the property of their father in equal shares, with the obligation of giving out their sisters in marriage along with a certain dowry. If there were no sons, then the daughters succeeded, though the father might by will, within certain limits, determine the person to whom they should be married, with their rights of succession attached to them, or might, with the consent of his daughters, make by will certain other arrangements about his property. A person who had no children, or direct lineal descendants, might bequeath his property at pleasure. If he died without a will, first his father, then his brother or brother's children, next his sister or sister's children succeeded. If none such existed, then the cousins by the father's side, next the cousins by the mother's side, the male line of descent having preference over the female. Such was the principle of the Solonian laws of succession, though the particulars are in several ways obscure and doubtful. Solon, it appears, was the first who gave power of superseding, by testament, the rights of agnates and gentiles to succession, a proceeding in consonance with his plan of encouraging both industrious occupation and the consequent multiplication of individual acquisitions. It has been already mentioned that Solon forbade the sale of daughters or sisters into slavery by fathers or brothers, a prohibition which shows how much females had before been looked upon as articles of property. And it would seem that before his time, the violation of a free woman must have been punished at the discretion of the magistrates, for we are told that he was the first who enacted a penalty of one hundred drachmas against the offender, and twenty drachmas against the seducer of a free woman. Moreover, it is said that he forbade a bride, when given in marriage, to carry with her any personal ornaments and appurtenances, except, to the extent of three robes, and certain matters of furniture not very valuable. Solon further imposed upon women several restraints in regard to proceeding at the obsequies of deceased relatives. He forbade profuse demonstrations of sorrow, singing of composed dirges, and costly sacrifices and contributions. He limited strictly the quantity of meat and drink admissible for the funeral banquet, and prohibited nocturnal exit, except in a car and with a light. It appears that both in Greece and Rome, the feelings of duty and affection on the part of surviving relatives prompted them to ruinous expense in a funeral, as well as to unmeasured effusions both of grief and conviviality, and the general necessity experienced for legal restriction is attested by the remark of Plutarch that similar prohibitions to those enacted by Solon were likewise in force at his native town of Caronia. Other penal enactments of Solon are yet to be mentioned. He forbade absolutely evil speaking with respect to the dead. He forbade it likewise with respect to the living, either in a temple or before judges or archons, or at any public festival, on pain of a forfeit of three drachmas to the person aggrieved, and two more to the public treasury. How mild the general character of his punishments was, may be judged by this law against foul language, not less than by the law before mentioned against rape. Both the one and the other of these offences were much more severely dealt with under the subsequent law of democratical Athens. The peremptory edict against speaking ill of a deceased person, though doubtless springing in a great degree from disinterested repugnance, is traceable also in part to that fear of the wrath of the departed which strongly possessed the early Greek mind. End of section 25section twenty six of the great events volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. the great events by famous historians volume one edited by charles f horn rossiter johnson and john rudd 
Solon's Early Greek Legislation, B.C. 594, by George Grote, Part 5. It seems generally that Solon determined by law the outlay for the public sacrifices, though we do not know what were his particular directions. We are told that he reckoned a sheep and a medimnus of wheat or barley as equivalent, either of them, to a drachma, and that he also prescribed the prices to be paid for first-rate oxen intended for solemn occasions. But it astonishes us to see the large recompense which he awarded out of the public treasury to a victor at the Olympic or Isthmian Games, to the former, five hundred drachmas equal to one year's income of the highest of the four classes on the census, to the latter, one hundred drachmas. The magnitude of these rewards strikes us the more when we compare them with the fines on rape and evil speaking. We cannot be surprised that the philosopher Xenophanes noticed, with some degree of severity, the extravagant estimate of this species of excellence current among the Grecian cities. At the same time we must remember, both, that these Panhellenic games presented the chief visible evidence of peace and sympathy among the numerous communities of Greece, and that, in the time of Solon, factitious reward was still needful to encourage them. In respect to land and agriculture, Solon proclaimed a public reward of five drachmas for every wolf brought in, and one drachma for every wolf's cub. The extent of wild land has at all times been considerable in Attica. He also provided rules respecting the use of wells between neighbors and respecting the planting in conterminous olive grounds. Whether any of these regulations continued in operation during the better known period of Athenian history cannot be safely affirmed. In respect to theft, we find it stated that Solon repealed the punishment of death which Draco had annexed to that crime and enacted as a penalty. Compensation to an amount double the value of the property stolen. The simplicity of this law perhaps affords ground for presuming that it really does belong to Solon. But the law which prevailed during the time of the orators respecting theft must have been introduced at some later period, since it enters into distinctions and mentions both places and forms of procedure, which we cannot reasonably refer to the 46th Olympiad. The public dinners at the Pretanium, of which the Archons and a select few partook in common, were also either first established, or perhaps only more strictly regulated by Solon. He ordered barley cakes for their ordinary meals, and wheat and loaves for festival days, prescribing how often each person should dine at the table. The honor of dining at the table of the Pretanium was maintained throughout as a valuable reward at the disposal of the government. Among the various laws of Solon, there are few which have attracted more notice than that which pronounces the man who in a sedition stood aloof and took part with neither side to be dishonored and disfranchised. Strictly speaking, this seems more in the nature of an empathic moral denunciation, or a religious curse, than a legal sanction capable of being formally applied, in an individual case, and after judicial trial. Though the sentence of atimi, under the more elaborated Attic procedure, was both definite in its penal consequences, and also judicially delivered. We may, however, follow the course of ideas under which Solon was induced to write this sentence on his tables, and we may trace the influence of similar ideas in later Attic institutions. It is obvious that his denunciation is confined to that special case in which a sedition has already broken out, or that Pisistratus, Megacles, and Lycurgus are in arms at the head of their partisans. Assuming these leaders to be wealthy and powerful men, which would in all probability be the fact, the constituted authority, such as Solon saw before him in Attica, even after his own organic amendments, was not strong enough to maintain the peace, 
it became, in fact, itself one of the contending parties. Under such given circumstances, the sooner every citizen publicly declared his adherence to some of them, the earlier this suspension of legal authority was likely to terminate. Nothing was so mischievous as the indifference of the mass, or the disposition to let the combatants fight out the matter among themselves, and then to submit to the victor. Nothing was more likely to encourage aggression on the part of an ambitious malcontent than the conviction that if he could once overpower the small amount of physical force which surrounded the archons, and exhibit himself in armed possession of the Pritaneum or the Acropolis, he might immediately count upon passive submission on the part of all the free men without. Under the state of feeling which Solon inculcates, the insurgent leader would have to calculate that every man who was not actively in his favor would be actively against him, and this would render his enterprise much more dangerous. Indeed, he could then never hope to succeed, except on the double supposition of extraordinary popularity in his own person and widespread detestation of the existing government. He would thus be placed under the influence of powerful deterring motives, so that ambition would be less likely to seduce him into a course which threatened nothing but ruin, unless under such encouragements from the pre-existing public opinion as to make his success a result desirable for the community. Among the small political societies of Greece, especially in the age of Solon, when the number of despots in other parts of Greece seems to have been at its maximum, every government, whatever might be its form, was sufficiently weak to make its overthrow a matter of comparative facility. Unless upon the supposition of a band of foreign mercenaries, which would render the government a system of naked force, and which the Athenian lawgiver would of course never contemplate, there was no other stay for it except a positive and pronounced feeling of attachment on the part of the mass of citizens. Indifference on their part would render them a prey to every daring man of wealth who chose to become a conspirator. That they should be ready to come forward, not only with voice but with arms, and that they should be known beforehand to be so, was essential to the maintenance of every good Grecian government. It was salutary in preventing mere personal attempts at revolution, and pacific in its tendency, even where the revolution had actually broken out, because in the greater number of cases the proportion of partisans would probably be very unequal, and the inferior party would be compelled to renounce their hopes. It will be observed that, in this enactment of Solon, the existing government is ranked merely as one of the contending parties. The virtuous citizen is enjoined not to come forward in its support, but to come forward at all events, either for it or against it. Positive and early action in all which is prescribed to him as matter of duty. In the age of Solon there was no political idea or system yet current which could be assumed as an unquestionable datum, no conspicuous standard to which the citizens could be pledged under all circumstances to attach themselves. The option lay only between a mitigated oligarchy in possession and a despot in possibility. A contest wherein the affections of the people could rarely be counted upon in favor of the established government. But this neutrality in respect to the constitution was at an end after the revolution of Clisthenes, when the idea of the sovereign people and the democratical institutions became both familiar and precious to every individual citizen. We shall hereafter find the Athenians binding themselves by the most sincere and solemn oath to uphold their democracy against all attempts to subvert it. We shall discover in them a sentiment not less positive and uncompromising in its direction than energetic in its inspirations. But while we notice this very important change in their character, we shall at the same time perceive 
that the wise precautionary recommendation of Solon to obviate sedition by an early declaration of the impartial public between two contending leaders was not lost upon them. Such, in point of fact, was the purpose of that salutary and protective institution which is called the ostracism. When two party leaders, in the early stages of the Athenian democracy, each powerful in adherence and influence, had become passionately embarked in bitter and prolonged opposition to each other, such opposition was likely to conduct one or other to violent measures. Over and above the hopes of party triumph, each might well fear that, if he himself continued within the bounds of legality, he might fall a victim to aggressive proceedings on the part of his antagonists. To ward off this formidable danger, a public vote was called for to determine which of the two should go into temporary banishment, retaining his property and unvisited by any disgrace. A number of citizens, not less than six thousand, voting secretly, and therefore independently, were required to take part, pronouncing upon one or other of these eminent rivals a sentence of exile for ten years. The one who remained became, of course, more powerful, yet less in a situation to be driven into anti-constitutional courses than he was before. Tragedy and comedy were now beginning to be grafted on the lyric and choric song. First, one actor was provided to relieve the chorus. Next, two actors were introduced to sustain fictitious characters and carry on a dialogue in such manner that the songs of the chorus and the interlocution of the actors formed a continuous piece. Solon, after having heard Thespis acting, as all the early composers did, both tragic and comic, in his own comedy, asked him afterward if he was not ashamed to pronounce such falsehoods before so large an audience. And when Thespis answered that there was no harm in saying and doing such things merely for amusement, Solon indignantly exclaimed, striking the ground with his stick, If once we come to praise and esteem such amusement as this, we shall quickly find the effects of it in our daily transactions. For the authenticity of this anecdote, it would be rash to vouch, but we may at least treat it as the protest of some early philosopher against the deceptions of the drama. And it is interesting as marking the incipient struggles of that literature in which Athens afterward attained such unrivaled excellence. It would appear that all the laws of Solon were proclaimed, inscribed, and accepted without either discussion or resistance. He is said to have described them, not as the best laws which he could himself have imagined, but as the best which he could have induced the people to accept. He gave them validity for the space of ten years, during which period both the Senate collectively and the archons individually swore to observe them with fidelity, under penalty, in case of non-observance, of a golden statue as large as life to be erected at Delphi. But though the acceptance of the laws were accomplished without difficulty, it was not found so easy either for the people to understand and obey, or for the framer to explain them. Every day persons came to Solon, either with praise or criticism, or suggestions of various improvements, or questions as to the construction of particular enactments, until at last he became tired of this endless process of reply and vindication, which was seldom successful, either in removing obscurity or in satisfying complainants, foreseeing that if he remained, he would be compelled to make changes, he obtained leave of absence from his countrymen for ten years, trusting that before the expiration of that period they would have become accustomed to his laws. He quitted his native city in the full certainty that his laws would remain unrepelled until his return. For, says Herodotus, the Athenians could not repeal them, since they were bound by solemn oaths 
to observe them for ten years. The unqualified manner in which the historian here speaks of an oath, as if it created a sort of physical necessity and shut out all possibility of a contrary result, deserves notice as illustrating Grecian sentiment. On departing from Athens, Solon first visited Egypt, where he communicated largely with Psenophis of Heliopolis and Sonches of Sais, Egyptian priests who had much to tell respecting their ancient history, and from whom he learned matters, real or pretended, far transcending in alleged antiquity the oldest Grecian genealogies, especially the history of the vast submerged island of Atlantis and the war which the ancestors of the Athenians had successfully carried on against it nine thousand years before. Solon is said to have commenced an epic poem upon this subject, but he did not live to finish it, and nothing of it now remains. From Egypt he went to Cyprus, where he visited the small town of Epia, said to have been originally founded by Demophon, son of Theseus, and ruled at this period by the prince Philocyprus, each town in Cyprus having its own petty prince. It was situated near the river Clarius, in a position precipitous and secure, but inconvenient and ill-supplied. Solon persuaded Philocyprus to quit the old site, and establish a new town down in the fertile plain beneath. He himself stayed and became assist of the new establishment, making all the regulations requisite for its safe and prosperous march, which was indeed so decisively manifested that many new settlers flocked into the new plantation, called by Philocyprus Soli, in honor of Solon. To our deep regret, we are not permitted to know what these regulations were, but the general fact is attested by the poems of Solon himself, and the lines in which he bade farewell to Philocyprus on quitting the island are yet before us. On the dispositions of this prince, his poem bestowed unqualified commendation. Besides his visit to Egypt and Cyprus, a story was also current of his having conversed with the Lydian king Croesus at Sardis. The communication said to have taken place between them has been woven by Herodotus into a sort of moral tale which forms one of the most beautiful episodes in his whole history. Though this tale has been told and retold as if it were genuine history, yet as it now stands it is irreconcilable with chronology, although very possibly Solon may at some time or other have visited Sardis and seen Croesus as hereditary prince. But even if no chronological objections existed, the moral purpose of the tale is so prominent and pervades it so systematically from beginning to end that these internal grounds are of themselves sufficiently strong to impeach its credibility as a matter of fact, unless such doubts happen to be outweighed, which in this case they are not, by good contemporary testimony. The narrative of Solon and Croesus can be taken for nothing else but an illustrative fiction, borrowed by Herodotus from some philosopher, enclosed in his own peculiar beauty of expression, which on this occasion is more decidedly poetical than is habitual with him. I cannot transcribe, and I hardly dare to abridge it. The vainglorious Croesus, at the summit of his conquests and his riches, endeavors to win from his visitor Solon an opinion that he is the happiest of mankind. The latter, after having twice preferred to him modest and meritorious Grecian citizens, at length reminds him that his vast wealth and power are of a tenure too precarious to serve as an evidence of happiness. That the gods are jealous and meddlesome, and often makes the show of happiness a mere prelude to extreme disaster, and that no man's life can be called happy until the whole of it has been played out, so that it may be seen to be out of the reach of reverses. Croesus treats his this opinion as absurd, but, 
a great judgment from God fell upon him after Solon was departed, probably, observes Herodotus, because he fancied himself the happiest of all men. First, he lost his favorite son, Attis, a brave and intelligent youth, his only other son being dumb. For the Mysians of Olympus being ruined by a destructive and formidable wild boar, which they were unable to subdue, applied for aid to Croesus, who sent to the spot a chosen hunting force, and permitted, though with great reluctance, in consequence of an alarming dream, that his favorite son should accompany them. The young prince was unintentionally slain by the Phrygian exile Adrastus, whom Croesus had sheltered and protected. Hardly had the latter recovered from the anguish of this misfortune, when the rapid growth of Cyrus and the Persian power induced him to go to war with them, against the advice of his wisest counsellors. After a struggle of about three years, he was completely defeated, his capital Sardis taken by storm, and himself made prisoner. Cyrus ordered a large pile to be prepared, and placed upon it Croesus in fetters, together with fourteen young Lydians, in the intention of burning them alive, either as a religious offering, or in fulfillment of a vow, or perhaps, says Herodotus, to see whether some of the gods would not interfere to rescue a man so preeminently pious as the king of Lydia. In this sad extremity, Croesus bethought him of the warning which he had before despised, and thrice pronounced, with a deep groan, the name of Solon. Cyrus desired the interpreters to inquire whom he was invoking, and learned in reply the anecdote of the Athenian lawgiver, together with the solemn memento which he had offered to Croesus during more prosperous days, attesting the frail tenure of all human greatness. The remark sunk deep into the Persian monarch as a token of what might happen to himself. He repented of his purpose, and directed that the pile, which had already been kindled, should be immediately extinguished. But the orders came too late, in spite of the most zealous efforts of the bystanders. The flame was found unquenchable, and Croesus would still have been burned, had he not implored with prayers and tears the succor of Apollo, to whose Delphian and Theban temples he had given such munificent presents. His prayers were heard, the fair sky was immediately overcast, and a profuse rain descended, sufficient to extinguish the flames. The life of Croesus was thus saved, and he became afterward the confidential friend and adviser of his conqueror. Such is the brief outline of a narrative which Herodotus has given with full development and with impressive effect. It would have served as a show lecture to the youth of Athens, not less admirably than the well-known fable of the choice of Heracles, which the philosopher Prodicus, a junior contemporary of Herodotus, delivered with so much popularity. It illustrates forcibly the religious and ethical ideas of antiquity, the deep sense of the jealousy of the gods, who would not endure pride in any one except themselves, the impossibility for any man of realizing to himself more than a very moderate share of happiness, the danger from a reactionary nemesis, if at any time he had overpassed such limit, and the necessity of calculations taking in the whole of life as a basis for rational comparison of different individuals. And it embodies, as a practical consequence from these feelings, the often repeated protest of moralists against vehement impulses and unrestrained aspirations. The more valuable this narrative appears in its illustrative character, the less can we presume to treat it as a history. It is much to be regretted that we have no information respecting events in Attica immediately after the Solonian laws and constitution, which were promulgated in B.C. 594, so as to understand better the practical effect of these changes. What we next hear respecting Solon in Attica 
refers to a period immediately preceding the first usurpation of Pisistratus in B.C. 560, and after the return of Solon from his long absence. We are here again introduced to the same oligarchical dissensions as are reported to have prevailed before the Solonian legislation. The Pedes, or opulent proprietors of the plain round Athens, under Lycurgus, the Parali of the south of Attica, under Megacles, and the Diacri, or mountaineers of the eastern cantons, the poorest of the three classes under Pisistratus, are in a state of violent intestine dispute. The account of Plutarch represents Solon as returning to Athens during the hate of this sedition. He was treated with respect by all parties, but his recommendations were no longer obeyed, and he was disqualified by age from acting with effect in public. He employed his best efforts to mitigate party animosities, and applied himself particularly to restrain the ambition of Pisistratus, whose ulterior projects he quickly detected. The future greatness of Pisistratus is said to have been first portended by a miracle which happened, even before his birth, to his father Hippocrates at the Olympic Games. It was realized partly by his bravery and conduct, which had been displayed in the capture of Nicaea from the Megarians, partly by his popularity of speech and manners, his championship of the poor, and his ostentatious disavowal of all selfish pretensions, partly by an artful mixture of stratagem and force. Solon, after having addressed fruitless remonstrances to Pisistratus himself, publicly denounced his designs in verses addressed to the people. The deception, whereby Pisistratus finally accomplished his design, is memorable in Grecian tradition. He appeared one day in the Agora of Athens in his chariot with a pair of mules, he had intentionally wounded both his person and the mules, and in this condition he threw himself upon the compassion and defense of the people, pretending that his political enemies had violently attacked him. He implored the people to grant him a guard, and at the moment when their sympathies were freshly aroused, both in his favor and against his supposed assassins, Aristo proposed formally to the Ecclesia, the pro-boilotic senate, being composed of friends of Pisistratus, had previously authorized the proposition, that a company of fifty clubmen should be assigned as a permanent bodyguard for the defense of Pisistratus. To this motion Solon opposed a strenuous resistance, but found himself overborne and even treated as if he had lost his senses. The poor were earnest in favor of it, while the rich were afraid to express their dissent, and he could only comfort himself after the fatal vote had been passed, by exclaiming that he was wiser than the former, and more determined than the latter. Such was one of the first known instances, in which this memorable stratagem was played off against the liberty of a Grecian community. The unbounded popular favor which had procured the passing of this grant was still further manifested by the absence of all precautions to prevent the limits of the grant from being exceeded. The number of the bodyguard was not long confined to fifty, and probably their clubs were soon exchanged for sharper weapons. Pisistratus thus found himself strong enough to throw off the mask and seize the Acropolis. His leading opponents, Megacles and the Alkinoids, immediately fled the city, and it was left to the venerable age and undaunted patriotism of Solon, to stand forward almost alone, in a vain attempt to resist the usurpation. He publicly presented himself in the marketplace, employing encouragement, remonstrance, and reproach, in order to rouse the spirit of the people. To prevent this despotism from coming, he told them, would have been easy. To shake it off now was more difficult, yet at the same time more glorious. But he spoke in vain, for all who were not actually favorable to Pisistratus, listened only to their fears, and remained passive. Nor did anyone join Solon, when, as a last appeal, 
he put on his armor and planted himself in a military posture before the door of his house. "'I have done my duty,' he exclaimed at length. "'I have sustained to the best of my power my country and the laws.' And he then renounced all further hope of opposition, though resisting the instances of his friends that he should flee, and returning for answer when they asked him on what he relied for protection, on my old age. Nor did he even think it necessary to repress the inspirations of his muse. Some verses yet remain, composed seemingly at a moment, when the strong hand of the new despot had begun to make itself sorely felt, in which he tells his countrymen, If ye have endured sorrow from your own baseness of soul, impute not the fault of this to the gods. Ye have yourselves put force and dominion into the hands of these men, and have thus drawn upon yourselves wretched slavery. It is gratifying to learn that Pisistratus, whose conduct throughout his despotism was comparatively mild, left Solon untouched. How long this distinguished man survived the practical subversion of his own constitution, we cannot certainly determine, but according to the most probable statement, he died during the very next year, at the advanced age of eighty. We have only to regret that we are deprived of the means of following more in detail his noble and exemplary character. He represents the best tendencies of his age, combined with much that is personally excellent, the improved ethical sensibility, the thirst for enlarged knowledge and observation, not less potent in old age than in youth, the conception of regularized popular institutions, departing sensibly from the type and spirit of the governments around him, and calculated to found a new character in the Athenian people, a genuine and reflecting sympathy with the mass of the poor, anxious not merely to rescue them from the oppressions of the rich, but also to create in them habits of self-relying industry. Lastly, during his temporary possession of a power altogether arbitrary, not merely an absence of all selfish ambition, but a rare discretion in seizing the mean between conflicting exigencies. In reading his poems we must always recollect that what now appears commonplace was once new, so that to his comparatively unlettered age the social pictures which he draws were still fresh, and his exhortations calculated to live in the memory. The poems composed on moral subjects generally inculcate a spirit of gentleness towards others and moderation in personal objects. They represent the gods as irresistible, retributive, favoring the good and punishing the bad, though sometimes very tardily, but his compositions on special and present occasions are usually conceived in a more vigorous spirit, denouncing the oppressions of the rich at one time, and the timid submission to Pisistratus at another, and expressing in empathic language his own proud consciousness of having stood forward as champion of the mass of the people. Of his early poems hardly anything is preserved. The few lines remaining seem to manifest a jovial temperament, which we may well conceive, to have been overlaid by such political difficulties as he had to encounter, difficulties arising successively out of the Megarian War, the Silonian sacrilege, the public despondency healed by Epimenides, and the task of arbiter between a rapacious oligarchy and a suffering people. In one of his elegies addressed to Mimernus, he marked out the sixtieth year as the longest desirable period of life, in preference to the eightieth year, which that poet had expressed to wish to attain. But his own life, as far as we can judge, seems to have reached the longer of the two periods, and not the least honorable part of it, the resistance to Pisistratus, occurs immediately before his death. There prevailed a story that his ashes were collected and scattered around the island of Salamis, which Plutarch treats as absurd, though he tells us at the same time that it was believed both by Aristotle and by many other considerable men. It is at least as ancient as the poet Cratinus, who alluded to it in one of his comedies, and I do not feel inclined to reject it. 
the inscription on the statue of Solon at Athens described him as a Salaminian. He had been the great means of acquiring the island for his country, and it seems highly probable that among the new Athenian citizens who went to settle there, he may have received a lot of land and become enrolled among the Salaminian demots. The dispersion of his ashes connecting him with the island as its oasis may be construed, if not as an expression of a public vote, at least as a piece of affectionate vanity on the part of his surviving friends. End of section 26 Section 27 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Conquests of Cyrus the Great, B.C. 538, by George Grote, Part 1. On the destruction of Nineveh, three great powers still stood on the stage of history, being bound together by the strong ties of a mutually supporting alliance. These were Media, Lydia, and Babylon. The capital of Lydia was Sardis, According to Herodotus, the first king of Lydia was Manus. In the semi-mythic period of Lydian history rose the great dynasty of the Greek Heraclidae, which reigned for 505 years, numbering 22 kings, B.C. 1229 to B.C. 745. The Lydians are said by Herodotus to have colonized Tyrrhenia, in the Italic peninsula, and to have extended their conquests into Syria, where they founded Ascalon in the territory later known as Palestine. In the reign of Gyges, B.C. 724, they began to attack the Greek cities of Asia Minor, Miletus, Smyrna, and Priene. The glory of the Lydian Empire culminated in the reign of Greek Croesus, the fifth and last historic king, B.C. 568. The well-known story of Salon's warning to Greek Croesus was full of ominous import with regard to the ultimate downfall of the Lydian Empire. For thyself, O Croesus, said the Greek sage in answer to the question, who is the happiest man, I see that thou art wonderfully rich, and art the lord of many nations. But in respect to that whereon thou questionest me, I have no answer to give, until I hear that thou hast closed thy life happily. The Median Empire occupied a territory indefinitely extending over a region south of the Caspian, between the Kurdish mountains and the modern Khorasan. The Median monarchy, according to Herodotus, commenced B.C. 708. The Medes, which were racially akin to the Persians, had been for fifty years subject to the Assyrian monarchy when they revolted, setting up an independent empire. Putting aside the dates given by the Greek historians, we shall perhaps be correct in considering that the great Median kingdom was established by Cyaxares, B.C. 633, and that in B.C. 610 a great struggle of six years between Media and Lydia was amicably ended under the terror occasioned by an eclipse by the establishment of a treaty and alliance between the contending powers. With the death of Cyaxares, B.C. 597, the glory of the great Median Empire passed away, for under his son, Astyages, the country was conquered by Cyrus. The rise of the Babylonian Empire seems to have originated B.C. 2234, when the Cushite inhabitants of southern Babylonia 
raised a native dynasty to the throne liberated themselves from the yoke of the zoroastrian medes and instituted an empire with several large capitals where they built mighty temples and introduced the worship of the heavenly bodies in contradistinction to the elemental worship of the magian medes the record of babylonian kings is full of obscurity even in the light of recent archaeological discoveries we can trace however a gradual expansion of babylonian dominion even to the borders of egypt nabo pilaser b c six twenty five to b c six o four was a great warrior and at karshemest defeated even the almost invincible egyptians b c six o four his successor nebuchadnezzar b c six o four immediately set about the fortification of his capital a space of more than one hundred thirty square miles was enclosed within walls eighty feet in breadth and three hundred or four hundred in height if we may believe the record meanwhile with the assistance of cyaxares king of media he captured tyre in phoenicia and jerusalem in syria but fifteen years after croesus had been taken prisoner and the persian empire extended to the shores of the aegean the empire of babylon fell before the conquering armies of cyrus the persian the ionic and aeolic greeks on the asiatic coast had been conquered and made tributary by the lydian king croesus down to that time says herodotus all greeks had been free their conqueror croesus who ascended the throne in five hundred sixty b c appeared to be at the summit of human prosperity and power in his unassailable capital and with his countless treasures at sardis his dominions comprised nearly the whole of asia minor as far as the river hollis to the east on the other side of that river began the median monarchy under his brother-in-law astyages extending eastward to some boundary which we cannot define but comprising in a southeastern direction persis proper or pharsistan and separated from the kissians and assyrians on the east by the line of mount zagros the present boundary line between persia and turkey babylonia with its wondrous city between the euphrates and the tigris was occupied by the assyrians or chaldeans under their king labanetus a territory populous and fertile partly by nature partly by prodigies of labor to a degree which makes us mistrust even an honest eye-witness who describes it afterward in its decline but which was then in its most flourishing condition the chaldean dominion under labidinus reached to the borders of egypt including as dependent territories both judea and phoenicia in egypt reigned the native king amasis powerful and affluent sustained in his throne by a large body of grecian mercenaries and himself favorably disposed to grecian commerce and settlement both with labinitus and with amasis croesus was on terms of alliance and as astyages was his brother-in-law the four kings might well be deemed out of the reach of calamity yet within the space of thirty years or a little more the whole of their territories had become embodied in one vast empire under the sun of an adventurer as yet not known even by name the rise and fall of oriental dynasties have been in all times distinguished by the same general features a brave and adventurous prince at the head of a population at once poor warlike and greedy acquires dominion while his successors abandoning themselves to sensuality and sloth probably also to oppressive and irascible dispositions become in process of time victims to those same qualities in a stranger which had enabled their own father to seize the throne cyrus the great founder of the persian empire first the subject and afterward the dethroner of the median 
Astyages corresponds to their general description, as far, at least, as we can pretend to know his history. For in truth even the conquests of Cyrus, after he became ruler of Media, are very imperfectly known, while the facts which preceded his rise up to that sovereignty cannot be said to be known at all. We have to choose between different accounts at variance with each other, and of which the most complete and detailed is stamped with all the character of romance. The Cyropedia of Xenophon is memorable and interesting, considered with reference to the Greek mind, and as a philosophical novel. That it should have been quoted so largely as authority on matters of history is only one proof among many how easily authors have been satisfied as to the essentials of historical evidence. The narrative given by Herodotus of relations between Cyrus and Astyages agreeing with Xenophon in little more than the fact that it makes Cyrus son of Cambyses and Mandane and grandson of Astyages, goes even beyond the story of Romulus and Remus in respect to tragical incident and contrast. Astyages, alarmed by a dream, condemns the newborn infant of his daughter Mandane to be exposed. Harpagus, to whom the order is given, delivers the child to one of the royal herdsmen, who exposes it in the mountains, where it is miraculously suckled by a bitch. Thus preserved, and afterward brought up as the herdman's child, Cyrus manifests great superiority, both physical and mental, is chosen king, in play by the boys of the village, and in this capacity severely chastises the son of one of the courtiers, for which offence he is carried before Astyages, who recognizes him for his grandson, but is assured by the Magi that the dream is out, and that he has no further danger to apprehend from the boy, and therefore permits him to live. With Harpagus, however, Astyages is extremely incensed for not having executed his orders. He causes the son of Harpagus to be slain, and served up to be eaten by his unconscious father at a regal banquet. The father, apprised afterward of the fact, dissembles his feelings, but meditates a deadly vengeance against Astyages for this Thyestean meal. He persuades Cyrus, who has been sent back to his father and mother in Persia, to head a revolt of the Persians against the Medes whilst Astyages, to fill up the Grecian conception of madness as a precursor to ruin, sends an army against the revolters commanded by Harpagus himself. Of course the army is defeated. Astyages, after a vain resistance, is dethroned. Cyrus becomes king in his place, and Harpagus repays the outrage which he has undergone by the bitterest insults such are the heads of a beautiful narrative which is given at some length in herodotus it will probably appear to the reader sufficiently romantic though the historian intimates that he had heard three other narratives different from it and that all were more full of marvels as well as in wider circulation than his own which he had borrowed from some unusually sober-minded persian informants in what points the other three stories departed from it we do not hear to the historian of holicarnassus we have to oppose tessius the physician of the neighboring town of nidus who contradicted herodotus not without strong terms of censure on many points and especially upon that which is the very foundation of the early narrative respecting Cyrus, for he affirmed that Cyrus was no way related to Astyages. However indignant we may be with Theseus for the disparaging epithets which he presumed to apply to an historian, whose work is to us inestimable, we must nevertheless admit that, as surgeon in actual attendance on King Artaxerxes, Naaman, and healer of the wound inflicted on that prince at Kunaxa 
by his brother cyrus the younger he had better opportunities even than herodotus of conversing with sober-minded persians and that the discrepancies between the two statements are to be taken as a proof of the prevalence of discordant yet equally accredited stories herodotus himself was in fact compelled to choose one out of four so rare and late a plant is historical authenticity that cyrus was the first persian conqueror and that the space which he overran covered no less than fifty degrees of longitude from the coast of asia minor to the oxus and the indus are facts quite indisputable but of the steps by which this was achieved we know very little the native persians whom he conducted to an empire so immense were an aggregate of seven agricultural and four nomadic tribes all of them rude hardy and brave dwelling in a mountainous region clothed in skins ignorant of wine or fruit or any of the commonest luxuries of life and despising the very idea of purchase or sale their tribes were very unequal in point of dignity probably also in respect to numbers and powers among one another first in estimation among them stood the pasargadae and the first fratri or clan among the pasargadae were the achaemenidae to whom cyrus himself belonged whether his relationship to the median king whom he dethroned was a matter of fact or a political fiction we cannot well determine but xenophon in noticing the spacious deserted cities larissa and mespila which he saw in his march with the ten thousand greeks on the eastern side of the tigris gives us to understand that the conquest of media by the persians was reported to him as having been an obstinate and protracted struggle however this may be the preponderance of the persians was at last complete though the medes always continued to be the second nation in the empire after the persians properly so called and by early greek writers the great enemy in the east is often called the mede as well as the persian the median egbatana too remained as one of the capital cities and the usual summer residence of the kings of persia susa on the coaspis on the kissian plain farther southward and east of the tigris being their winter abode the vast space of country comprised between the indus on the east the oxus and caspian sea to the north the persian gulf and indian ocean to the south and the line of mount zagros to the west appears to have been occupied in these times by a great variety of different tribes and people yet all or most of them belonging to the religion of zoroaster and speaking dialects of the zend language it was known amongst its inhabitants by the common name of iran or aria it is in its central parts at least a high cold plateau totally destitute of wood and scantily supplied with water much of it indeed is a salt and sandy desert unsusceptible of culture parts of it are eminently fertile where water can be procured and irrigation applied scattered masses of tolerably dense population thus grew up but continuity of cultivation is not practicable and in ancient times as at present a large proportion of the population of iran seems to have consisted of wandering or nomadic tribes with their tents and cattle the rich pastures and the freshness of the summer climate in the region of mountain and valley near ecbatana are extolled by modern travellers just as they attracted the great king in ancient times during the hot months the more southerly province called persis proper faristan consists also in part of mountain land interspersed with valley and plain abundantly watered and ample in pasture sloping gradually down to low grounds on the sea-coast which are hot and dry the care bestowed both by medes and persians on the breeding of their horses was remarkable 
there were doubtless material differences between different parts of the population of this vast plateau of iran yet it seems that along with their common language and religion they also had something of a common character which contrasted with the indian population east of the indus the assyrians west of mount zagros and the Masagete and other nomads of the caspian and the sea of aral less brutish restless and bloodthirsty than the latter more fierce contemptuous and extortionate and less capable of sustained industry than the two former there can be little doubt at the time of which we are now speaking when the wealth and cultivation of assyria were at their maximum that iran also was far better peopled than ever it has been since european observers have been able to survey it especially the northeastern portion bactria and sogdiana so that the invasions of the nomads from turkestan and tartary which have been so destructive at various intervals since the mohammedan conquest were before that period successfully kept back the general analogy among the population of iran probably enabled the persian conqueror with comparative ease to extend his empire to the east after the conquest of ecbatana and to become the full heir of the median kings if we may believe tesius even the distant province of bactria had been before subject to those kings at first it resisted cyrus but finding that he had become son-in-law of ostiagus as well as master of his person it speedily acknowledged his authority according to the representation of herodotus the war between cyrus and croesus of lydia began shortly after the capture of ostiagus and before the conquest of bactria croesus was the assailant wishing to avenge his brother-in-law to arrest the growth of the persian conqueror and to increase his own dominions his more prudent counsellors in vain represented to him that he had little to gain and much to lose by war with a nation alike hardy and poor he is represented as just at that time recovering from the affliction arising out of the death of his son to ask advice of the oracle before he took any final decision was a step which no pious king would omit but in the present perilous question croesus did more he took a precaution so extreme that if his piety had not been placed beyond all doubt by his extraordinary munificence to the temples he might have drawn upon himself the suspicion of a guilty scepticism before he would send to ask advice respecting the project itself he resolved to test the credit of some of the chief surrounding oracles delphi dodona branchidae near miletus amphiaris at thebes trophonius at labadiae and amen in libya his envoys started from sardis on the same day and were all directed on the hundredth day afterward to ask at the respective oracles how croesus was at that precise moment employed this was a severe trial of the manner in which it was met by four out of the six oracles consulted we have no information and it rather appears that their answers were unsatisfactory but amphiaris maintained his credit undiminished while apollo at delphi more omniscient than apollo at bronchidae solved the question with such unerring precision as to afford a strong additional argument against persons who might be disposed to scoff at divination no sooner had the envoys put the question to the delphian priestess on the day named what is croesus now doing than she exclaimed in the accustomed hexameter verse i know the number of grains of sand and the measures of the sea i understand the dumb and i hear the man who speaks not the smell reaches me of a hard-skinned tortoise boiled in a copper with lamb's flesh copper above and copper below 
croesus was awestruck on receiving this reply it described with the utmost detail that which he had been really doing so that he accounted the delphian oracle and that of amphiaris the only trustworthy oracles on earth following up these feelings with a holocaust of the most munificent character in order to win the favor of the delphian god three thousand cattle were offered up and upon a vast sacrificial pile were placed the most splendid purple robes and tunics together with couches and censers of gold and silver besides which he sent to delphi itself the richest presents in gold and silver statues bowls jugs etc the size and weight of which we read with astonishment the more so as herodotus himself saw them a century afterwards at delphi nor was croesus altogether unmindful of amphiaris whose answer had been creditable although less triumphant than that of the pythian priestess he sent to amphiaris a spear and shield of pure gold which were afterwards seen at thebes by herodotus this large donative may help the reader to conceive the immensity of those which he sent to delphi end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of the great events volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the great events by famous historians volume one edited by charles f horn rossiter johnson and john rudd the conquests of cyrus the great b c five thirty eight by george groat part two the envoys who conveyed these gifts were instructed to ask at the same time whether croesus should undertake an expedition against the persians and if so whether he should solicit any allies to assist him in regard to the second question the answer both of apollo and of amphiaris was desse sive recommending him to invite the alliance of the most powerful greeks in regard to the first and most momentous question their answer was as remarkable for circumspection as it had been before for detective sagacity they told croesus that if he invaded the persians he would subvert a mighty monarchy the blindness of croesus interpreted this declaration into an unqualified promise of success he sent further presents to the oracle and again inquired whether his kingdom would be durable when a mule shall become king of the medes replied the priestess then must thou run away be not ashamed more assured than ever by such an answer croesus sent to sparta under the kings anaxandridas and aristo to tender presents and solicit their alliance his propositions were favorably entertained the more so as he had before gratuitously furnished some gold to the lacedaemonians for a statue to apollo the alliance now formed was altogether general no express effort being as yet demanded from them though it soon came to be but the incident is to be noted as marking the first plunge of the leading grecian state into asiatic politics and that too without any of the generous hellenic sympathy which afterward induced athens to send her citizens across the aegean at this time croesus was the master and tribute exactor of the asiatic greeks whose contingents seemed to have formed part of his army for the expedition now contemplated an army consisting principally not of native lydians but of foreigners the river halus formed the boundary at this time between the median and lydian empires and croesus 
marching across that river into the territory of the Syrians, or Assyrians, of Cappadocia, took the city of Teria, with many of its surrounding dependencies, inflicting damage and destruction upon these distant subjects of Ecbatana. Cyrus lost no time in bringing an army to their defense, considerably larger than that of Croesus, trying at the same time, though unsuccessfully, to prevail on the Ionians to revolt from him. A bloody battle took place between the two armies, but with indecisive result, after which Croesus, seeing that he could not hope to accomplish more with his forces as they stood, thought it wise to return to his capital and collect a larger army for the next campaign. Immediately on reaching Sardis, he dispatched envoys to Labinitus, king of Babylon, to Amasis, king of Egypt, to the Lacedaemonians, and to other allies, calling upon all of them to send auxiliaries to Sardis during the course of the fifth month. In the meantime, he dismissed all the foreign troops who had followed him into Cappadocia. Had these allies appeared, the war might perhaps have been prosecuted with success, and on the part of the Lacedaemonians, at least, there was no tardiness, for their ships were ready and their troops almost on board when the unexpected news reached them that Croesus was already ruined. Cyrus had foreseen and forestalled the defensive plan of his enemy. Pushing on with his army to Sardis without delay, he obliged the Lydian prince to give battle with his own unassisted subjects. The open and spacious plain before that town was highly favorable to Lydian cavalry, which at that time, Herodotus tells us, was superior to the Persian. But Cyrus, employing a stratagem whereby this cavalry was rendered unavailable, placed in front of his line the baggage camels, which the Lydian horses could not endure either to smell or to behold. The horsemen of Croesus were thus obliged to dismount. Nevertheless, they fought bravely on foot and were not driven into the town till after a sanguinary combat though confined within the walls of his capital croesus still had good reason for hoping to hold out until the arrival of his allies to whom he sent pressing envoys of acceleration for sardis was considered impregnable and one assault had already been repulsed and the persians would have been reduced to the slow process of blockade but on the fourteenth day of the siege accident did for the besiegers that which they could not have accomplished either by skill or force sardis was situated on an outlying peak of the northern side of molus it was well fortified everywhere except toward the mountain and on that side the rock was so precipitous and inaccessible that fortifications were thought unnecessary nor did the inhabitants believe assault to be possible in that quarter but hyroiades a persian soldier having accidentally seen one of the garrison descending this precipitous rock to pick up his helmet which had rolled down watched his opportunity tried to climb up and found it not impracticable others followed his example the stronghold was thus seized first and the whole city speedily taken by storm. Cyrus had given a special orders to spare the life of Croesus, who was accordingly made prisoner, but preparations were made for a solemn and terrible spectacle. The captive king was destined to be burned in chains, together with fourteen Lydian youths, on a vast pile of wood. We are even told that the pile was already kindled and the victim beyond the reach of human aid when Apollo sent a miraculous rain to preserve him. As to the general fact of supernatural interposition in one way or another, Herodotus and Theseus both agree 
though they described differently the particular miracles wrought it is certain that croesus after some time was released and well treated by his conqueror and lived to become the confidential adviser of the latter as well as of his son cambyses Tisius also acquaints us that a considerable town and territory near ecbatana called barine was assigned to him according to a practice which we shall find not infrequent with the persian kings the prudent counsel and remarks as to the relations between persians and lydians whereby croesus is said by herodotus to have first earned this favourable treatment are hardly worth repeating but the indignant remonstrance sent by croesus to the delphian god is too characteristic to be passed over he obtained permission from cyrus to lay upon the holy pavement of the delphian temple the chains with which he had at first been bound the lydian envoys were instructed after exhibiting to the god these humiliating memorials to ask whether it was his custom to deceive his benefactors and whether he was not ashamed to have encouraged the king of lydia in an enterprise so disastrous the god condescending to justify himself by the lips of the priestess replied not even a god can escape his destiny croesus has suffered for the sin of his fifth ancestor gyges who conspiring with a woman slew his master and wrongfully seized the sceptre apollo employed all his influence with the more fates to obtain that this sin might be expiated by the children of croesus and not by croesus himself but the more would grant nothing more than a postponement of the judgment for three years let croesus know that apollo has thus procured for him a reign three years longer than his original destiny after having tried in vain to rescue him altogether moreover he sent that rain which at the critical moment extinguished the burning pile nor has croesus any right to complain of the prophecy by which he was encouraged to enter on the war for when the god told him that he would subvert a great empire it was his duty to have again inquired which empire the god meant and if he neither understood the meaning nor chose to ask for information he was himself to blame for the result besides croesus neglected the warning given to him about the acquisition of the median kingdom by a mule cyrus was that mule son of a median mother of royal breed by a persian father at once of different race and of lower position this triumphant justification extorted even from croesus himself a full confession that the sin lay with him and not with the god it certainly illustrates in a remarkable manner the theological ideas of the time it shows us how much in the mind of herodotus the facts of the centuries preceding his own unrecorded as they were by any contemporary authority tended to cast themselves into a sort of religious drama the threads of the historical web being in part put together in part originally spun for the purpose of setting forth the religious sentiment and doctrine woven in as a pattern the pythian priestess predicts to gyges that the crime which he had committed in assassinating his master would be expiated by his fifth descendant though as herodotus tells us no one took any notice of this prophecy until it was at last fulfilled we see thus the history of the first mermnad king is made up after the catastrophe of the last there was something in the main facts of the history of croesus profoundly striking to the greek mind a king at the summit of wealth and power pious in the extreme and munificent towards the gods the first destroyer of hellenic liberty in asia then precipitated at once and on a sudden into the abyss of ruin the sin of the first parent helped much toward the solution 
of this perplexing problem as well as to exalt the credit of the oracle when made to assume the shape of an unnoticed prophecy in the affecting story of solon and croesus the lydian king is punished with an acute domestic affliction because he thought himself the happiest of mankind the gods not suffering any one to be arrogant except themselves and the warning of solon is made to recur to croesus after he has become the prisoner of cyrus in the narrative of herodotus to the same vein of thought belongs the story just recounted of the relations of croesus with the delphian oracle an account is provided satisfactory to the religious feelings of the greeks how and why he was ruined but nothing less than the overruling and omnipotent moray could be invoked to explain so stupendous a result it is rarely that these supreme goddesses or hyper goddesses since the gods themselves must submit to them are brought into such distinct light and action usually they are kept in the dark or are left to be understood as the unseen stumbling-block in cases of extreme incomprehensibility and it is difficult clearly to determine as in the case of some complicated political constitutions where the greeks conceived sovereign power to reside in respect to the government of the world but here the sovereignty of the more and the subordinate agency of the gods are unequivocally set forth the gods are still extremely powerful because the more comply with their requests up to a certain point not thinking it proper to be wholly inexorable but their compliance is carried no farther than they themselves choose nor would they even in deference to apollo alter the original sentence of punishment for the sin of gyges in the person of his fifth descendant sentence moreover which apollo himself had formerly prophesied shortly after the sin was committed so that if the more had listened to his intercession on behalf of croesus his own prophetic credit would have been endangered their unalterable resolution has predetermined the ruin of croesus and the grandeur of the event is manifested by the circumstance that even apollo himself cannot prevail upon them to alter it or to grant more than a three years respite the religious element must here be viewed as giving the form the historical element as giving the matter only and not the whole matter of the story these two elements will be found conjoined more or less throughout most of the history of herodotus though as we descend to later times we shall find the latter element in constantly increasing proportion his conception of history is extremely different from that of thucydides who lays down to himself the true scheme and purpose of the historian common to him with the philosopher to recount and interpret the past as a rational aid toward prevision of the future in the short abstract which we now possess of the lost work of Theseus, no mention appears of the important conquest of babylon his narrative indeed as far as the abstract enables us to follow it diverges materially from that of herodotus and must have been founded on data altogether different i shall mention says herodotus these conquests which gave cyrus most trouble and are most memorable after he had subdued all the rest of the continent he attacked the assyrians those who recollect the description of babylon and its surrounding territory will not be surprised to learn that the capture of it gave the persian aggressor much trouble their only surprise will be how it could ever have been taken at all or indeed how a hostile army could have even reached it herodotus informs us that the babylonian queen nicotris mother of that very labinitus who was king when cyrus attacked the place apprehensive of invasion from the medes after their capture of nineveh 
had executed many laborious works near the euphrates for the purpose of obstructing their approach moreover there existed what was called the wall of media probably built by her but certainly built prior to the persian conquest one hundred feet high and twenty feet thick across the entire space of seventy-five miles which joined the tigris with one of the canals of the euphrates while the canals themselves as we may see by the march of the ten thousand greeks after the battle of kunaxa presented means of defence altogether insuperable by a rude army such as that of the persians on the east the territory of babylonia was defended by the tigris which cannot be forded lower than the ancient nineveh or the modern mosul in addition to these ramparts natural as well as artificial to protect the territory populous cultivated productive and offering every motive to its inhabitants to resist even the entrance of an enemy we are told that the babylonians were so thoroughly prepared for the inroad of cyrus that they had accumulated within their walls a store of provisions for many years strange as it may seem we must suppose that the king of babylon after all the cost and labor spent in providing defences for the territory voluntarily neglected to avail himself of them suffered the invader to tread down the fertile babylonia without resistance and merely drew out the citizens to oppose him when he arrived under the walls of the city if the statement of herodotus is correct and we may illustrate this unaccountable omission by that which we know to have happened in the march of the younger cyrus to canuxa against his brother artaxerxes Nemon. the latter had caused to be dug expressly in preparation for this invasion a broad and deep ditch thirty feet wide and eight feet deep from the wall of media to the river euphrates a distance of twelve parasangs or forty-five english miles leaving only a passage of twenty feet broad close alongside of the river yet when the invading army arrived at this important pass they found not a man there to defend it and all of them marched without resistance through the narrow inlet cyrus the younger who had up to that moment felt assured that his brother would fight now supposed that he had given up the idea of defending babylon instead of which two days afterward artaxerxes attacked him on an open plain of ground where there was no advantage of position on either side though the invaders were taken rather unawares in consequence of their extreme confidence arising from recent unopposed entrance within the artificial ditch this anecdote is the more valuable as an illustration because all its circumstances are transmitted to us by a discerning eye-witness and both the two incidents here brought into comparison demonstrate the recklessness changefulness and incapacity of calculation belonging to the asiatic mind of that day as well as the great command of hands possessed by these kings and their prodigal waste of human labor vast walls and deep ditches are an inestimable aid to a brave and well-commanded garrison but they cannot be made entirely to supply the want of bravery and intelligence in whatever manner the difficulties of approaching babylon may have been overcome the fact that they were overcome by cyrus is certain on first setting out for this conquest he was about to cross the river gindus one of the affluents from the east which joins the tigris near the modern baghdad and along which lay the high road crossing the pass of mount zagros from babylon to ecbatana when one of the sacred white horses which accompanied him entered the river in pure wantonness and tried to cross it by himself the gindus resented this insult and the horse was drowned upon which cyrus swore in his wrath that he would so break the strength of the river 
as that women in future should pass it without wetting their knees accordingly he employed his entire army during the whole summer season in digging three hundred and sixty artificial channels to disseminate the unit of the stream such according to herodotus was the incident which postponed for one year the fall of the great babylon but in the next spring cyrus and his army were before the walls after having defeated and driven in the population who came out to fight these walls were artificial mountains three hundred feet high seventy-five feet thick and forming a square of fifteen miles to each side within which the besieged defied attack and even blockade having previously stored up several years provision through the mists of the town however flowed the euphrates that river which had been so laboriously trained to serve for protection trade and sustenance to the babylonians was now made the avenue of their ruin having left a detachment of his army at the two points where the euphrates enters and quits the city cyrus retired with the remainder to the higher part of its course where an ancient babylonian queen had prepared one of the great lateral reservoirs for carrying off in case of need the superfluity of its water near this point cyrus caused another reservoir and another canal of communication to be dug by means of which he drew off the water of the euphrates to such a degree it became not the height of a man's thigh the period chosen was that of a great babylonian festival when the whole population were engaged in amusement and revelry the persian troops left near the town watching their opportunity entered from both sides along the bed of the river and took it by surprise with scarcely any resistance at no other time except during a festival could they have done this says herodotus had the river been ever so low for both banks throughout the whole length of the town were provided with quays with continuous walls and with gates at the end of every street which led down to the river at right angles so that if the population had not been disqualified by the influences of the moment they would have caught the assailants in the bed of the river as in a trap and overwhelmed them from the walls alongside within a square of fifteen miles to each side we are not surprised to hear that both the extremities were already in the power of the besiegers before the central population heard of it and while they were yet absorbed in unconscious festivity such is the account given by herodotus of the circumstances which placed babylon the greatest city of western asia in the power of the persians to what extent the information communicated to him was incorrect or exaggerated we cannot now decide the way in which the city was treated would lead us to suppose that its acquisition cannot have cost the conqueror either much time or much loss cyrus comes into the list as king of babylon and the inhabitants with their whole territory become tributary to the persians forming the richest satrapy in the empire but we do not hear that the people were otherwise ill-used and it is certain that the vast walls and gates were left untouched this was very different from the way in which the medes had treated nineveh which seems to have been ruined and for a long time absolutely uninhabited though reoccupied on a reduced scale under the parthian empire and very different also from the way in which babylon itself was treated twenty years afterward by darius when reconquered after a revolt the importance of babylon marking as it does one of the peculiar forms of civilization belonging to the ancient world in a state of full development gives an interest even to the half authenticated stories respecting its capture the other exploits ascribed to cyrus his invasion of india across the desert of aracosia and his attack upon the massagetae nomads ruled by queen tomaris 
and greatly resembling the Scythians, across the mysterious river which Herodotus calls Araxes, are too little known to be at all dwelt upon. In the latter he is said to have perished, his army being defeated in a bloody battle. He was buried at Pasargete, in his native province of Persis proper, where his tomb was honoured and watched, until the breaking up of the empire, while his memory was held in profound veneration among the Persians. Of his real exploits we know little or nothing, but in what we read respecting him there seems, though amid constant fighting, very little cruelty. Xenophon has selected his life as the subject of a moral romance which for a long time was cited as authentic history, and which even now serves as an authority, express or implied, for disputable and even incorrect conclusions. His extraordinary activity and conquests admit of no doubt. He left the Persian Empire extending from Sogdiana and the rivers Jaxartes and Indus eastward to the Hellespont and the Syrian coast westward, and his successors made no permanent addition to it except that of Egypt. Phoenicia and Judea were dependencies of Babylon at the time when he conquered it with their princes and grandees in Babylonian captivity, as they seem to have yielded to him and become his tributaries without difficulty. So the restoration of their captives was conceded to them. It was from Cyrus that the habits of the Persian kings took commencement, to dwell at Susa in the winter and Ecbatana during the summer. The primitive territory of Persis, with its two towns of Persepolis and Pasargade, being reserved for the burial place of the kings and the religious sanctuary of the empire. How or when the conquest of Susiana was made, we are not informed. It lay eastward of the Tigris, between Babylonia and Persis proper, and its people, the Kissians, as far as we can discern, were of Assyrian and not of Aryan race. The river Choaspis, near Susa, was supposed to furnish the only water fit for the palate of the great king, and it is said to have been carried about with him wherever he went. While the conquests of Cyrus contributed to assimilate the distant types of civilization in Western Asia, not by elevating the worse, but by degrading the better, upon the native Persians themselves they operated as an extraordinary stimulus, provoking alike their pride, ambition, cupidity, and warlike propensities. Not only did the territory of Persis proper pay no tribute to Susa or Ecbatana, being the only district so exempted between the Jexardus and the Mediterranean, but the vast tributes received from the remaining empire were distributed to a great degree among its inhabitants. Empire to them meant, for the great men, lucrative satrapies or pachalics with powers altogether unlimited, pomp inferior only to that of the great king, and standing armies which they employed at their own discretion, sometimes against each other, for the common soldiers, drawn from their fields or flocks, constant plunder, abundant maintenance, and an unrestrained license, either in the suit of one of the satraps, or in the large permanent troops, which moved from Susa to Ecbatana with the great king. And if the entire population of Persis proper did not migrate from their abodes to occupy some of those more inviting spots which the immensity of the imperial dominion furnished, a dominion extending, to use the language of Cyrus the Younger, before the battle of Kunaxa, from the region of insupportable heat to that of insupportable cold. This was only because the early kings discouraged such a movement in order that the nation might maintain its military hardihood and be in a situation to furnish undiminished supplies of soldiers. The self-esteem and arrogance of the Persians were no less remarkable than their avidity for sensual enjoyment. They were fond of wine to excess, 
their wives and their concubines were both numerous and they adopted eagerly from foreign nations new fashions of luxury as well as of ornament even to novelties in religion they were not strongly averse for though disciples of zoroaster with magi as their priests and as indispensable companions of their sacrifices worshipping sun moon earth fire etc and recognizing neither image temple nor altar yet they had adopted the voluptuous worship of the goddess melita from the assyrians and arabians a numerous male offspring was the persian's boast his warlike character and consciousness of force were displayed in the education of these youths who were taught from five years old to twenty only three things to ride to shoot with the bow and to speak the truth to owe money or even to buy and sell was accounted among the persians disgraceful a sentiment which they defended by saying that both the one and the other imposed the necessity of telling falsehood to exact tribute from subjects to receive pay or presents from the king and to give away without forethought whatever was not immediately wanted was their mode of dealing with money industrial pursuits were left to the conquered who were fortunate if by paying a fixed contribution and sending a military contingent when required they could purchase undisturbed immunity for their remaining concerns they could not thus purchase safety for the family hearth since we find instances of noble grecian maidens torn from their parents for the harem of the satrap to a people of this character whose conceptions of political society went no further than personal obedience to a chief a conqueror like cyrus would communicate the strongest excitement and enthusiasm of which they were capable he had found them slaves and made them masters he was the first and greatest of national benefactors as well as the most forward of leaders in the field they followed him from one conquest to another during the thirty years of his reign their love of empire growing with the empire itself and this impulse of aggrandizement continued unabated during the reigns of his three next successors cambyses darius and xerxes until it was at length violently stifled by the humiliating defeats of platea and salamis after which the persians became content with defending themselves at home and playing a secondary game end of section twenty eight Section 29 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosita Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 29. Rise of Confucius. The Chinese Sage, B.C. 550, R.K. Douglas. Confucius is the Latinized name of Kung Fu Zi, or Master Kung, whose work in China did much to educate the people in social and civic virtues. He began as a political reformer at a time when the empire was cut up into a number of petty and discontent principalities. As a practical statesman and administrator, he urged the necessity of reform upon the princes, whom one after another he served. His advice was invariably disregarded, and, as he said, no intelligent ruler arose in his time. His great maxims of submission to the emperor or supreme head of the state he based on the analogous duty of filial obedience in the household and his very spirit of piety prevented him from taking independent measures for redressing the evils and oppressions of his distracted country. His moral teaching are not based on any specific religious foundation, but they have become the settled code of Chinese life, of which submissiveness to authority, industry, frugality, 
and fair dealing as prescribed by Confucian's ethics are general characteristics. The political doctrines of this great reformer were eventually adopted, and his teaching and example brought about peaceful and gradual but complete revolution in the Chinese Empire, whose consolidation into a simple kingdom was the practical result of this sage's influence. At the time of which we write, the Chinese were still clinging to the banks of the Yellow River, along which they had first entered the country, and formed within the limits of China proper a few states on either shore lying between the 33rd and the 38th parallels of latitude, and the 106th and the 119th of longitude. The royal state of Chao occupied part of the modern province of Honan. To the south of this was the powerful state of Qin, embracing the northern province of Xiangzi and part of Zhili. To the south was the barbarous state of Chu, which stretched as far as the Yangtze Kiang to the east, reaching to the coast, where a number of smaller states, among which those of Chai, Lu, Wei, Song, and Qing, were the chief, and to the west of the Yellow River was the state of Qin, which was destined eventually to gain the mastery over the contending principalities. On the establishment of the Chao dynasty, King Wu had apportioned these fifth ships among members of his family, his adherents, and the descendants of some of the ancient virtuous kings. Each prince was empowered to administer his government as he pleased, so long as he followed the general lines indicated by history. And in the event of any act of aggression on the part of one state against another, the matter was to be reported to the king of the sovereign state, who was bound to punish the offender. It is plain that in such a system, the elements of disorder must lie near the surface, and no sooner was the authority of the central state lessened by the want of ability shown by the successors of King Wu, Qin and Ken. Then constant strife broke out between the several chiefs. The hand of every man was against his neighbor, and the smaller state suffered the usual fate, under like circumstances of being encroached upon and absorbed, notwithstanding their appeals for help to their common sovereign. The house of Chao having been thus found wanting, the device was resorted to of appointing one of the most powerful princes as a presiding chief, who should exercise royal functions, leaving the king only the title and paraphernalia of sovereignty. In fact, the China of this period was governed and administered very much as Japan was up to about 20 years ago. For Mikado, Shogun, and ruling daimyo's Red King, presiding chief and princess, and the parallel is as nearly as possible complete. The result of the system, however, in the two countries was different. For apart from the support received by the Mikado from the belief in his heavenly origin, the insular positions of Japan prevented the possibility of the advent of elements of disorder from without, whereas the principalities of China were surrounded by semi-barbarous states, the chiefs of which were engaged in constant warfare with them. Confucius' deep spirit of loyalty to the house of Chao forbade his following in the book of history, the careers of the Shofrens who reigned between the death of Mu in BC 946 and the accession of Ping in 770. One after another these kings rose, reigned and died, leaving each to his successor an ever-increasing heritage of war. During the reign of Xun, 827-781, a gleam of light seems to have shot through the prevailing darkness. Though falling far short of the excellencies of the founders of the dynasty, he yet strove to follow, though at a long interval, the examples they had set him. And according to the Chinese belief, as an acknowledgement from heaven of his efforts in the direction of virtue, it was given him to sit upon the throne for nearly half a century. His successor, Yu, the Duck, appears to even less advantage. No redeeming acts relieved the general disorder of his reign, and at the instigation of a favorite concubine, 
he is said to have committed acts which place him on a level with Qi and Shao. Earthquakes, storms, and astrological portents appeared as in the dark days at the close of the He and Shan dynasties. His capital was surrounded by the barbarian allies of the prince of Xin, the father of his wife, whom he had dismissed at the request of his favorite, and in an attempt to escape he fell a victim to their weapons. With this event, the Western Chao dynasty was brought to a close. Here also the book of history comes to an end, and the spring and autumn annals by Confucius takes up the tale of iniquity and disorder which overspread the land. No more dreadful record of a nation's struggle can be imagined than that contained in Confucius' history. The country was torn by discord and desolated by wars. Husbandry was neglected. The peace of households was destroyed, and plunder and rapine were the watchwords of the time. Such was the state of China at the time of the birth of Confucius, B.C. 551. Of the parents of the sage we know but little, except that his father, Xu Langhe, was a military officer, eminent for his commanding stature, his great bravery and immense strength, and that his mother's name was Yan Jing Chai. The marriage of these couples took place when He was 70 years old, and the prospect, therefore, of his having and the hair having been but slight. Unusual rejoicings commemorated the birth of a son, who was destined to achieve such everlasting fame. Report says that the child was born in a cave on Mang Ne, whither Jin Chai went in obedience to a vision to be confined. But this is but one of the many legends with which Chinese historians love to surround the birth of Confucius. With the same desire to glorify the sage, and in perfect good faith, they narrate how the event was heralded by strange portents and miraculous appearances. How Jinni announced to Ching Chai the honor that was in store for her, and how fairies attended at his nativity. Of the early years of Confucius, we have but scanty record. It would seem that from his childhood he showed ritualistic tendencies, and we are told that as a boy he delighted to play at the arrangement of vessels and postures of ceremony. As he advanced in years, he became an earnest student of history and looked back with love and reverence to the time when the great and good Yu and Shen reigned in, a golden age, fruitful of golden deeds. At the age of 15, he bent his mind to learning, and when he was 19 years old, he married a lady from the stage of Song. It has befallen many other great men. Confucius' married life was not a happy one, and he finally divorced his wife, not, however, before she had borne him a son. Soon after his marriage, at the instigation of poverty, Confucius accepted the offer of keeper of the stores of grain, and in the following year he was promoted to be guardian of the public fields and lands. It was while holding this later office that his son was born, and so well known and highly esteemed had he already become that the reigning duke, on hearing of the event, sent him a present of a carp. From this circumstance, the infant derived his name, Le, a carp. The name of his son seldom occurs in the life of his illustrious father, and the few references we have to him are enough to show that a small share of paternal affection fell to his lot. Have you heard any lessons from your father different from what we have all heard? asked an inquisitive disciple of him. No, replied Le. He was standing alone once when I was passing through the court below with hasty steps, and said to me, Have you read the oldest? On my reply, Not yet, he added, If you do not learn the oldest, you will not be fit to converse with. Another day, in the same place and the same way, he said to me, Have you read the rules of propriety? On my replying, Not yet, he added, If you do not learn the rules of propriety, your character cannot be established. I ask one thing, said the enthusiastic disciple, and I have learned three things. I have learned about the oldest, I have learned about the rules of propriety, and I have learned that the superior man maintains a distance reserved toward his son. At the age of 22, we find Confucius released from the toils of office 
and devoting his time to the more congenial task of imparting instruction to a band of admiring and earnest students. With idle or stupid scholars he would have nothing to do. I do not open the truth, he said, to one who is not eager after knowledge, nor do I help anyone who is not anxious to explain himself. When I have presented one corner of a subject, and the listener cannot from it learn the other three, I do not repeat my lesson. When twenty-eight years old, Confucius studied archery, and in the following years took lessons in music from the celebrated master, Shane. At thirty, he tells us, he stood firm, and about this time his fame mightily increased. Many noble youths enrolled themselves among his disciples, and on his expressing a desire to visit the imperial court of Chao to confer on the subject of ancient ceremonies with Lao Tzu, the founder of the Taoist sang. The reigning duke placed a carriage and horses at his disposal for the journey. The extreme veneration which Confucius entertained for the founders of the Chao dynasty made the visit to Le, the capital, one of the intense interest to him. With eager delight he wandered through the temple and audience chambers, the place of sacrifices and the palace, and having completed his inspection of the position and shape of the various sacrificial and ceremonial vessels, he turned to his disciples and said, Now I understand the wisdom of the Duke of Chao, and how his house attained to imperial sway. But the principal object of his visit to Chao was to confer with Lao Tzu, and of the interview between these two various dissimilar men, we have various accounts. The Confucian writers as a rule merely mention the fact of their having met. But the admirers of Lao Tzu affirm that Confucius was very roughly handled by his more ascetic contemporary, who looked down from his somewhat higher standpoint with contempt on the great apostle of antiquity. It was only natural that Lao Tzu, who preached that stillness and self-emptiness were the highest attainable objects, should be ready to assail a man whose whole being was wrapped up in ceremonial observances and conscious well-doing. The very measured tones and considered movements of Confucius, coupled with a certain admixture of that pride, which apes humility, must have been very irritating to the metaphysically-minded treasurer. And it was eminently characteristic of Confucius that, notwithstanding the great provocation given him on this occasion, he abstained from any rejoinder. We nowhere read of his engaging in a dispute. When an opponent rose, it was in keeping with the doctrine of Confucius to retire before him. A sage, he said, will not enter a tottering state nor dwell in a disorganized one. When the right principles of government prevail, he shows himself, but when they are prostrated, he remains concealed. And carrying out the same principle in private life, he invariably refused to wrangle. It was possibly in connection with this incident that Confucius drew the attention of the disciples to the metal stature of a man with a triple clasp upon his mouth, which stood in the ancestral temple of Lo. On the back of the stature were inscribed these words. The Asians were guarded in their speech, and like them we should avoid loquacity. Many words invite many defeats. Avoid also engaging in many businesses, for many businesses create many difficulties. Observe this, my children, said he, pointing to the inscription. These words are true, and commend themselves to our reason. Having gained all the information he desired in Chao, he returned to Lu, where pupils flocked to him until, we are told, he was surrounded by an admiring company of 3,000 disciples. His stay in Lu was, however, of short duration, for the three principal clans of the state, those of Ji, Su, and Meng, after frequent contests between themselves, engaged in a war with the reigning duke, and overthrew his armies. Upon this, the duke took refuge in the state of Tse, whither Confucius followed him. As he passed along the road, he saw a woman weeping at the tomb, and having compassion on her, he sent his disciple, Zilu, to ask her the cause of her grief. 
You weep as if you had experienced sorrow upon sorrow, said Zi Lu. I have, said the woman. My father-in-law was killed here by a tiger, and my husband also, and now my son has met the same fate. Why then do you not remove from the place? asked Confucius. Because here there is no oppressive government, replied the woman. On hearing this answer, Confucius remarked to his disciples, My children, remember this. Oppressive government is fiercer than a tiger. Possibly Confucius was attracted to Tsai by a knowledge that the music of the Emperor Shen was still preserved at the court. At all events, we are told that having heard a strain of the much-desired music on his way to the capital, he hurried on and was so ravished with the airs he heard that for three months he never tasted fresh. I did not think, said he, that music could reach such a pitch of excellence. Hearing of the arrival of the sage, the Duke of Chai, King, by a name, sent for him, and after some conversation, being minded to act the part of a patron to so distinguished a visitor, offered to make him a present of the city of Nizi with his revenues. But this Confucius declined, remarking to his disciples, A superior man will not receive rewards except for services done. I have given advice to the Duke King, but he has not followed it as yet, and now he would endow me with this place. Very far is he from understanding me. He still, however, discussed politics with the Duke, and taught him that there is good government when the prince is prince, and the minister is minister, when the father is father, and the son is son. Good, said the Duke. If indeed the prince be not prince, the minister not minister, and the son not son, although I have my revenue, can I enjoy it? Though Duke King was by no means a satisfactory pupil, many of his instincts were good, and he once again expressed a desire to pension Confucius, that he might keep him at hand. But Yan Ying, the Prime Minister, dissuaded him from his purpose. These scholars, said the minister, are impracticable and cannot be imitated. They are haughty and conceited of their own fields, so that they will not rest satisfied in inferior positions. They set a high value on all funeral ceremonies, give way to their grief, and will waste their property on great funerals, so that they would only be injurious to the common manners. This Kung Fu Zi has a thousand peculiarities. It would take ages to exhaust all he knows about the ceremonies of going up and going down. This is not a time to examine into his rules of propriety. If you wish to employ him to change the custom of Qi, you will not be making the people your primary consideration. This reasoning had full weight with the Duke, who the next time he was urged to follow the advice of Confucius, cut short the discussion by the remark, I am too old to adopt his doctrines. Under these circumstances, Confucius once more returned to Lu, only, however, to find that the condition of a state was still unchanged. Disorder was rife, and the reins of government were in the hands of the head of the strongest party for the time being. This was no time for Confucius to take office, and he devoted the leisure thus forced upon him to the compilation of the Book of Odes and the Book of History. But in process of time, order was once more restored, and he then felt himself free to accept the post of magistrate of the town of Chungtu, which was offered him by the Duke King. He now had the opportunity of putting his principles of government to the test, and the result partly justified his expectations. He framed rules for the support of the living and for the observation of rights for the dead. He arranged appropriate food for the old and the young, and he provided for the proper separation of men and women. And the results were, we are told, that as in the time of King Alfred, a thing dropped on the roll was not picked up. There was no fraudulent carving of vessels. Coffins were made of the ordained thickness. Graves were unmarked by mounds raised over them, and no two prices were charged in the markets. The duke, surprised at what he saw, asked the sage whether his rule of government could be applied to the whole state. Certainly, replied Confucius, and not only to the state of Lu, but to the whole empire. Forthwith, therefore, the duke made him assistant superintendent of works, and shortly afterwards, 
appointed him minister of crime. Here again, his success was complete. From the day of his appointment, crime is said to have disappeared, and the penal laws remained a dead letter. Courage was recognized by Confucius as being one of the great virtues, and about this period we have related two instances in which he showed that he possessed both moral and physical courage to a high degree. The chief of the Ji family, being virtual possessor of the state, when the body of the exiled Duke Xiao was brought from Chi for interment, directed that it should be buried apart from the graves of his ancestors. On Confucius becoming aware of his decision, he ordered a trench to be dug round the burying ground which should enclose the new tomb. Thus, to censure a prince and signalize his fault is not according to antiquity, said he to Qi. I have caused the grave to be included in the cemetery, and I have done so to hide your disloyalty, and his action was allowed to pass unchallenged. The other instance referred to was on occasion, a few years later, of an interview between the dukes of Lu and Chai, at which Confucius was present as master of ceremonies. At his instigation, an altar was raised at the place of meeting, which was mounted by three steps, and on this the dukes ascended, and having pledged, one another proceeded to discuss a treaty of alliance. But treachery was intended on the part of the Duke of Chai, and at a given signal a band of savages advanced with beat of drum to carry off the Duke of Lu. Some such stratagem had been considered probable by Confucius, and the instant the danger became imminent, he rushed to the altar and led away the Duke. After much disorder in which Confucius took a firm and prominent part, a treaty was concluded, and even some land on the south of the river Wang, which had been taken by Tsai, was by the exertions of the state restored to Lu. On this recovered territory, the people of Lu, in memory of the circumstance, built a city and called it the City of Confession. End of section 29section 30 of the great events volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the great events by famous historians volume 1 edited by charles f horn rosita johnson and john rock section 30 but to return to Confucius as the minister of crime, though eminently successful, the results obtained under his system were not quite such as his followers have represented them to have been. No doubt crime diminished under his rule, but it was by no means abolished. In fact, his biographers mentioned in case which must have been peculiarly shocking to him. A father brought an accusation against his son, in the expectation, probably, of gaining his suit with ease before a judge who lays such stress on the virtues of filial piety. But to his surprise, and that of the onlookers, Confucius cast both father and son into prison, and to the remonstrances of the head of the Ji clan answered, Am I to punish for a breach of filial piety one who has never been taught to be filially minded. It's not he who neglects to teach his sons his duties, equally guilty with the son who fails in them. Crime is not inherent in human nature, and therefore the father in the family and the government in the state are responsible for the crimes committed against filial piety and the public laws. If a king is careless about publishing laws and then preemptorily punishes in accordance with the strict letter of them, he acts the part of a swindler. If he collects the taxes arbitrarily without giving warning, he is guilty of oppression. And if he puts the people to death without having instructed them, he commits a cruelty. On all these points, Confucius frequently insisted and strove both by precept and example to impart the spirit they reflected on all around him. In the presence of his prince, we are told, 
that his manner, though self-possessed, displayed respectful uneasiness. When he entered the palace, or when he passed the vacant throne, his countenance changed, his legs bent under him, and he spoke as though he had scarcely breath to utter a word. When it fell to his lot to carry the royal sceptre, he stooped his body as though he were not able to bear his weight. If the prince came to visit him when he was ill, he had himself placed with his head to the east, and lay dressed in his court clothes, with his girdle across them. When the prince sent him a present of cooked meat, he carefully adjusted his mat and just tasted the dishes. If the meat were uncooked, he offered it to the spirits of his ancestors, and an animal which was thus sent him he kept alive. At the village festivals, he never preceded, but always followed after the elders. To all about him he assumed an appearance of simplicity and sincerity. To the court officials of the lower grade, he spoke freely, and to superior officers, his manner was bland but precise. Even at the wild gatherings which accompanied the annual ceremonies of driving away presidential influences, he paid honor to the original meaning of the rite by standing in court robes on the eastern steps of his house and received the riotous exorcists as though they were favored guests. When sent for by the prince to assist in receiving a royal visitor, his countenance appeared to change. He inclined himself to the officers among whom he stood, and when sent to meet the visitor at the gate, he hastened forward with his arms spread out like the wings of a bird. Recognizing in the wind and the storm the voice of heaven, he changed countenance at the sound of a sudden clap of thunder, or a violent gust of wind. The principles which underlie all these details relieve them from the sense of affected formality which they would otherwise suggest. Like the sages of old, Confucius had an overweening faith in the effects of example. What do you say, asked the chief of the Jin clan on one occasion, to killing the unprincipled for the good of the principled? Sir, replied Confucius, in carrying on your government, why should you employ capital punishment at all? Let your evinced desires be for what is good, and the people will be good. And then, quoting the words of King Ching, he added, The relation between superiors and inferiors is like between the wind and the grass. The grass must bend when the wind blows across it. Thus, in every act of his life, whether at home or abroad, whether at table or in bed, whether at study or in moments of relaxation, he did all with the avowed object of being seen of men and of influencing them by his conduct. And, to a certain extent, he gained his end. He succeeded in demolishing a number of fortified cities which had formed the hotbeds of sedation and tumult, and thus added greatly to the power of the reigning duke. He inspired the man with a spirit of loyalty and good faith, and taught the women to be chaste and docile. On the report of the tranquility prevailing in Lu, strangers flocked into the state, and thus was fulfilled the old criterion of good government, which was afterward repeated by Confucius. The people were happy, and strangers were attracted from afar. But even Confucius found it impossible to carry all his theories into practice and his experience as minister of crime taught him that something more than mere example was necessary to lead the people into the paths of verge. Before he had been many months in office, he signed the death warrant of a well-known citizen named Shao for disturbing the public peace. This departure from the principle he had so lately laid down astonished his followers. And Zi Gong, the Simon Peter as he has been called among his disciples, took him to task for executing so notable a man. But Confucius held to it that the steps was necessary. There are five great evils in the world, said he. A man with a rebellious heart who becomes dangerous. A man who joins to vicious deeds a fierce temper. A man whose words are knowingly false. A man whose treasure in his memory nauseous deeds and disseminates them. A man who follows evil and fertilizes it. All these evil qualities were combined in Shao. His house was a rendezvous for the disaffected. His words were specious enough to dazzle anyone. 
and his opposition was violent enough to overthrow any independent man. But notwithstanding such departures from the lines he had laid down for himself, the people gloried in his rule and sang at their word songs in which he was described as their savior from oppression and wrong. Confucius was an enthusiast, and his wants of success in his attempt completely to reform the age in which he lived never seemed to suggest a doubt to, to his mind of the complete wisdom of his creed. According to his theory, his official administration should have effected the reform not only of his sovereign and the people, but of those of the neighboring states. But what was the practical result? The contentment which reigned among the people of Lu, instead of instigating the Duke of Qi to institute a similar system, only served to arouse his jealousy. With Confucius at the head of his government, said he, Lu will become supreme among the states, and Qi, which is nearest to it, will be swallowed up. Let us propitiate it by a surrender of territory. But a more provident statement suggested that they should first try to bring about the disgrace of the sage. With this object, he sent 80 beautiful girls, well skilled in the arts of music and dancing, and a hundred and twenty of the finest horses which could be procured, as a present to the Duke King. The result fully realized the anticipation of the minister. The girls were taken into the Duke's harem, the horses were removed to the ducal stables, and Confucius was left to meditate on the folly of men who preferred listening to the songs of the maiden of Zi to the wisdom of Yao and Shun. Day after day passed and the duke showed no signs of returning to his proper mind. The affairs of states were neglected and for three days the duke refused to receive his minister in audience. Master, said Zi Lu, it is time you went. But Confucius, who had more at stake than his disciple, was disinclined to give up the experiment on which his heart was set. Besides, the time was approaching when the great sacrifice to heaven as the solstice, about which he had had so many conversations with the duke, should be offered up, and he hoped that the recollection of his weighty words would recall the duke to a sense of his duties. But his gay rivals in the affections of the duke still held their sway, and the recurrence of the Greek festival failed to awaken his conscience even for the moment. Reluctantly, therefore, Confucius resigned his post and left the capital. But though thus disappointed of the hopes he entertained of the Duke of Lu, Confucius was by no means disposed to resign his role as the reformer of the age. If any one among the princes would employ me, said he, I would effect something considerable in the course of twelve months and in three years the government would be perfected. But the tendencies of the times were unfavorable to the sage. The struggle for supremacy which had been going on for centuries between the princes of the various states was then at its height, and though there might be a question whether it would finally result in the victory of Qin or of Chu or of Qin, there could be no doubt that the scepter had already passed from the hands of the ruler of Chao, to men, therefore, who were fighting over the possessions of a stage would have ceased to live. The idea of employing a minister whose principal object would have been to breathe life into the dead bones of Chao was ridiculous. This soon became apparent to his disciples, who became even more concerned than their master at his loss of office, and not taking so exalted a view as he did of what he considered to be a heaven-sent mission were inclined to urge him to make concessions in harmony with the times. Your principles, said Zi Gong to him, are excellent, but they are unacceptable in the empire. Would it not be well, therefore, to bait them a little? A good husbandman, replied the sage, can sow, but he cannot secure a harvest. Another son may excel in handicraft, but he cannot provide a market for his goods. And in the same way, a superior man can cultivate his principles, but he cannot make them acceptable. But Confucius was at least determined that no efforts on his part should be wanting to discover the opening for which 
belonged, and on leaving Lu, he betook himself to the state of Wei. On arriving at the capital, the reigning duke received him with distinction, but showed no desire to employ him, probably expecting, however, to gain some advantage from the counsels of the sage in the art of governing. He determined to attach him to his court by the grant of an annual stipend of 60,000 measures of grain, that having been the value of the post he had just resigned in Lu. Had the experiences of his public life come up to the sanguine hopes he had entertained at its beginning, Confucius would probably have declined his offer as he did that of the Duke of Qi some years before. But poverty unconsciously impelled him to act up to the advice of Xi Gong and to bait his principles of conduct somewhat. His stay, however, in Wei was of short duration. The officials at the court, jealous probably of the influence they feared he might gain over the Duke, intrigued against him, and Confucius thought it best to bow before the coming storm. After living on the Duke's hospitality for ten months, he left the capital, intending to visit the state of Qin. It chanced, however, that the way thither led him through the town of Quan, which he suffered much from the filibustering expeditions of a notorious disturber of the public peace named Yang Hu. To this man of ill fame, Confucius bore a striking resemblance, so much so that the townspeople, fancying that they now had their old enemy in their power, surrounded the house in which he lodged for five days, intending to attack him. The situation was certainly disquieting, and the disciples were much alarmed. But Confucius's belief in the heaven-sent nature of his mission raised him above fear. After the death of King Wen, said he, was not the cause of truth lodged in me? If heaven had wished to let this sacred cause perish, I should not have been put into such a relation to it. Heaven will not let the cause of truth perish, and what therefore can the people of Quan do to me? Saying which he turned his lyre, and sang probably some of those songs from his recently compiled Book of Odes which breathed the wisdom of the ancient emperors. From some unexplained cause, but more probably from the people of Quan discovering the mistake than from any effect produced by Confucius dictis, the attacking force suddenly withdrew, leaving the sage free to go wherever he listed. This misadventure was sufficient to deter him from wandering farther afield, and after a short stay at Po, he returned to Wei. Again the duke welcomed him to the capital, though it does not appear that he renewed his stipend, and even his consort Nanzi forgot for a while her intrigues and debaucheries at the news of his arrival. With a complimentary message, she begged an interview with the sage, which he at first refused, but on her urging her request, he was fain obliged to yield the point. On being introduced into her presence, he found her concealed behind a screen, in strict accordance with the prescribed antiquity, and after the usual formalities, they entered freely into conversation. Zi Lu was much disturbed at this want of discretion, as he considered it on the part of Confucius, and the vehemence of his master's answer showed that there was a doubt in his own mind whether he had not overstepped the limits of sage-like propriety. Wherein I have done improperly, said he, may heaven reject me, may heaven reject me. This incident did not, however, prevent him from maintaining friendly relations with the court, and it was not until the duke by public act showed his inability to understand the dignity of the role which Confucius desired to assume, that he lost all hope of finding employment in the state of his former patron. On this occasion, the duke drove through the streets of his capital seated in a carriage with Nanzi, and desired Confucius to follow in a carriage behind. As the procession passed through the marketplace, the people perceiving more clearly than the duke the incongruity of the proceeding, laughed and jeered at the idea of making Virge follow in the wake of a lust. This completed the shame which Confucius felt as being in so false a position. 
I have not seen one, said he, who loves virtue as he loves beauty, to stay any longer under the protection of her court, which could inflict such an indignity upon him, was more than he could do, and he therefore once again struck southward toward Chen. After his retirement from office, it is probable that Confucius devoted himself afresh to imparting to his followers those doctrines and opinions which we shall consider later on. Even on the road to Chen, we are told that he practiced ceremonies with his disciples beneath the shadow of a tree by the wayside in Sung. In the spirit of Lao Tzu, Huang Tui, an officer in the neighborhood, was angered at his reported proud air and many desires, his insinuating habit and wild will, and attempted to prevent him entering the state. In this endeavor, however, he was unsuccessful, as were some more determined opponents, who two years later attacked him at Pu. When he was on his way to Wei, on this occasion he was seized, and though it is said that his followers struggled manfully with his captors, their efforts did not save him from having to give an oath that he would not continue his journey to Wei. But in spite of his oath, and in spite of the public slight which has previously been put upon him by the Duke of Wei, an irresistible attraction drew him toward that state, and he had no sooner escaped from the clutches of his captors than he continued his journey. This deliberate for feature of his word in one who had commanded them to hold faithfulness and sincerity as first principles, surprised his disciples and Zi Gong, who was generally the spokesman on such occasions, asked him whether it was right to violate the oath he had taken. But Confucius, who had learned expediency in adversity, replied, It was an oath extracted by force. The spirits do not hear such. But to return to Confucius flying from his enemies in Song, finding his way bound by the action of Huang Tui, he proceeded westward and arrived at Jing, the capital of the state of the same name. Thither it would appear his disciples had preceded him, and he arrived unattended at the eastern gate of the city. But his appearance was so striking that his followers were soon made aware of his presence. There is a man, said a townsman to Zi Gong, standing at the east gate with a forehead like Yao, a neck like Gao Tao, his shoulders on a level with those of Ji Chen, but wanting below the waist three inches of the height of Yu, and altogether having the forsaken appearance of a stray dog. Recognizing his masters in this description, Zi Gong hastened to meet him, and repeated to him the words of his informant. Confucius was much amused and said, The personal appearance is a small matter, but to say I was like a stray dog, Capital, capital. The ruling powers in Jin, however, showed no disposition to employ even a man possessing such marked characteristics, and before long he removed to Chen, where he remained a year. From Chen, he once more turned his face towards Wai, and it was while he was on this journey that he was detained at Po, as mentioned above. Between Confucius and the Duke of Wai, there evidently existed a personal liking, if not friendship. The Duke was always glad to see him and ready to converse with him. But Confucius's unbounded admiration for those whose bones, as Lao Tzu said, were molded to dust, and especially for the founders of the Chao dynasty, made it impossible for the Duke to place him in any position of importance. At the same time, Confucius seems always to have hoped that he would be able to gain the duke over to his fields, and thus it came about that the sage was constantly attracted to the court of Duke Ling, and as often compelled to exile himself from it. On this particular occasion, as at all other times, the duke received him gladly, but their conversations which had principally turned on the act of peaceful government were now directed to warlike affairs. The duke was contemplating an attack on Po, the inhabitants of which, under the leadership of Huang Tui, who had arrested Confucius, 
had rebelled against him. At first, Confucius was quite disposed to support the duke in his intended hostilities. But a representation from the duke that the proper support of the other states would make the expedition one of considerable danger converted Confucius to the opinion evidently entertained by the duke that it would be best to leave Huang Tui in possession of his ill-gotten territory. Confucius's latest advice was then to this effect, and the duke acted upon it. The duke was now becoming an old man, and with advancing age came a disposition to leave the task of governing to others, and to weary of Confucius' high-flown lectures. He ceased to use Confucius, as the Chinese historians say, and the state was therefore indolent, and ready to accept any offer which might come from any quarter. While in this humor, he received an invitation from Fu Xi, an officer of the state of Jin, who was holding the town of Zhong Mao against his chief, to visit him, and he was inclined to go. It is impossible to study this portion of Confucius' career without feeling that a great change had come over his conduct. There was no longer that lofty love of truth and of virtue which had distinguished the commencement of his official life. Adversity, instead of stiffening his back and making him pliable, he who had formerly refused to receive money he had not earned, was now willing to take pay in return for no other services than the presentation of courtier-like advice on occasion when Duke Leng decided to have his opinion in support of his own. And in defiance of his oft-repeated denunciation of rebels, he was now ready to go over to the court of a rebel chief, in the hope possibly of being able through his means to establish, as he said on an occasion, an eastern child. Again, Zi Lu interfered and expostulated with him on his inconsistency. Master, said he, I have heard you say that when a man is guilty of personal wrongdoing, a superior man will not associate with him. If you accept the invitation of this Fu Xi, who is in open rebellion against his chief, what will people say? But Confucius, with a dexterity which had now become common with him, replied, It is true I have said so, but is it not also true that if a thing be really hard, it may be ground without being made thin? And if it be really white, it may be steeped in a black fruit without becoming black? Am I a bitter good? Am I to be hung up out of the way of being eaten? But nevertheless, Zi Lu's remonstrances prevailed, and he did not go. His relations with the duke did not improve, and so dissatisfied was he with his patron that he retired from the court. As at this time, Confucius was not in the receipt of any official income. It is probable that he again provided for his wants by imparting to his disciples some of the treasures out of the rich stores of learning which he had collected by means of diligent study and of a wild experience. Every word and action of Confucius were full of such meaning to his admiring followers that they have enabled us to trace him into the retirement of private life. In his dress, we are told, he was careful to wear only the correct colors. This usher, yellow, carnation, white and black, and he scrupulously avoided red as being the color usually affected by women and girls. At the table, he was moderate in his appetite, but particular as to the nature of his food and the manner in which it was set before him. Nothing would induce him to touch any meat that was high or rice that was musty, nor would he eat anything that was not properly cut up or accompanied with the proper sauce. He allowed himself only a certain quantity of meat and rice, and though no such limit was fixed to the amount of wine with which he accompanied his frugal fare, we are sure that he never allowed himself to be confused by it. When out driving, he never turned his head quite round, and in his actions as well as in his words, he avoided all appearance of haste. End of section 30
Section 31 of The Great Events, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosita Johnson, and John Rock. Such details are interesting in the case of a man like Confucius, who has exercised so powerful an influence over so large a proportion of the world's inhabitants, and whose instructions, far from being confined to the courts of kings, found their loudest utterances in intimate communings with his disciples, and in the example he set by the exact performance of his daily duties. The only accomplishment which Confucius possessed was a love of music, and this he studied less as an accomplishment than as a necessary part of education. It is by the orders that the mind is aroused, said he. It is by the rules of propriety that the character is established. And it is music which completes the edifice. But having tasted the sweets of official life, Confucius was not inclined to resign all hope of future employment. And the Duke of White still remaining deaf to his advice, he determined to visit the state of Jin, in the hope of finding in Zhao Jianzi, one of the three chieftains who virtually governed that state, a more hopeful pupil. With this intention he started westward, but had got no farther than the Yellow River when the news reached him of the execution of Dao Ming and Dao Shenhua, two men of note in Jin. The disorder which this indicated put a stop to his journey, for had not he himself said that a superior man will not enter a tottering state? His disappointment and grief were great, and looking at the yellow waters as they flowed at his feet, he sighed and muttered to himself, Oh, how beautiful were they! This river is not more majestic than they were, and I was not there to avert their fate. So saying, he returned to Wei, only to find the duke as little inclined to listen to his lectures as he was deeply engaged in warlike preparations. When Confucius presented himself at court, the duke refused to talk on any other subject but military tactics, and forgetting, possibly on purpose, that Confucius was essentially a man of peace, pressed him for information on the art of maneuvering an army. If you should wish to know how to arrange sacrificial vessels, said the sage, I will answer you. But about warfare I know nothing. Confucius was now sixty years old, and the condition of the states composing the empire was even more unfavorable for the reception of his doctrines than ever. But though depressed by fortune, he never lost that steady confidence in himself and his mission, which was a leading characteristic of his career. And when he found the Duke of Wei deaf to his advice, he removed to Chen in the hope of their finding a ruler who would appreciate his wisdom. In the following year, he left Chen with his disciples for Tai, a small dependency of the state of Chu. In those days, the empire was subjected to constant changes. One day, a new state carved out of an old one would appear, and again it would disappear or increase in size as the fortunes of war might determine. Thus, while Confucius was in Tai, a part of Chu declared itself independent under the name of Ye, and the ruler usurped the title of Duke. In earlier days, such rebellion would have called forth a rebuke from Confucius, but it was otherwise now, and instead of denouncing the usurper as a rebel, he sought him as a patron. The Duke did not know how to receive his visitor, and asked Zi Lu about him. But Zi Lu, possibly because he considered the duke to be no better than Fu Xi, returned him no answer. For this reticence, Confucius found fault with him and said, Why did you not say to him, He is simply a man who, in his eager pursuit of knowledge, forgets his food, who, in the joy of his attainments, forgets his sorrows, and who does not perceive that old age is coming on? But whatever may have been the opinion of Zi Lu, Confucius was quite ready to be on friendly terms with the duke, who seems to have had no keener relish for Confucius' ethics than the other rulers 
to whom he had offered his services. We are only told of one conversation which took place between the duke and the sage, and on that occasion, the duke questioned him on the subject of government. Confucius' reply was eminently characteristic of the man. Most of his definitions of good government would have sounded unpleasantly in the ears of a man who had just thrown off his master's yoke and had a successful rebellion. So he cast about for one which might offer some excuse for the new duke by attributing the fact of his disloyalty to the bad government of his late ruler. Quoting the words of an earlier sage, he replied, Good government obtains when those who are near are made happy, and those who are far off are attracted. Returning from Ye to Chai, he came to a river which, being unbridged, left him no resource but to ford it. Seeing two men, whom he recognized as political recluses, plowing in a neighboring field, he sent the ever-present Zi Lu to inquire of them where best he could effect a crossing. Who is that holding the reins in the carriage yonder? asked the first addressed. In answer to Zilu's inquiry, Kung Chiu replied the disciple. Kung Chiu of Lu asked the plowman. Yes, was the reply. He knows the fall, was the enigmatic answer of the man as he turned to his work. But whether this reply was suggested by the general belief that Confucius was omniscient, or by ray of a parable to signify that Confucius possessed the knowledge by which the river of disorder, which was barring the progress of liberty and freedom, might be crossed. We are only left to conjecture. Nor from the second recluse could Ji Lu gain any practical information. Who are you, sir? was the somewhat preemptory question which his inquiry met with. Upon his answering that he was a disciple of Confucius, the man whom I have gathered his estimate of Confucius from the mouth of Lao Tzu replied, Disorder, like a swelling flood, spreads over the whole empire, and who is he who will change it for you, rather than follow one who merely withdraws from this court to that court? Had you not better follow those who, like ourselves, withdraw from the world altogether? These words, Zi Lu, as was his wont, repeated to Confucius, who thus justified his career. It is impossible to associate with birds and beasts as if they were the same as ourselves. If I associate not with people, with mankind, with whom shall I associate? If right principles prevailed throughout the empire, there would be no necessity for me to change its state. Altogether, Confucius remained three years in Tai, three years of strife and war, during which his counsels were completely neglected. Toward their close, the state of Wu made an attack on Qin, which found support from the powerful state of Chu on the south. While thus helping his ally, the Duke of Chu heard that Confucius was in Tai, and determined to invite him to his court. With this object, he sent messengers bearing presents to the sage, and charged them with a message begging him to come to Chu. Confucius readily accepted the invitation, and prepared to start. But the news of the transaction alarmed the minister of Tai and Qian. Chu, said they, is already a powerful state, and Confucius is a man of wisdom. Experience has proved that those who have despised him have invariably suffered for it. And should he succeed in guiding the affairs of Chu, we should certainly be ruined. At all hazards, we must stop his going. When, therefore, Confucius had started on his journey, this man dispatched a force which hemmed him in the wild bit of desert country. Here, we are told, they kept him prisoner for seven days, during which time he suffered severe privations, and, as was always the case in moments of difficulty, the disciples loudly bewailed the lot and that of their masters. As the superior man said, Zi Lu, indeed, to endure in this way, the superior man may indeed have to suffer once, replied Confucius. But it is only the mean man who, when he is in straits, gives way to unbridled license. In this emergency, he had recourse to a solace which had soothed him on many occasions, when fortune frowned. He played on his lute and sang. At length, he succeeded in sending word to the Duke of Chu 
on the position he was in. At once the duke sent ambassadors to liberate him, and he himself went out of his capital to meet him. But though he welcomed him cordially, and seems to have availed himself of his advice on occasions, he did not appoint him to any office, and the intention he at one time entertained of granting him a slice of territory was faulted by his ministers from motives of expediency. Has your majesty, said this officer, any servant who could discharge the duties of ambassador like Ji Gong, or any so well qualified for a premier as Yan Hui, or anyone to compare as a general with Ji Lu? Did not kings Wang and Wu, from their small states of Feng and Gao, rise to the sovereignty of the empire? And if Kong Chiu once acquired territory with such disciples to be his ministers, it will not be to the prosperity of Chu. This remonstrance not only had the immediate effect which was intended, but appears to have influenced the manner of the duke towards the sage. For in the interval between this and the duke's death, in the autumn of the same year, we hear of no counsel being either asked or given. In the successor to the throne, Confucius evidently despaired of finding a patron, and he once again returned to Wai. Confucius was now 63, and on arriving at Wai, he found a grandson of his former friend, the Duke Ling, holding the throne against his own father, who had been driven into exile for attempting the life of his mother, the notorious Nanzi. This chief, who called himself the Duke of Zhe, being conscious how much his cause would be strengthened by the support of Confucius, sent Zi Lu to him, saying, The Prince of Wai has been waiting to secure your services in the administration of the state, and wishes to know what you consider is the first thing to be done. It is first of all necessary, replied Confucius, to ratify names. Indeed, said Zi Lu, you are wild of the mark. Why need there be such ratification? How uncultivated you are, you, answered Confucius. A superior man shows a cautious reserve in regard to what he does not know. If names be not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. If language be not in accordance with the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on successfully. When affairs cannot be carried on successfully, proprieties and music will not flourish. When proprieties and music do not flourish, punishments will not properly be awarded. When punishments are not properly awarded, the people do not know how to move hand or foot. Therefore, the superior man considers it necessary that names should be used appropriately, and that his directions should be carried out appropriately. A superior man requires that his words should be correct. The position of things in Y was naturally such as Confucius could not sanction. And as the duke showed no disposition to amend his ways, the sage left his court and lived the remainder of the five or six years during which he sojourned in the state in close retirement. He had now been absent from his native state of Lu for 14 years, and the time had come when he was to return to it. But by the irony of fate, the accomplishment of his long-felt desire was due, not to his reputation for political or ethical wisdom, but to his knowledge of military tactics, which he heartily despised. It happened that at its time, Yan Yao, a disciple of the sage, being in the service of Qi Kang, conducted a campaign against Qi with much success. On his triumphal return, Qi Kang asked him how he had acquired his military skill. From Confucius, replied the general. And what kind of man is he? asked Qi Kang. Were you to employ him? asked Yan Yao. Your fame would spread abroad. Your people might face demons and gods, and would have nothing to fear or to ask of them. And if you accepted his principles, were you to collect a thousand altars of the spirits of the land, it would profit you nothing. Attracted by such a prospect, Ji Kang proposed to invite the sage to his court. If you do, said Yan Yao, mind you do not allow mean men to come between you and him. But before Zi Kang's invitation reached Confucius, an incident occurred which made the arrival of the messengers from Lu still more welcome to him. 
Kung Wen, an officer of Wei, came to consult him as to the best means of attacking the force of another officer with whom he was engaged in the field. Confucius, disgusted at being consulted on such a subject, professed ignorance and prepared to leave the state, saying as he went away, the bird chooses its tree, the tree does not choose the bird. At this juncture, Ji Khan's envoys arrived, and without hesitation, he accepted the invitation they brought. On arriving at Lu, he presented himself at court, and in reply to a question of the Duke Ai on a subject of government, threw out a strong hint that the Duke might do well to offer him an appointment. Government, he said, consists in the right choice of ministers. To the same question put by Ji Khan, he replied, Employ the upright and put aside the crooked, and thus will the crooked be made upright. At this time, Ji Khan was perplexed how to deal with the prevailing brigandage. If you, sir, were not avaricious, though you might offer rewards to induce people to steal, they would not. This answer sufficiently indicates the estimate formed by Confucius of Ji Khan, and therefore of the Duke Ai, for so entirely were the two of one mind that the acts of Ji Khan appear to have been invariably endorsed by the Duke. It was plainly impossible that Confucius could serve under such a regime. And instead, therefore, of seeking employment, he retired to his study and devoted himself to the completion of his literary undertaking. He was now 69 years of age, and if a man is to be considered successful only when he succeeds in realizing the dream of his life, he must be deemed to have been unfortunate. Endowed by nature with a large share of reverence, a cold rather than a vervet disposition, and a studious mind, and reared in the traditions of the ancient kings, whose virtuous achievements obtained an undue prominence by the obliteration of all their faults and failures, he believed himself capable of effecting far more than it was possible for him or any other man to accomplish. In the earlier part of his career, he had in lieu an opportunity given him for carrying his theories of government into practice. And we have seen how they failed to do more than produce a temporary improvement in the conditions of the people under his immediate rule. But he had a lofty and steady confidence in himself and in the principles which he professed, which prevented his accepting the only legitimate inference which could be drawn from his want of success. The lessons of his own experience were entirely lost upon him, and he went down to his grave at the age of 72, firmly convinced as of yore that if he were placed in a position of authority, in three years the government would be perfected. Finding it impossible to associate himself with the rulers of Lu, he appears to have resigned himself to exclusions from office. His wanderings were over, and as a hare, when hounds and horns pursue, pants to the place from whence at first he flew, he had lately been possessed with an absorbing desire to return once more to Lu. This had at last been brought about, and he made up his mind to spend the remainder of his days in his native state. He had now leisure to finish editing the Xu Jing, or Book of History, to which he wrote a preface. He also carefully digested the rites and ceremonies determined by the wisdom of the more ancient sages and kings, collected and arranged the ancient poetry, and undertook the reform of music. He made a diligent study of the Book of Changes, and added a commentary to it, which is sufficient to show that the original meaning of the work was as much a mystery to him as it has been to others. His idea of what would probably be the value of the kernel encased in this unusually hard shell, if it were once rightly understood, is illustrated by his remark. That if some years could be added to his life, he would give 50 of them to the study of the Book of Changes, and that then he expected to be without great faults. In the year BC 482, his son Lei died, and in the following year he lost by death his faithful disciple, Yan Hui. When the news of this last misfortune reached him, he exclaimed, Alas, heaven is destroying me. A year later, a servant of Ji Khan caught a strange one-horned animal while on a hunting excursion, 
and as no one present could tell what animal it was, Confucius was sent for. At once he declared it to be a qi lin, and legend says that its identity with the one which appeared before his birth was proved by its having the piece of ribbon on its horns which Zhen Jai tied to the weird animal which presented itself to her in a dream on Mang Nei. This second apparition could only have one meaning, and Confucius was profoundly affected at the portent. For whom have you come? he cried. For whom have you come? And then, bursting into tears, he added, The cause of my doctrine is wrong, and I am unknown. How do you mean that you are unknown? asked Ji Kung. I don't complain of providence, answered the sage, nor find fault with men that learning is neglected and success is worshipped. Heaven knows me. Never does a superior man pass away without leaving a name behind him. My principles make no progress, and I, how shall I be viewed in future ages? At this time, notwithstanding his declining strength and his many employments, he wrote the Chun Chiu, or Spring and Autumn Annals, in which he followed the history of his native state of Lu from a time of the Duke Yin to the 14th year of the Duke Ai, that is, to the time when the appearance of the Qi Lin warned him to consider his life at an end. This is the only work of which Confucius was the author, and of this every word is his own. His biographer says that what was written, he wrote, and what was erased was erased by him. Not an expression was either inserted or altered by anyone but himself. When he had completed the work, he handed the manuscript to his disciples, saying, by the spring and autumn annals I shall be known, and by the spring and autumn annals I shall be condemned. This only furnishes another of the many instances in which authors have entirely misjudged the value of their own works. In the estimation of his countrymen even, whose reverence for his every word would incline them to accept his opinion on this as on every subject, the spring and autumn annals holds a very secondary place his utterances recorded in the Lun Yu or Confucius Analects being esteemed of far higher value as they undoubtedly are, and indeed the two works he compiled, the Xu Jing and the Si Jing, hold a very much higher place in the public regard than the book on which he so prided himself. To foreigners whose judgments are unhampered by his recorded opinion, his character as an original historian sinks into insignificance and he is known only as a philosopher and statesman. Once again, only do we hear of Confucius presenting himself at the court of the duke after this, and this was on the occasion of the murder of the duke of Qi by one of his officers. We must suppose that the crime was one of a gross nature, for it raised Confucius' fiercest anger, and he who never wearied of singing the praises of those virtuous men who overthrew the thrones of licentious and tyrannous kings would have had no room for blame if the murdered duke had been like unto Xi or Zhao. But the outrage was one which Confucius felt should be avenged, and he therefore bathed and presented himself at court. Sir, said he, addressing the duke, Chen Huan has slain his sovereign. I beg that you will undertake to punish him. But the duke was indisposed to move in the matter, and pleaded the comparative strength of Qi Confucius, however, was not to be so silenced. One half of the people of Qi, said he, are not consenting to the deed. If you add to the people of Lu one half of the people of Qi, you will be sure to overcome. This numerical argument no more affected the duke than the statement of the fact, and wearying with Confucius' importunity, he told him to lay the matter before the chiefs of the three principal families of the state. Before this court of appeal, whither he went with reluctance, his cause fared no better, and the murder remained unavenged. At a period when every prince held his throne by the strength of his right arm, revolutions lost half their crime, and must have been looked upon rather as trials of strength than as disloyal venalies. The frequency of their occurrence also made them less the subjects of surprise and horror. At the time of which we write, the states in the neighborhood of Lu appear to have been in a very disturbed condition. Immediately following on the murder of the Duke of Qi, news was brought to Confucius that a revolution had broken out in Wei. This was an occurrence which particularly interested him, 
for when he returned from Wei to Lu, he left Ji Lu and Ji Yao, two of disciples engaged in the official service of the state. Ji Yao will return, was Confucius' remark. When he was told of the outbreak, but Ji Lu will die, the prediction was verified. For when Ji Yao saw that matters were desperate, he made his escape. But Ji Lu remained to defend his chief and fell fighting in the cause of his master. Though Confucius had looked forward to the event as probable, he was nonetheless grieved when he heard that it had come about, and he mourned for his friend, whom he was so soon to follow to the grave. One morning in the spring of year BC 478, he walked in front of his door, mumbling as he went, The great mountain must crumble, the strong beam must break, and the wise man withers away like a plant. This verse came as a presage of evil to the faithful Ji Kong. If the great mountain crumble, said he, to what shall I look up? If the strong beam break, and the wise man wither away, on whom shall I lean? The master, I fear, is going to be ill. So saying, he hastened after Confucius into the house. What makes you so late? said Confucius, when the disciple presented himself before him. And then he added, according to the statues of the Shah, the corpse was dressed and coffined at the top of the eastern steps, treating the dead as if he were still the host. Under the yin, the ceremony was performed between the two pillars, as if the dead were both host and guest. The rule of Zhao is to perform it at the top of the western steps, treating the dead as if he were a guest. I am a man of yin, and last night I dreamed that I was sitting with offerings before me, between the two pillars. No intelligent monarch arises. There is not one in the empire who will make me his master. My time has come to die. It is eminently characteristic of Confucius that, in his last recorded speech and dream, his thoughts should so have dwelt on the ceremonies of bygone ages. But the dream had this fulfillment. That same day he took to his bed, and after a week's illness he expired. On the banks of the river Si, to the north of the capital city of Lu, his disciples buried him, and for three years they mourned at his grave. Even such marked respect at this fell short of the homage which Zi Gong, his most faithful disciple, fell was due to him. And for three additional years that loving follower testified by his grief, his reverence for his master. I have all my life had the heaven above my head, said he, but I do not know its height, and the earth under my feet, but I know not its thickness. In serving Confucius, I am like a thirsty man, who goes with his pitcher to the river and there drains his fuel, without knowing the river's death. End of section 31